Introduction of Gilbert Keith Chesterton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Gilbert Keith Chesterton by Massey Ward. Introduction. Chiefly Concerning Sources The material for this book falls roughly into two parts, spoken and written. Gilbert Chesterton was not an old man when he died, and many of his friends and contemporaries have told me incidents and recalled sayings right back to his early boyhood. This part of the material has been unusually rich and copious, so that I could get a clearer picture of the boy and the young man that is usually granted to the biography. The book has been in the making for six years and in three countries. Several times I hid it aside for some months so as to be able to get a fresh view. I talked to all sorts of people, heard all sorts of ideas, saw my subject from every side. I went to Paris to see one old friend, to Indiana to see others, met for the first time in lengthy talk Maurice Baring, H.G. Wells, and Bernard Shaw. Went to Kingsland to see Mr. Bella, gathered Gilbert's boyhood friends of the Junior Debating Club in London, and visited his father Brown among his Yorkshire moors. Armed with a notebook, I tried to miss none who had known Gilbert well, especially in his youth. E.C. Bentley, Lucian Oldershaw, Lawrence Solomon, Edward Porter. I had ten long letters from Annie Furman, my most valuable witness as to Gilbert's childhood. For information on the next period of his life, I talked to Monsignor O'Connor, to Hilaire Bella, Maurice Berry, Charles Summers Cox, F.Y. Eccles, and others, besides being now able to draw on my own memory. Francis I had talked with on and off about their early married years ever since I had first known her, but she was, alas, too ill and consequently too emotionally unstrung during the last month for me to ask her all the questions springing in my mind. Tell message, she said to Dorothy Collins, not to talk to me about Gilbert. It makes me cry. For the time at Beaconsfield, out of a host of friends, the most valuable were Dr. Polcock and Dr. Bakewell. Among priests, Monsignors O'Connor and Ronald Knox, Fathers Vincent McNabb, O.P., and Ignatius Rice, O.S.B., were especially interested. Dorothy Collins' evidence covers a period of two years. That of H.G. Wells and Bernard Shaw is reinforced by most valuable letters which they have kindly allowed me to publish. Then, too, Gilbert was so much of a public character and so popular with his fellow journalists that stories of all kinds abound. Concerning him, there is a kind of evidence, and very valuable it is, that may be called a Boswell collector. It is fitting that it should be so. We cannot picture G.K. like the great lexicographer accompanied constantly by one ardent and observant witness, pencil in hand, ready to take notes over the tea cup. And by the way, in spite of an acquaintance who regretted in this connection that G.K. was not laterally more often seen in taverns, it was over the tea cups even more than over the wine glasses that Boswell made his notes. I have seen Boswell's signature after one, and the minutes of a meeting of the club, and he was in no condition then for the taking of notes. Even the signature is almost illegible. But it is fitting that Gilbert, who loved all sorts of men so much, should be kept alive for the future by all sorts of men. From the focusing of many views, from many angles, this picture has been composed. But they are all views of one man, and the picture will show, I think, a singular unity. When Whistler, as Gilbert himself once said, painted a portrait, he made and destroyed many sketches. How many it did not matter. For all, even of his failures, were fruitful. But it would have mattered frightfully if each time he looked up, he found a new subject sitting placidly for his portrait. Gilbert was fond of asking in the new witness of people who expressed admiration for Lloyd George. Which George do you mean? For chameleon life, the politician has worn many colors, and the portrait painted in 1906 would have had to be torn up in 1916. They gathered the Chesterton portraits, read the files when he first grew into fame, talked to Mr. Titterton, who worked with him on the Daily News in 1906, and on G.K.'s Weekly in 1936, collect witnesses from his boyhood to his old age, from Dublin to Vancouver, individuals who knew him, 
groups who are endeavoring to work out his ideas. All will agree on the ideas and on the man as making one pattern throughout, one developing but integrated mind and personality. Gathering the material for a biography bears some resemblance to interrogating witnesses in a court of law. There are good witnesses and bad, reliable and unreliable memories. I remember an old lady, a friend of my mother's, who remarked with candor after my mother had confided to her something of importance, My dear, I must go and write that down immediately before my imagination gets mixed with my memory. One witness must be checked against another. There will be discrepancies in detail, but the main facts will in the end emerge. Just now and again, however, a biographer, like a judge, meets a totally unreliable witness. One event in this biography has caused me more trouble than anything else. The Marconi scandal and the trial of Cecil Chesterton for criminal libel, which grew out of it. As luck would have it, it was on this that I had to interrogate my most unreliable witness. I had seen no clear and unbiased account, so I had to read the many pages of the Blue Book and law reports besides contemporary comment in various papers. I have no legal training, but one point stuck out like a spike. Cecil Chesterton had brought accusations against Godfrey Isaacs, not only concerning his own past career as a company promoter, but also concerning his dealings with the government over the Marconi contract, in connection with which he had also fiercely attacked Rufus Isaacs, Herbert Samuel, and other ministers of the crowd. But in the witness box, he accepted the word of the very ministers he had been attacking, and declared that he no longer accused them of corruption, which seemed to me a complete abandonment of his main position. Having drafted my chapter on Marconi, I asked Mr. Cecil Chesterton to read it, but more particularly to explain this point. He gave me a long and detailed account of how Cecil had been intensely reluctant to take this course, but violent pressure had been exerted on him by his father and by Gilbert, who were both in a state of panic over the trial. Unlikely as this seems, especially in Gilbert's case, the account was so circumstantial and from so near a connection that I felt almost obliged to accept it. What was my amazement a few months later at receiving a letter in which she stated that after a great deal of close research work, re-reading the papers, etc., in connection with her own book, The Chesterton, and after a talk with Cecil's solicitors, she had become convinced that Cecil had acted as he had because the closest sleuthing had been unable to discover any trace of investments by Rufus Isaacs in English Marconi. For this reason, Cecil took the course he did not through family pressure. That pressure, I still feel, was exerted, though possibly not until the trial was over. It was then the lady's feelings and not facts that had been offered to me as evidence, and it was the merest luck that my book had not appeared before Cecil's solicitors had spoken. The account given in Lord Birkenhead's famous trials is the speech for the prosecution. Mrs. Cecil Chesterton's chapter is an impressionist sketch of the court scene by a friend of the defendant. What was wanted was an impartial account, but I tried in vain to write it. The chronology of events, the connection between the government commission and the libel case, the connection between the English and American Marconi companies, it was all too complex for my lay mind. So I turned the chapters over to my husband, who has had a legal training, and asked him to write it for me. The Chesterton is concerned with Gilbert and Francis as well as with Cecil, and the confusion between memory and imagination, to say nothing of reliance on feelings, unsupported by facts, pervades the book. It can only be called a legend, so long growing in Mrs. Cecil's mind that I am convinced that when she came to write her book, she firmly believed in it herself. The starting point was so ardent a dislike for Francis that every incident poured fuel on the flame and was seen only in its life. When I saw her, the legend was beginning to shake. She told me various stories showing her dislike. Facts offered by me were either denied or twisted to fit into the pattern. I do not propose to discuss here the details of a thoroughly unreliable book. Most of them, I think, answer themselves in the course of this biography, with one or two points I deal in Appendix C. But I will set down here one further incident 
but serves to show just how little help this particular witness could ever be. For like Cecil's solicitors, I spoke one telling detail for her. She told me with great enthusiasm that Cecil had said that Gilbert was really in love or not with Francis, but with her sister Gertrude, and that Gertrude's red hair accounted for the number of red-headed heroines in his stories. I told her, however, on the word of their brother-in-law, that Gertrude's hair was not red. Mr. Oldershaw, in fact, seemed a good deal amused. He said that Gilbert never looked at either of the other sisters, who were not his sort, and had eyes only for Francis. Mrs. Cecil, however, would not relinquish this dream of red hair and another love. In her book, she wishes red gold hair on to Annie Fermi, because in the autobiography, Gilbert had described her golden plate. But unluckily for this new theory, Annie's hair was yellow, which is quite a different color. And Annie, who is still alive, is also amused at the idea that Gilbert had any thought of romance in her connection. When Frances Chesterton gave me the letters and other documents, she said, I don't want the book to appear in a hurry, not for at least five years. There will be lots of little books written about Gilbert. Let them all come out first. I want your book to be the final and definitive biography. The first part of this injunction I have certainly obeyed, for it will be just seven years after his death that this book appears. For the second half, I can say only that I have done the best book in your lives to obey it also. I am very grateful to those who have preceded me with books depicting one aspect or another of my subject. I have tried to make use of them all as part of my material, and some are little, nearly in the number of their pages. I am especially grateful to Hilaire Bellock, Emile Kamich, Cyril Clemens, and Father Brown, who have allowed me to quote with great freedom. I want to thank Mr. Stewart Collins, Mr. Cyril Clemens, and the University of Notre Dame for the loan of books, Mrs. Bambridge for the use of a letter from Kipling and a poem from The Years Between. Even greater has been the kindness of those friends of my own and the Gilbert Chestertons who have read this book in manuscript and made very valuable criticisms and suggestions. May Chesterton, Dorothy Collins, Edward Connor, Ross Hoffman, Mrs. Robert Kidd, Arnold Lund, this year not, Father Murtaugh, Father Vincent McNabb, Lucian Oldershaw, Beatrice Ward, Douglas Woodruff, and Signor O'Connor. Most of the criticisms were visibly right, while even those with which I could not concur showed me the weak spot in my work that had occasioned them. They have helped me to improve the book, I think I may say enormously. One suggestion I have not thought of, that one name should be used throughout, either Chesterton or Gilbert, R.G.K., but not all three. I had begun with the idea of using Chesterton when speaking of him as a public character, and also when speaking of the days before I did in fact call him Gilbert. But this often left him and Cecil mixed up. Then too, though I seldom used G.K. myself, other friends writing to me of him often used him. I began to go through the manuscript unified, and then I noticed that in a single paragraph of his Bernard Shaw, Gilbert uses G.B.S., Shaw, Bernard Shaw, and Mr. Shaw. Here was a precedent indeed, and it seemed to me that it was really the natural thing to do. After all, we do talk of people now by one name, now by another. It is a matter of slight importance if of any, and I decided to let it go. As to size, I'm afraid the present book is a large one, although not as large as Boswell's Johnson or Gone with the Wind. But in this matter, I am unrepentant for I have faith in Chesterton's own public. The book is large because there is no other way of getting Chesterton onto the canvas. It is a joke he would himself have enjoyed, but it is also a serious thing. For a complete portrait of Chesterton, even the most rigorous selection of material cannot be compressed into a smaller space. I have first written at length and then cut and cut. At first I had intended to omit all matter already given in the autobiography. Then I realized that it would never do. For some things which are vital to a complete biography of Chesterton are not only told in the autobiography better than I can tell them, but are recorded there and nowhere else. And this book is not merely a supplement to the autobiography, it is the life of Chesterton. The same problem arises with regard to the published books and I have tried to solve it on the same line. There was rung in my mind Mr. Belloc saying, a man is his mind. 
to tell the story of a man of letters while avoiding quotation from or reference to his published works is simply not to tell it. At Christopher Dawson's suggestion, I have reread all the books in the order in which they were written, thus trying to get the development of Gilbert's mind perfectly clear to myself and to trace the influences that affected him at various dates. For this reason, I have analyzed certain of the books and not others. Those which showed this mental development most clearly at various stages are those, too many alas, which are out of print and hard to obtain. But whenever possible in illustrating his mental history, I have used unpublished material so that even the most ardent Chestertonian will find much that is new to him. For the period of Gilbert's youth, there are many exercise books, mostly only half filled, containing sketches and caricatures, lists of titles for short stories and chapters, unfinished short stories. Several completed fairy stories and some of the best drawings were published in the colored land. Others are hints later used in his own novels. There is a fragment of The Ball and the Cross, a first suggestion for The Man Who Was Thursday, a rather more developed adumbration of The Napoleon of Notting Hill. This, I think, is later than most of the notebooks. But after the change in handwriting apparently deliberately and carefully made by Gilbert around the date at which he left St. Paul's for the Slade School, it is almost impossible to establish a date at all exactly for any one of these notebooks. Notes made later when he had formed the habit of dictation became difficult to read, not through bad handwriting, but because words are abbreviated and letters omitted. Some of the exercise books appear to have been begun, thrown aside, and used again later. There is among them one only of real biographical importance, a book deliberately used for the development of a philosophy of life, dated in two places, to which I devote a chapter, and which I refer to as the notebook. This book is as important in studying Chesterton as the Pensees would be for a student of Pascal. He is here already a master of phrase in the sense which makes a comparison with Pascal especially apt. For he often packs so much meaning into a brilliant sentence or two that I have felt it worthwhile in dealing especially with some of the less remembered books to pull out a few of these sentences for a quotation apart from their context. Other important material was to be found in G.K. Weekly, in articles in other periodicals, and in unpublished letters. With some of the correspondences, I have made considerable use of both sides, and if anyone pedantically objects that that is unusual in a biography, I will adapt a phrase of Bernard Shaw's, which you will find in this book, and say, Hang it all, be reasonable. If you had the choice between reading me and reading Wells and Shaw, wouldn't you choose Wells and Shaw? Gilbert Keith Chesterton by Macy Ward. Background for Gilbert Keith Chesterton. It is usual to open a biography with some account of the subject's ancestor. Chesterton, in his Browning, after some excellent foolery about pedigree hunting, makes the suggestion that middle class ancestry is far more varied and interesting than the ancestry of the aristocrat. The truth is that aristocrats exhibit less of the romance of pedigree than any other people in the world. For since it is their principle to marry only within their own class and mode of life, there is no opportunity, or in their case, for any of the more interesting studies in heredity. They exhibit almost the unbroken uniformity of the lower animals. It is in the middle classes that we find the poetry of genealogy. It is the suburban grocer standing at his shop door whom some wild dash of Eastern or Celtic blood may drive suddenly to a whole holiday or a crime. This may provide fun for a guessing game, but it is not very useful to a biographer. The Chesterton family, like many another, had had the ups and downs in social position that accompanied the ups and downs of fortune. Upon all this, Edward Chesterton, Gilbert's father, as head of the family, possessed many interesting documents. After his death, Gilbert's mother left his papers undisturbed. But when she died, Gilbert threw away, without examination, most of the contents of his father's study, including all family records. Thus, I cannot offer any sort of family tree. But it is possible to show the kind of family that the social atmosphere into which Gilbert Chesterton was born. Some of the relatives say that the family held from the village of Chesterton, now merged into Cambridge, of which they were lords of the manor. 
but Gilbert refused to take this seriously. In an introduction to a book called Life in Old Cambridge, he wrote, I have never been to Cambridge, except as an admiring visitor. I have never been to Chesterton at all, either from a sense of unworthiness or from a faint superstition feeling that I might be fulfilling a prophecy in the countryside. Anyone with a sense of savor of the old English country rhymes and tales will share my vague alarm that the steeple might crack or the market cross fall down for a smaller thing than the coincidence of a man named Chesterton going to Chesterton. At the time of the Regency, the head of the family was a friend of the princess, and perhaps as a result of such company, dissipated his fortunes in riotous living and incurred various terms of imprisonment for death. From the debtors' prisons, he wrote letters, and 60 years later, Mr. Edward Chesterton used to read them to his family, as also those of another interesting relative, Captain George Laval Chesterton, prison reformer and friend of Mrs. Fry and Charles Dickens. A relative recalls the sentence, I cried, Dickens cried, we all cried, which makes one rather long for the rest of the letter. George Laval Chesterton left two books, one a kind of autobiography, the other a work on prison reform. It was a moment of enthusiasm for reform, of optimism, and of energy. Dickens was stirring the minds of Englishmen to discover the evils in their land and rush to their overthrow. Darwin was writing his Origin of Species, which in some curious way increased the hopeful energy of his countrymen. They seemed to feel it much more satisfying to have been once animal and to have become human than to be fallen gods who could again be made divine. Anyhow, there were giants in those days, and it was hope that made them so. When, by an old confusion, the Tribune described G.K. Chesterton as having been born about the date that Captain Chesterton published his books, he replied in a ballad which at once saluted and attacked. I am not fond of arthropods as such. I never went to Mr. Darwin's school. Old Tyndall's evil that he liked so much. Leaves me, I fear, compared to the fool. I cannot say my heart with hope is full, because a donkey, by continual kicks, turns slowly into something like a mule. It was not born in 1856. Age of my father. Truer at the touch than mine. Great age of Dickens, youth, and rule. Had your strong virtue stood without a crutch, I might have deemed that man had no need of rule. But I was born when petty poets fuel, when madmen used your liberty to mix, lucre and lust, bestial and beautiful. I was not born in 1856. Note. Quoted in G.K. Chesterton, a criticism, Allison Rivers, 1980. Both autobiography and prison life are worth reading. They breathe the great gusto seen by Gilbert in that era. He does not quote them in his autobiography, but just mentioning Captain Chesterton dwells chiefly on his grandfather, who, while George Laval Chesterton was fighting battles and reforming prisons, had succeeded to the headship of a house agent's business in Kensington, for the family fortunes had been dissipated. Gilbert's great-grandfather had become first a coal merchant and then a house agent. A few of the letters between this ancestor and his son remain, and they are interesting, confirming Gilbert's description in the autobiography of his grandfather's feeling that he himself was something of a landmark in Kensington and that the family business was honorable and important. The Chestertons, whatever the ups and downs of their past history, were by now established in that English middle-class respectability in which their son was to discover, or into which he was to bring, a glow and thrill of adventurous romance. Edward Chesterton, Gilbert's father, belonged to a serious family and a serious generation, which took its work as a duty and its profession as a vocation. I wonder what young house agent today, just entering the family business, would receive a letter from his father adjuring him to become an active, steady, and honorable man of business, speaking of abilities which only want to be judiciously brought out of course assisted with your earnest cooperation. Gilbert's mother was Marie Rosti, one of a family of 23 children. The family had long been English, but came originally from French Switzerland. Marie's mother was from an Aberdeen family of Keith, which gave Gilbert his second name and a dash of Scottish blood which appealed strongly to my affections 
and made a sort of Scottish romance in my childhood. Marie's father, whom Gilbert never saw, had been one of the old Wesleyan lay preachers and was thus involved in public controversy, a characteristic which has descended to his grandchild. He was also one of the leaders of the early teetotal movement, a characteristic which has not. When Edward became engaged to Marie Grosjean, he complained that his dearest girl would not believe that he had any work to do, but he was in fact much occupied and increasingly responsible for the family business. There is a flavor of a world very remote from ours in the packet of letters between the two and from their various parents, aunts and sisters to one another during their engagement. Edward illuminates poems for a certain dear good little child, sketches that look out from home for her mother, hopes that did not appear uncivil in wandering into the garden together at an aunt's house and leaving the rest of the company for too long. He praises a friend of hers as intellectual and unaffected, two excellent things in woman. Describes a clerk sent to France with business papers who lost them all, the careless dog, except the illustrated London news. A letter to Marie from her sister Harriet is amusing. She describes her efforts at entertaining in the absence of her mother. The company were great swells, so that her brother took all the covers of the chairs himself and had the wine iced and we dined in full dress. It was very awful, considering myself as hostess. Poor girl, it was a series of misfortunes. The dinner was three quarters of an hour late, the fish done to rags. She had hired three dozen wine glasses to be sure of enough, but they were brought in twos and threes at a time, and then a hiatus as if they were being washed, which they were not. In the letters from parents and older relatives, religious observances are taken for granted, and there is an obvious sincerity in many allusions to God's will and God's guidance of human life. No one reading them could doubt that the description of a divine relative as ready for the summons and to going home is a sincere one. Other letters, notably Harriet's, do not lack a spice of malice in speaking of those whose religion was unreal and affected, a phenomenon that only appears in an age when real religion abounds. Doubtless her generation was beginning to see Christianity with less than the simplicity of their parents. They were hearing of Darwin and Spencer, and the optimism which accompanied the idea of evolution was turning religion into a vague glow which would, they felt, survive the somewhat childish dogmas in which our root ancestors had tried to formulate it. But with an increased vagueness went also with the more liberal, and the Chestertons were essentially liberal, both politically and theologically, an increased tolerance. In several of his letters, Edward Chesterton mentions the Catholic Church, and certainly with no dislike. He went on one occasion to hear Manning preach and much admired the sermon, although he notes, too, that he found in it no distinctively Roman Catholic doctrine. He belonged, however, to an age that, on the whole, found the rest of life more exciting and interesting than religion, an age that had kept the Christian virtues and still believed that these virtues could stand alone without the support of the Christian creed. The temptation to describe dresses has always been sternly resisted when dealing with any part of the Victorian era, so merely pausing to note that it seems to have been a triumph on the part of Mrs. Grosjean to have cut a short skirt out of eight and a half yards of material, I reluctantly lay aside the letters at the time when Edward Chesterton and Marie were married and had set about living happily ever after. These two had no fear of life. They belonged to a generation which cheerfully created a home and brought fresh life into being. In doing it, they did a thousand other things, so that the home they made was full of vital energies for the children who were to grow up in it. Gilbert recollects his father as a man of a dozen hobbies. His study is a place where these hobbies form strata of exciting projects, awaking youthful covetousness in the matter of a new paint box, satisfying youthful imagination by the production of a toy theater. His character, serene and humorous as his son describes him, is reflected in his letter. Edward Chesterton did not use up his mental powers in the family business. Taught by his father to be a good man of business, he was in his private life a man of a thousand other energies and ideas. On the whole, says his son, I am glad he was never an artist. 
It might have stood in his way in becoming an amateur. It might have spoiled his career, his private career. He could never have made a vulgar success of all the thousand things he did so successfully. Here Gilbert sees a marked distinction between that generation of businessmen and the present in the use of leisure. He sees hobbies as superior to sport. The old-fashioned Englishman, like my father, sold houses for his living that filled his own house with his life. A hobby is not merely a holiday. It is not merely exercising the body instead of the mind, an excellent but now largely recognized thing. It is exercising the rest of the mind, now an almost neglected thing. Edward Chesterton practiced watercolor painting and modeling and photography and stained glass and fretwork and magic lanterns and medieval illumination, and moreover knew all his English literature backwards. It has become of late the fashion for anyone who writes of his own life to see himself against a dark background, to see his development frustrated by some shadow of heredity or some horror of environment. But Gilbert saw his life rather as the ancients saw it when Pietas was a duty because we had received so much from those who brought us into being. This Englishman was grateful to his country, to his parents, to his home for all they had given him. I regret that I have no gloomy and savage father to offer to the public gaze as the true cause of all my tragic heritage. No pale-faced and partially poisoned mother, whose suicidal instincts have cursed me with the temptations of the artistic temperament. I regret that there is nothing in the range of our family much more racy than a remote and mildly impecunious son, and that I cannot do my duty as a true mother by cursing everybody who made me whatever I am. I am not clear about what that is, but I am pretty sure that most of it is my own fault. And I am compelled to confess that I look back to that landscape of my first days with a pleasure that should doubtless be reserved for utopias of the future. Recording by Dick Bourgeois Doyle. Gilbert Keith Chesterton by Maisie Ward. Chapter 2 Childhood. Gilbert Keith Chesterton was born on May 29, 1874, at a house in Sheffield Terrace, Camden Hill, just below the Great Tower of the Waterworks, which so much impressed his childish imagination. Lower down the hill was the Anglican Church of St. George, and here he was baptized. When he was about five, the family moved to Warwick Gardens, as old-fashioned London houses go. Eleven Warwick Gardens is small. On the ground floor, a back and front room were for the Chesterton's drawing room and dining room, with a folding door between, the only other sitting room being a small study built out over the garden. A long, narrow green strip, which must have been a good deal longer before a row of garages was built at the back, was Gilbert's playground. His bedroom was a long room at the top of a not very high house, for what is in most London houses, the drawing room floor is in this house filled by two bedrooms, and there is only one floor above it. Cecil was five years younger than Gilbert, who welcomed his birth with the remark, now I shall always have an audience, a prophecy remembered by all parties because it proved so singularly false. As soon as Cecil could speak, he began to argue, and the brothers' intercourse thenceforward consisted of unending discussion. They always argued. They never quarreled. There was also a little sister, Beatrice, who died when Gilbert was very young, so young that he remembered a fall she had from a rocking horse more clearly than he remembered her death. And in his memory, linked with the fall, the sense of loss and sorrow that came with the death. It would be impossible to tell the story of his childhood, one half so well as he has told it himself. It is the best part of his autobiography. Indeed, it is one of the best childhoods in literature, for Gilbert Chesterton most perfectly remembered the exact truth, not only about what happened to a child, but about how a child thought and felt. What is more, he sees childhood not as an isolated fragment or an excursion into fairyland, but as his real life the real beginnings of what should have been a more real life, a lost experience in the land of the living. I was subconsciously certain then, 
as I am consciously certain now, that there was the white and solid road and the worthy beginning of the life of man, and that it is man who afterwards darkens it with dreams or goes astray from it in self-deception. It is only the grown man who lives a life of make-believe and pretending, and it is he who has his head in a cloud. Autobiography, page 49. Here are the beginnings of the man's philosophy in life and experience of the child. He was living in a world of reality, and that reality was beautiful. In the clear light of an eternal morning, which had a sort of wonder in it, as if the world were as new as myself. A child in this world, like God in the moment of creation, looks upon it and sees that it is very good. It was not that he was never unhappy as a child, and he had his share of bodily pain. I had a fair amount of toothache, and especially earache. But the child has his own philosophy, and makes his own proportion, and unhappiness and pain are of a different texture, or held on a different tenure. What was wonderful about childhood is that anything in it was a wonder. It was not merely a world full of miracles, it was a miraculous world. What gives me this shock is almost anything I really recall, not the things I should think most worth recalling. This is where it differs from the other great thrill of the past, all that is connected with first love and the romantic passion. For that, though equally poignant, comes always to a point, and is narrow, like a rapier piercing the heart, whereas the other was more like a hundred windows opened on all sides of the head. Autobiography, pages 31 to 32. These windows opening on all sides so much more swiftly for the genius than for the rest of us led to a result often to be noted in the childhood of exceptional men, a combination of backwardness and precocity. Gilbert Chesterton was in some ways a very backward child. He did not talk much before three. He learned to read only at eight. He loved fairy tales. As a child, he read them or had them read aloud to him. As a big boy, he wrote and illustrated a good many, some of which are printed in the colored lands. I have found several fragments in praise of Hans Andersen, written apparently in his school days. In the chapter of orthodoxy called The Ethics of Elfland, he shows how the truth about goodness and happiness came to him out of the old fairy tales and made the first basis for his philosophy. In George MacDonald's story, The Princess and the Goblin made, he says, a difference to my whole existence, which helped me to see things in a certain way from the start. It is the story of a house where goblins were in the cellar, and a kind of fairy godmother in a hidden room upstairs. This story had made all the ordinary staircases and doors and windows into magical things. It was the awakening of the sense of wonder and joy in the ordinary things always to be his. Still, more important was the realization represented by the goblins below stairs, that when evil things besieging us do appear, they do not appear outside, but inside. In life, as in this story, there is a house that is our home, that is rightly loved as our home, but of which we hardly know the best or the worst, and must always wait for the one and watch against the other. Since I first read that story, some five alternative philosophies of the universe have come to our colleagues out of Germany, blowing through the world like the east wind. But for me, that castle is still standing in the mountains. Its light is not put out. Introduction to George MacDonald and his wife. All this to Gilbert made the story the most real, the most realistic, in the exact sense of the phrase, the most like life, of any story he ever read, then or later. Another recurrent image in books by the same author is that of a great white horse. And Gilbert says, to this day, I can never see a big white horse in the street without a sudden sense of indescribable things. Of his playmates, one of his first memories, he writes in the autobiography, is playing in the garden under the care of a girl with ropes of golden hair, 
to whom my mother afterwards called out from the house, You are an angel, which I was disposed to accept without metaphor. She is now living in Vancouver as Mrs. Robert Kidd. Mrs. Kidd, then Annie Furman, was the daughter of a girlhood friend of Mrs. Chesterton's. She called her Aunt Marie, and she and her sister, Gilbert says in the autobiography, had more to do with enlivening my early years than most. She has a vivid memory of Sheffield Terrace, where all three Chesterton children were born, and where the little sister Beatrice, whom they called Bertie, died. Gilbert in those days was called Diddy. His father then, and later, was Mr. Ed to the family and intimate friends. Soon after Bertie's death, they moved to Warwick Gardens. Mrs. Kidd writes, The little boys were never allowed to see a funeral. If one passed down Warwick Gardens, they were hustled from the nursery window at once. Possibly this was because Gilbert had such a fear of sickness or accident. If Cecil gave the slightest sign of choking at dinner, Gilbert would throw down his spoon or fork and rush from the room. I have seen him do it many times. Cecil was fond of animals. Gilbert wasn't. Cecil had a cat. He named Faustine because he wanted her to be abandoned and wicked. But Faustine turned out to be a gentleman. Gilbert's storytelling and verse making began very early, but not, I think, in great abundance. His drawing even earlier, and of this there is a great deal. There is nothing very striking in the written fragments that remain, but his drawings, even at the age of five, are full of vigor. The faces and figures are always rudimentary human beings, sometimes a good deal more, and they are taken through lengthy adventures drawn on the backs of bits of wallpaper, of insurance forms, and little books sewn together, or sometimes in long strips glued end to end by his father. These drawings can often be dated exactly, for Edward Chesterton, who later kept collections of press cuttings and photographs of his son, had already begun to collect his drawings, writing the date on the back of each. With the earlier ones, he may, one sometimes suspects, have helped a little, but it soon becomes easy to distinguish between the two styles. Edward Chesterton was the most perfect father that could have been imagined to help in the opening of windows on every side. My father might have reminded people of Mr. Pickwick, except that he was always bearded and never bald. He wore spectacles and had all the Pickwickian evenness of temper and pleasure in the humors of travel. He had as his son, further notes in the autobiography, a power of invention which created for children the permanent anticipation of what is profoundly called a surprise. The child of today chooses his Christmas present in advance and decides between Peter Pan and the pantomime when he does not get both. The Chesterton children saw their first glimpses of fantasy through the framework of a toy theater of which their father was carpenter, scene painter and scene shifter, author and creator of actors and actresses a few inches high. Gilbert's earliest recollection is of one of these figures in a golden crown carrying a golden key, and his father was all through his childhood a man with a golden key who admitted him into a world of wonders. I think Gilbert's father meant more to him than his mother, fond as he was of her. Most of their friends seemed to feel that Cecil was her favorite son. Neither was ever demonstrative, Annie Furman says. I never saw either of them kiss his mother, but in some ways the mother spoiled both boys. They had not the training that a strict mother or an efficient nurse usually accomplishes with the most refractory. Gilbert was never refractory, merely absent-minded, but it is doubtful whether he was sent upstairs to wash his hands or brush his hair, except in preparation for a visit or a ceremonial occasion. Not even then interpolates Annie, and it is perfectly certain that he ought to have been so several times a day. No one minded if he was late for meals. His father, too, was frequently late, and Frances, during her engagement, often saw his mother put the dishes down in the fireplace to keep hot and wait patiently in spite of Gilbert's description of her as more swift, relentless, and generally radical in her instincts than his father. Annie Furman's earlier memories fit this description better. Much as she loved her aunt, she writes... Aunt Marie was a bit of a tyrant in her own family. I have been many times at dinner, when there might be a joint, say, 
hand and chicken. And she would say positively to Mr. Ed, which will you have, Edward? Edward, I think I'd like a bit of chicken. And him fiercely, no, you won't. You'll have mutton. That happens so often. Sometimes Alice Grosjean, the youngest of Aunt M's family, familiarly known as Sloper, was there. When asked her preference, she would say diffidently, I think I'll take a little mutton. Don't be a fool, Alice. You know you like chicken. And chicken she got. Visitors to the house in later years dwell on Mrs. Chesterton's immense spirit of hospitality, the gargantuan meals, the eager desire the guests should eat enormously, and the wittiness of her conversation. Schoolboy contemporaries of Gilbert say that although immensely kind, she alarmed them by a rather forbidding appearance. Her clothes, thrown on anyhow, and blackened and protruding teeth, which gave her a witch-like appearance. The house, too, was dusty and untidy. She called them always by their surnames, both when they were little boys and after they grew up. Oldershaw, Bentley, Solomon, not only says Mrs. May Chesterton did Aunt Marie address Gilbert's friends by their surnames, but frequently added Darling to them. I have heard her address Bentley when a young man thus, Bentley, darling, come and sit over here, to which invitation he turned a completely deaf ear, as he was perfectly content to remain where he was. Indiscriminately, she also addressed her maids, waiting at table with the same endearment. A letter written when Gilbert was only six would seem to show that Mrs. Chesterton had not yet become so reckless about her appearance and was still open to the appeal of millinery. She always was, says Annie. The letter is from John Barker of High Street, Kensington, and is headed in handwriting, Drapery and Millinery Establishment, Kensington High Street, September 21st, 1880. Madam, we are in receipt of instructions from Mr. Edward Chesterton to wait upon you for the purpose of offering for your selection a bonnet of the latest Parisian taste, of which we have a large assortment ready for your choice, or can, if preferred, make you one to order. Our assistant will wait upon you at any time you may appoint, unless you would prefer to pay a visit to our millinery department yourself. Mr. Chesterton informs us that as soon as you have made your selection, he will hand us a check for the amount. We are given to understand that Mr. Chesterton proposes this transaction as a remembrance of the anniversary of what he instructs us to say he regards as a happy and auspicious event. We have accordingly entered it in our books in that aspect. In conveying as we are desired to do Mr. Chesterton's best wishes for your health and happiness and for many future anniversaries, may we very respectfully join to them our own and add that during many years to come, we trust to be permitted to supply you with goods of the best description for cash, on the principle of the lowest prices consistent with excellence, quality, and workmanship. We have the honor to be, madam, your most obedient servants, John Barker and Company. The order entered in their books under that aspect. The readiness to provide millinery for cash convinces you, as G.K. himself says of another story, that Dick Swiveller really did say, when he who adores thee has left but the name in case of letters and parcels. Dickens must have dictated the letter to John Barker. After all, he was only dead ten years. Aunt Marie used to say, adds Annie Furman, that Mr. Ed married her for her beautiful hair. It was auburn and very long and wavy. He used to sit behind her in church. She liked pretty clothes, but lacked the vanity to buy them for herself. I have a little blue hanging watch that she bought one day. She always appreciated little attentions. The playmates of Gilbert's childhood are not described in the autobiography except for Annie's long ropes of golden hair. But in one of the innumerable fragments written in his early 20s, he describes a family of girls who played with him when they were very young together. It is headed, Chapter 1, A Contrast and a Climax, and several other odd bits of verse and narrative introduce the Vivian family as early and constant playmates. One of the best ways of feeling a genuine friendly enthusiasm for persons of the other sex, without gliding into anything with a shorter name, is to know a whole family. The most intellectual idolatry at one shrine is apt to lose its purely intellectual character. 
but a genial polytheism is always bracing and platonic. Besides, the Vivians lived in the same street, or rather gardens, as ourselves, and were amusing as bringing one within sight of what an old friend of mine named Bentley called with more than his usual glum and severity of expression the remote outpost of Kensington society. For these reasons, and a great many much better ones, I was very much elated to have the family, or at least the three eldest girls who represent it, to the neighborhood, standing once more on the well-rubbed lawn of our old garden, where some of my earliest recollections were of subjecting them to treatment such as I considered appropriate to my own well-established character of robber, tying them to trees to the prejudice of their white frocks and otherwise misbehaving myself in the funny old ways before I went to school and became a son of a gentleman only. I've never been able, and in fact I've never tried to tell which of the three I really like best, and if the severe usefulness and domesticity of the eldest girl with her quiet art colors and broad, brave forehead as pale as the white roses that clouded the garden, if these mature qualities in Nina demanded my respect more than the levity of the others, I fear they did not prevent me from feeling an almost equal tide of affection towards the sleepy acumen and ingrained sense of humor of Ida, the second girl, and book reader of the family, or Violet, a veritable delightful child, with a temper as formless and erratic as her tempest of red hair. What old memories this garden calls up, said Nina, who, like many essentially simple and direct people, had a strong dash of sentiment and a strong penchant for being her own emotional pint stoop on the traditional subjects and occasions. I remember so well of coming here in a new pink frock when I was a little girl. It wasn't so new when I went away. It certainly must have been a brute, I replied, but I have endeavored to make a lifetime atone for my early conduct. I fell into thinking of how even Nina miracle of diligence and self-effacement, remembered a new pink frock across the abyss of the years. Walking with my old friends around the garden, I found in every earth plot and tree root the arenas of an attractive and adventurous life in early boyhood. An unpublished fragment. Edward Chesterton was a liberal politically, and what has been called a liberal Christian religiously. When the family went to church, which happened very seldom, it was to listen to the sermons of Stopford Brook. Some 20 years later, Cecil was to remark with amusement that he had, as a small boy, heard every part of the teaching now, 1908, being set out by R.J. Campbell under the title, The New Religion. The Chesterton liberalism entered into the view of history given to their children, and it produced from Gilbert the only poem of his childhood worth quoting. I cannot date it, but the very immature handwriting and curious spelling mark it as early. Probably most children have read, or at any rate, my own generation had read, Aiton's Lays of the Scottish Cavaliers, and played at being cavaliers as a result. But Gilbert could not play at being a cavalier. He had learned from his father to be a roundhead, as had every good liberal of that day. What was to be done about it? He took the lays and rewrote them in an excellent imitation of Aiton, but on the opposite side. In view of his own later developments, such a line as drive the trembling papists backwards has an ironic humor. But one wonders what Aiton himself would have made of a small boy who took his rhythm and sometimes his very words, turned his hero into a traitor, false Montrose, and his traitor, Argyle, into a hero. I have left the spelling untouched. Sing of the great Lord Archibald, sing of his glorious name, sing of his covenanting faith and his everlasting fame. One day he summoned all his men to meet on Kirchen's brow, three thousand covenanting chiefs who no master would allow, three thousand knights with claymores drawn and targets tough and strong, knights who for the right would ever fight and never bear the wrong. And he cried his hand uplifted, Soldiers of Scotland, hear my vow. Ere the morning shall have risen, I will lay the traitors low. For as ye march from the battle, marching back in battle file, ye shall there among the corpses 
find the body of Argyle. Soldiers, soldiers, onward, 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 soldiers, follow me. Come remember ye the crimes of the fiend of Fell Dundee. Onward, let us draw our claymores, let us draw them on our foes. Now then I am threatened with the fate of false Montrose. Drive the trembling papists backwards, drive away the Tories' horde. Let them tell their house of villains they have felt the Campbell's sword. And the next morn he arose, and he girded on his sword. They asked him many questions, but he answered not a word. And he summoned all his men, and he led them to the field. And we cried unto our master that we die and never yield. That same morn we drove right backwards, all the servants of the Pope, and our Lord Archibald we sent from a halter in the rope. Far and fast fled all the traitors, far and fast fled all the greens, fled that cursed tribe who lately stained their honor and their names. Gilbert Keith Chesterton by Maisie Ward, Chapter 3, Part 1, School Days. Curiously enough, Gilbert does not, in the autobiography, speak of any school except St. Paul's. He went, however, first to call it court, usually called at that time Boucher's, from the name of the headmaster. Though it is not technically the preparatory school for St. Paul's, large numbers of Paulines do pass through it. It stands opposite St. Paul's in the Hammersmith Road, and must have felt by Gilbert as one thing with his main school experience, for he nowhere differentiates between the two. St. Paul's School is an old city foundation which has had among its scholars Milton and Marlborough, Pepys, and Sir Philip Francis, and a host of other distinguished men. The editor of a correspondence column wrote a good many years later in answer to an inquirer, yes, Milton and G.K. Chesterton were both educated at St. Paul's School. We fancy, however, that Milton had left before Chesterton entered the school. In an early life of Sir Thomas Moore, we learn of the keen rivalry existing in his day between his own school of St. Anthony and St. Paul's, of scholastic disputations between the two put an end to by Dean Collett because they led to brawling among the boys. When the Paulines would call those of St. Anthony pigs, and the pigs would call the Paulines pigeons, from the pigeons of St. Paul's Cathedral. Now, however, St. Anthony's is no more, and St. Paul's has long moved to the suburbs and lies about seven minutes walk along the Hammersmith Road from Warwick Gardens. Gilbert Chesterton was 12 when he entered St. Paul's in January 1887, and he was placed in the second form. His early days at school were very solitary, his chief occupation being to draw all over his books. He drew caricatures of his masters, he drew scenes from Shakespeare, he drew prominent politicians. He did not, at first, make many friends. In the autobiography, he makes a sharp distinction between being a child and being a boy, but it is a distinction that could only be drawn by a man. And most men, I fancy, would find it a little difficult to say at what moment the transformation occurred. G.K. seems to put it at the beginning of school life. But the fact that St. Paul's was a day school meant that the transition from home to school, usual in English public school education, was never, in his case, completely made. No doubt he is right in speaking in the autobiography of the sort of prickly protection-like hair that grows over what was once the child, or the fact that schoolboys in his time could be blasted with the horrible revelation of having a sister, or even a Christian name. Nevertheless, he went home every evening to a father and mother and a small brother. He went to his friends' houses, and he knew their sisters, school and home life, met daily instead of being sharply divided into terms and holidays. The terminology for English schools came into being largely before the state concerned itself with education. A private school is one run by an individual or a group for private profit. A public school is not run for private profit. Any profits there may be are put back into the school. Mostly they are run by a board of governors and very many of them hold the succession to the old monastic schools of England. For 
example, Charterhouse, Westminster, St. Paul's. They are usually, though not necessarily, boarding schools, and the fees are usually high. Elementary schools, called board schools, were paid out of the local rates and run by elected school boards. They were later replaced by schools run by the county councils. This fact was of immense significance in Gilbert's development. Years later, he noted as the chief defect of Oxford that it consisted almost entirely of people educated at boarding schools. For good, for evil, or for both, a boy at a day school is educated chiefly at home. In the atmosphere of St. Paul's is found little echo of the dogma of the headmaster of Christ's Hospital. Boy, the school is your father. Boy, the school is your mother. Nor, as far as we know, has any Pauline been known to desire the substitution of the august abstraction for the guardianship of his own people. Friendships formed in this school have a continual reference to home life, nor can a boy possibly have a friend long without making the acquaintance and feeling the influence of his parents and his surroundings. The boy's own amusements and institutions, the school sports, the school clubs, the school magazine, are patronized by the masters, but they are originated and managed by the boys. The play hours of the boys are left to their several pleasures, whether physical or intellectual, nor have any foolish observations about the Battle of Waterloo being won on the cricket field or such rather unmeaning oracles yet succeeded in converting the boys' amusements into a compulsory gymnastic lesson. The boys are, within reasonable limits, free. Manuscript for History of J.D.C. written about 1894. Gilbert calls the chapter on his school days How to Be a Dunce, and although in mature life he was on the side of his masters and grateful to them that my persistent efforts not to learn Latin were frustrated, and that I was not entirely successful even in escaping the contamination of the language of Aristotle and Demosthenes. He still contrasts childhood as a time when one wants to know nearly everything with the period of what is commonly called education, that is, the period during which I was being instructed by somebody I did not know about something I did not want to know. The boy who sat next to him in class, Lawrence Solomon, later senior tutor of University College London, remembered him as sleepy and indifferent in manner, but able to master anything when he cared to take the trouble, as he very seldom did. He was in class with boys almost all his juniors. Lucian Oldershaw, who later became his brother-in-law, says of Gilbert's own description of his school life that it was as near a pose as Gilbert ever managed to get. He wanted desperately to be the ordinary schoolboy, but he never managed to fulfill this ambition. Tall, untidy, incredibly clumsy and absent-minded, he was marked out from his fellows both physically and intellectually. When in the latter part of his school life some sort of physical exercises were made compulsory, the boys used to form parties to watch his strange efforts on the trapeze or parallel bars. In these early days, he was, he says of himself, somewhat solitary, but not unhappy, and perfectly good-humored about the tricks, which were inevitably played on a boy who always appeared to be half asleep. He sat at the back of the room, says Mr. Fordham, and never distinguished himself. He thought him the most curious thing that ever was. His schoolfellows noted how he would stride along, apparently muttering poetry, breaking into inane laughter, the kind of thing he was muttering, we learn from a sentence in the autobiography. I was one day wandering about the streets in that part of North Kensington, telling myself stories of feudal sallies and sieges in the manner of Walter Scott, and vaguely trying to apply them to the wilderness of bricks and mortar around me. I can see him now, wrote Mr. Fordham, very tall and lanky, striding untidily along Kensington High Street, smiling and sometimes scowling as he talked to himself, apparently oblivious to everything he passed, but in reality a far closer observer than most, and one who not only observed but remembered what he had seen. It was only of himself that he was really oblivious. Mr. Oldershaw remembers that on one occasion, on a very cold day, they filled his pockets with snow in the playground. When class reassembled, 
The snow began to melt and pools to appear on the floor. A small boy raised his hand. Please, sir, I think the laboratory sink must be leaking again. The water is coming through and falling all over Chesterton. The laboratory sink was an old offender, and the master must have been short-sighted. Chesterton, he said, go up to Mr. Blank and ask him, with my compliments, to see that the trouble with the sink is put right immediately. Gilbert, with water still streaming from both pockets, obediently went upstairs, gave the message, and returned without discovering what had happened. The boys who played these jokes on him had at the same time an extraordinary respect both for his intellectual acquirements and for his moral character. One boy, who rather prided himself in private life on being a man about town, stopped him one day in the passage and said solemnly, Chesterton, I am an abandoned profligate. G.K. replied, I'm sorry to hear that. We watched our talk, one of them said to me, when he was with us. His home and upbringing were felt by some of his schoolfellows to have definitely a Puritan tinge about them, although on the other hand, the more conservative elements regarded them as politically dangerous. Mr. Oldershaw relates that his own father, who was a conservative in politics and had also joined the Catholic Church, seriously warned him against the agnosticism and republicanism of the Chesterton household. But even at this age, his schoolfellows recognized that he had begun the great quest of his life. He felt, said Oldershaw, that he was looking for God. I suppose it was in part the keenness of the inner vision that produced the effect of external sleepiness and made it possible to pack Gilbert's pockets with snow. There was also the fact that he was observing very keenly the kind of thing that other people do not bother to observe. I remember my mother telling me when I first came out that she had almost ceased trying to draw people's characters and imaginatively construct their home lives because for the first time in her life she was trying to notice how they were dressed. She was not noticeably successful. Gilbert Chesterton never even tried to see what everyone else saw. All the time he was seeing qualities in his friends, ideas in literature, and possibilities in life. And all this world of imagination had, on his own theory, to be carefully concealed from his masters. In the autobiography, he describes himself walking to school, fervently reciting verses, which he afterwards repeated in class with a determined lack of expression and woodenness of voice. But when he assumes that this is how all boys behave, he surely attributes his own literary enthusiasms far too widely. One would rather gather that he supposed the whole of St. Paul's school to be in the conspiracy to conceal their love of literature from their masters. Such of his own schoolboy papers as can be found show an imagination rare enough at any age, and an enthusiasm not commonly to be found among schoolboys. A very early one, to judge by the handwriting, is on the advantages for an historical character of having long hair, illustrated by the history of Mary, Queen of Scots, and Charles I. In the contrast, he draws between Mary and Elizabeth appear qualities of historical imagination that might well belong to a mature and experienced writer. As in the cause of the fleeting, heartless Helen, the Trojan War is stirred up and great Ajax perishes, and the gentle Patroclus is slain, and mighty Hector falls, and godlike Achilles is laid low, and the dun plains of Hades are thickened with the shades of king. So round this lovely giddy French princess fall one by one the haughty Dauphin, the princely Darnley, the accomplished Rizzio, the terrible Bothwell, and when she dies, she dies as a martyr before the weeping eyes of thousands, and is given a popular pity and regret denied to her rival and of all her faults of violence and vanity, a greater and a purer woman. It must indeed have been a terrible scene, the execution of that unhappy queen, and it is a scene that has been described by too many and too able writers for me to venture on a picture of it. But the continually lamented death of Mary of Scotland seems to me happy compared with the end of her greater and sterner rival. As I think of the two, the vision of the black scaffold, the grim headsman, the serene captive, and the weeping populace fades from me and is replaced by a sadder vision. The vision 
of the dimly lighted state bedroom of Whitehall. Elizabeth, haggard and wild-eyed, has flung herself prone upon the floor and refuses to take meat or drink, but lies there, surrounded by ceremonious courtiers, but seeing with that terrible insight that was her curse. That she was alone, that their homage was a mockery, that they were waiting eagerly for her death to crown their intrigues with her successor, that there was not in the whole world a single being who cared for her. Seeing all this and bearing it with the iron fortitude of her race, underneath that invincible silence, the deep woman's nature crying out with a bitter cry that she is loved no longer, thus gnawed by the fangs of a dead vanity, haunted by the pale ghost of Essex, and helpless and bitter of heart, the greatest of English women passed away silently. Of a truth, there are prisons more gloomy than Fotheringate, and deaths more cruel than the axe. Is there no pity due to those who undergo these? It is surprising to read the series of foreign reports written on a boy who at 15 and 16 could do work of this quality. Here are the half-yearly reports made by his four masters in his first year in school at the age of 13 to the time he left at the age of 18. December 1887. Too much for me, means well by me, I believe, but has an inconceivable knack of forgetting at the shortest notice, is consequently always in trouble. Though some of his work is well done, when he does remember to do it, he ought to be in a studio, not a school. Never troublesome, but for his lack of memory and absence of mind. July 1888. Wildly inaccurate about everything. Never thinks for two consecutive moments to judge by his work. Plenty of ability, perhaps, in other directions than classics. December 1888. Fair, improving in neatness, has a very fair stock of general knowledge. July 1889. A great blunderer with much intelligence. December 1889. Means well, would do better to give his time to modern subjects. July 1890, can get up any work, but originates nothing. December 1890, takes an interest in his English work, but otherwise has not done well. July 1891, he has a decided literary aptitude, but does not trouble himself enough about schoolwork. December 1891, report missing. July 1892, not on the same plane with the rest, composition quite futile, but will translate well and appreciate what he reads. Not a quick brain, but possessed by a slowly moving, tortuous imagination. Conduct always admirable. What is much clearer from the mass of notebooks and odd sheets of paper belonging to these years than from the autobiography is the degree to which the two possesses of resisting and absorbing knowledge were going on simultaneously. At school he was, he says, asleep but dreaming in his sleep. At home he was still learning literature from his father, going to museums and picture galleries for enjoyment, listening to political talk and engaging in arguments, writing historical plays and acting in them, and above all, drawing. To most of his early writing it's nearly impossible to affix a date with the exception of a dramatic journal kept by fits and starts during the Christmas holidays when he was 16. G.K. solemnly tells the reader of his diary to take warning by it, to beware of prolixity, and it does in fact contain many more words to many fewer ideas than any of his later writings, but it's useful in giving the atmosphere of those years. A great part is in the dialogue and the author appearing throughout as your humble servant his young brother Cecil as the innocent child. The first scene is the rehearsal of a dramatic version of Scott's Woodstock. This has been written by your humble servant, who is at the same time engaged on a historic romance. At intervals in the languid 
rehearsing endless discussions take place between Oldershaw and G.K. on Thackeray, between Oldershaw, his father, and G.K. on royal supremacy in the Church of England. The boys walking between their two houses discussed Roman Catholicism, supremacy, papal and Protestant persecutions. Your humble servant arrives at 11 Warwick Gardens to meet Mr. Maurer, Cowton, Master Sidney Wells, and Master William Wells. Conversations about Frederick the Great, Voltaire, and Macaulay. Cheerful and an enlivening discourse on germs, Dr. Koch, consumption, and tuberculosis. Conservative Oldershaw regards his friend as a red-hot raging Republican, and it is interesting to note already faint foreshadowings of Gilbert's future political views. His parents had made him a liberal, but it seemed to him later, as he notes in the autobiography, that their generation was insufficiently alive to the condition and sufferings of the poor. Open-eyed in so many matters, they were not looking in that particular direction. And so it was only very gradually that he himself began to look. Your humble servant read Oldershaw, Elizabeth Browning's Cry of the Children, which the former could scarcely trust himself to read, but which the latter candidly avowed that he did not like. Part and parcel of Oldershaw's optimism is a desire not to believe in pictures of real misery, and a desire to find out compensating pleasures. I think there was a good deal in what he said, but at the same time, I think that there is real misery, physical and mental, in the low and criminal classes, and I don't believe in crying peace where there is no peace. Of his brother, Gilbert notes, innocent child's fault, is not a servile reverence for his elder brother, whom he regards, I believe, as a mild lunatic. And Oldershaw recalls his own detestation of Cecil, who would insist on monopolizing the conversation when Gilbert's friends wanted to talk to him. An ugly little boy creeping about, Mr. Fordham calls him. Cecil had no vanity, writes Mrs. Kidd, and thoroughly appreciated the fact that he was not beautiful. When he was about 14, he said at dinner one day, I think I shall marry X, a very plain cousin. Between us, we might produce the missing link. Aunt Marie was shocked. Many of the games arise from the skill in drawing of both Gilbert and his father. A long history of two of the masters drawn by Gilbert shows them in the Salvation Army as Christy Minstrels, as editors of a new revolutionary paper that he attained as besieged in their office by a mob headed by Lord Salisbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury and other conservative leaders. Getting tired at the last of the adventures of these two mild scholars, Gilbert starts a series of Shakespeare plays drawn in modern dress. Shylock as an aged Hebrew vendor of dilapidated vesture with a tiara of hats. Antonio is an opulent and respectable city merchant Sanio as a fashionable swell, and Gratanio as his loud and reputable pal with large cheeks and a billycock hat. Portia is attired as a barrister in wig and gown, and Narissa as a clerk with a green bag and a pen behind his ear. This being much appreciated, your humble servant questions what portion of the Bard of Avon he shall next burlesque. The little group seems certainly at this date to be living in a land in which tis always afternoon. In one house or another, tea time goes on until signs of dinner make their appearance. The boys only move from one hospitable dining room to another to adjourn to their own bedrooms, where Gilbert piles book on book and reduces even neat shelves to the same chaos that reigns in his own room. The Christmas holidays, to which their dramatic journal belongs, came a few months after the founding of the Junior Debating Club, which became so central in Gilbert's life, and which he treated with a gravity, solemnity even, such as he never showed later for any cause, a gravity untouched by humor. It was a group of about a dozen boys, started with the idea that it should be a Shakespeare club, but immediately changed into a general discussion group. They met every week at the home of one or other, and after a hearty tea, some member read a paper, which was then debated. At the age of 20, when he had left school two years, G.K. wrote a solemn history of this institution, in which the question of whether it was right or wrong to insist on penny fines for rowdy behavior is canvassed with passionate feeling. One boy who was expelled 
asked to be readmitted, saying, I feel so lonely without it. Gilbert's enthusiasm over this incident could be no greater had he been a bishop welcoming the return of an apostate to the Christian fold. I suppose it was partly because of his early solitary life at school, partly because of the general trend of his thought, partly that at this later date he was under the influence of Walt Whitman. He cast back upon his earlier years a sort of glow or haze of Whitman idealism. Anyhow, the junior debating club became to him a symbol of the ideal friendship. They were knights of the round table. They were jongleur de Dieu. They were the human club through whom and in whom he had made the grand discovery of man. They were his youth personified. The note is still stuck in the letters of his engagement period, and it was only 40 years later, writing his autobiography, that he was able to picture with a certain humorous detachment this group of boys who met to eat buns and criticize the universe. A year after their first meeting, the energy of Lucian Oldershaw produced a magazine called The Debater. At first, it was turned out at home on a duplicator, the efficiency of the production being such that the author of any given paper was able occasionally to recognize a few words of his own contribution. Later, it was printed and gives a good record of meetings and discussions. It shows the energy and ardor of the debaters and also their serious view of themselves and their efforts. At first, they are described as Mr. C, Mr. F, etc. Later, the full name is given. Besides the weekly debates, they started a library, a chess club, a naturalist society, and a sketching club, regular meetings of which are chronicled. The chairman, GKC, said a few words, runs a record after some months of existence, stating his pride at the success of the club and his belief in the good effect such a literary institution might have as a protest against the lower and unworthy phases of school life. His view having been vehemently corroborated, the meeting broke up. In one fairly typical month, papers were read on three comedies of Shakespeare, Pope and Herodotus, and when no paper was produced, there was a discussion on capital punishment. In another, the subjects were the Brontons. Macaulay is an essayist, Frank Buckley, a naturalist, and Tennyson. A pretty wide range of reading was called for from schoolboys in addition to their ordinary work, even though on one occasion the secretary sternly notes that the reading of the paper occupied only three and one-half minutes, but they were not daunted by difficulties or afraid of bold attempts. Mr. Digby Dagendorf, on one occasion, delivered a paper entitled The Nineteenth Century, a Retrospect. He gave a slight resume of the principal events with appropriate tribute to the deceased great of this century. Mr. Bertram, reading a paper on Milton, dealt critically with his various poems, noting the effective style of La Ligero, giving the story of the writing of Comus and curiously analyzing Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained. After discussing the adaptability of Hamlet to the stage, Mr. Morris Solomon, who may have been quite 15, passed on to review the chief points in the character of the Prince of Denmark, concluding with a slight review of the other characters, which he did not think Shakespeare had given much attention to. In a discussion on the new humorists, we find the secretary taking grievous umbrage at certain unwarrantable attacks which he considered Mr. Andrew Lang had lately made on these choice spirits. This discussion arose from a paper by the chairman on the new school of poetry, in which, in spite of its good points, he condemned the absence of the sentiment of the moral, which he held to be the really stirring and popular element of literature. Evidently, some of his friends tended towards a youthful cynicism, or in a paper on Barry's window in Thrums, Gilbert apologizes to such of you as are much bitten with the George Moore state of mind. The book which describes the rusty emotions and toilsome lives of the Thrums weavers will always remain a book that has given me something. And the fact that mine is merely the popular view, and what I feel in it, can be equally felt by the majority of fellow creatures, this fact, such as my hardened and abandoned state, only makes me like them more. I have long found myself in that hopeless minority that is engaged in protecting the majority of mankind from the attacks of all men. 
In this sentiment, we recognize the G.K. that is to be, but not when we find him seconding Mr. Bentley in the motion that a scientific education is much more useful than a classic. Mr. M., reading a paper on Herodotus, gave a minute account of the life of the historian, dwelling much upon the doubt and controversy surrounding his birth and several incidents of his history. While Mr. F. read a paper on newspapers, tracing their growth from the Acta Diurna of the later Roman Empire to the hordes of papers of the present day. Perhaps the best of all these efforts was that of Mr. L.D., who after describing the governments of England, France, Russia, Germany, and the United States, proceeded to give his opinion on their various merits, first saying that he personally was a Republican. Of the boys that appear in the debater, Robert Burnett was killed in the Great War. Lawrence Solomon, at his death in 1940, was senior tutor of University College London. His brother Morris, who became one of the directors of the General Electric Company, is now an invalid. I read a year or so ago an interesting Times obituary from Mr. Bertram, who was director of civil aviation in the air ministry. Mr. Salter became a principal in the treasury, having practiced as a solicitor up to the war. Mr. Fordham, a barrister, was one of the legal advisors to the Ministry of Labor and has now retired. Gilbert Keith Chesterton by Maisie Ward Chapter 3, Part 2, School Days The two outstanding debaters of G.K.'s life were Lucian Oldershaw, who became his brother-in-law and will often appear in these pages, and Edmund Cleary Hugh Bentley, his friend of friends. Closely united as was the whole group, Lucian Oldershaw once told me that they were frantically jealous of one another. We would have done anything to get the first place with Gilbert. But you know, I said, who had it? Yes, he replied. Our jealousy of Bentley was overwhelming. Mr. Bentley became a journalist and was for long on the editorial staff of the Daily Telegraph. But he is best known for his detective stories, especially Trent's last case, and is the inventor of a special form of rhyme, known from his second name as the Clarihue. He wrote the first of these while still at school, and the best were later published in a volume called Biography for Beginners, which G.K. illustrated. Everyone has his favorite. My own is, Sir Christopher Wren said, I am going to dine with some men. If anybody calls, say, I'm designing St. Paul's. Or possibly, the people of Spain think Cervantes equal to half a dozen Dantes, an opinion resented most bitterly by the people of Italy. Bentley was essentially a holiday as well as a term-time companion, and when they were not together, a large correspondence between the two boys gives some idea of how and where Gilbert spent his summer holidays. They are very much schoolboy letters and not worth quoting at full length, but it is interesting to compare both style and content with the later letters. All the letters begin, Dear Bentley. The first use of his Christian name only occurs after both had left school. Austria House, Pier Street, Ventnor, Isle of Wight, undated, probably 1890. Although you dropped some hints about Paris when you were last in our humble abode, I presume that this letter, if addressed to your usual habitation, will reach you at some period. Ventnor, where, as you will perceive we are, is, I will not say, built upon hills, but emptied into the cracks and clefts of rocks, so that the geography of the town is curious and involved. My brother is intent upon the three midshipmen, or the three admirals, or the three coal scuttles, or some other distinguished trio by that interminable ass Kingston. I looked at it today and wondered how I ever could have enjoyed his eternal slave schooners and African stations. I would not give a page of Mansfield Park or a verse of In Memoriam for all the endless fighting of blacks and boarding of pirates through which the three hypocritical vagabonds ever went. I am getting old. How old it will shortly be necessary for me to state precisely, for, as you doubtless know, there is going to be a census. I have been trying to knock into shape a story, such as we spoke about the other day, about the first introduction of tea, and I should be glad of your assistance and suggestions. I think I shall lay the scene in Holland, 
where the merits of tea were first largely agitated, and fill the scene with the traditional Dutch figures such as I sketch. I find in Disraeli's Curiosities of Literature, which I consulted before coming away, that a French writer wrote an elaborate treatise to prove that tea merchants were always immoral members of society. It would be rather curious to apply the theory to the present day. 11 Warwick Gardens, Kensington, undated. I direct this letter to your ancient patrimonial estate, unknowing whether it will reach you or where it will reach you if it does. Whether you are shooting polar bears on the ice fields of Spitsbergen or cooking missionaries among the cannibals of the South Pacific. But wherever you are, I find some considerable relief in turning from the lofty correspondence of the secretary, with no disparagement of my much esteemed friend Oldershaw, to another friend, Ifelo Makelimso, as Mr. Verdon Green said who can discourse on some other subjects besides the society, and who will not devote the whole of his correspondence to the questions of that excellent and valuable body. The society is a very good thing in its way, being the president I naturally think so, but like other good things, you may have too much of it, and I have had. As I said before, I don't know where you are disporting yourself beyond some hurried remark about Paris, which you dropped in our hurried interview in one of the brilliant flashes of silence between those imbecile screams and yells and stamping, which even the natural enthusiasm at the prospect of being broken up cannot excuse. 6. The Quadrant, North Warwick, Haddington, Scotland, 1891. You will probably guess that as far as personal taste and instincts are concerned, I share all your antipathy to the noisy plebeian excursionist. A visit to Ramsgate during the season, and the vision of the crowded howling sands, has left in me feelings which all my radicalism cannot allay. At the same time, I think that the lower orders are seen unfavorably when enjoying themselves, and labor and trouble they are more dignified and less noisy. Your suggestion as to a series of soliloquies is very flattering and has taken hold of me to the extent of writing a similar ballad on Simon de Montfort. The order in which they come is rather incongruous, particularly if I include the list I have in my mind for the future. Thus, Danton, William III, Simon de Montfort, Rousseau, David and Russell. I rejoice to say that this is a sequestered spot into which hiddenly high tea, etc., and all the ills and trains have not penetrated. In these last two letters, there are sentences of a kind not to be found anywhere else in Chesterton. The disparagement of Lucian Oldershaw's excessive enthusiasm for the junior debating club, the solemn reprobation of the imbecile screams and yells and stamping of the last day at school before the summer holidays, and the antipathy expressed for the rowdy enjoyments of the lower orders, these things are not in the least like either the Chesterton that was to be or the Chesterton that then was, but they are very much like Bentley. He was two years younger than Chesterton, but far older than his years, and he seemed indeed to the other boys and perhaps to himself, like an elderly gentleman smiling a remote, amused smile at the enthusiasms of the young. I get the strongest feeling that at this stage Chesterton not only admired him, as he was to do all his life, but wanted to be like him, to say the kind of thing he thought Bentley would say. This phase did not last, as we shall see. It had gone by the time Chesterton was at the Slade School. 6. The Quadrant North Berwick, Haddington, Scotland, undated, probably 1891. Dear Bentley, we have been here three days, and my brother loudly murmurs that we have not yet seen any of the sights. For my part, I abominate sights, and all people who want to look at them. A great deal more instruction, to say nothing of pleasure, is to be got out of the nearest haystack or hedgerow taken quietly than trotting over two or three counties to see the view, or the sight, or the extraordinary cliff, or the unusual tower, or the unreasonable hill, or any other monstrosity deforming the face of nature. 
Anybody can make sights, but nobody has yet succeeded in making scenery. Excuse the unaccountable pencil drawing in the middle, which was drawn unconsciously on the back of the unfinished letter. 9. South Terrace, Littlehampton, Sussex, undated. I agree with you in your admiration for Paradise Lost, but consider it, on the whole, too light and childish a book for persons our age. It is all very well as small children to read pretty stories about Satan and Belial when we have only just mastered our Oedipus and our Herbert Spencer. But when we grow older, we get to like Captain Marriott and Mr. Kingston. And when we are men, we know that Cinderella is much better than any of those babyish books. As regards one question which you asked, I may remark that the children of Israel, presumably the Solomons, have not gone unto Ora, neither unto Sittim, but unto the land that is called Shropshire. They went and abode therein, and they came upon a city, even unto the city that is called Shrewsbury, and there they builded themselves a home where they might buy. And their home was in the land that was called Castle Street, and their home was the 25th tabernacle in that land, and they abode with certain of their own kin until their season be over and gone. And lo, they spake unto me by letter, saying, Heard ye aught of him that is called Bentley? Is he in the house of his fathers, or has he come upon a strange land? Here endeth the second lesson. Hotel de Lille A. Albion, 223 Rue Saint-Honoré, Paris. Undated, probably 1592. They showed us over the treasures of the cathedral, among which, as was explained by the guide who spoke a little English, was a cross given by Louis XIV to Mace Lavalliere. I thought that concession to the British system of titles was indeed touching. I also thought, when reflecting, what the present was, and where it was, and then to whom it was given, that this showed pretty well what the religion of the Bourbon regime was, and why it has become impossible since the revolution. Grand Hotel du Chemin de Fer, Aramanche, Calvados, undated. Art is universal. This remark is not so irrelevant and Horace Greeley-like as it may appear. I've just had a demonstration of its truth on the coach coming down here. Two very nice little French boys with cropped hair and restless movements were just in front of us, and my pather, having discovered that the book they had with them was a prize at a Paris school, some slight conversation arose. Not thinking my French altogether equal to a prolonged interview, I took out a scrap of paper and began, with a fine carelessness, to draw a picture of Napoleon I. Hat, chin, attitude all complete. This, of course, was gazed at rapturously by these two young inheritors of France's glory, and it ended in my drawing them unlimited goblins to keep for the remainder of the interview. In May 1891, the chairman of the JDC attained a maturity of 17. The secretary then arose in a speech in which he extolled the merits of the chairman as a chairman and mentioned the benefit which the junior debating club received on the day of which this was the anniversary, the natal day of Mr. Chesterton, proposed that a vote wishing him many happy returns of the day and a long continuance in the chair of the club should be passed. This was carried with acclamations. The chairman replied after restoring order. Naturally, this question of order among a crowd of boys loomed large. At the beginning, a number of rules were passed, giving great powers to the chairman, which that gentleman, he says of himself, lenient by temperament and republican by principles, certainly would never have put in force, it was seldom enough, he continues, that the boy of 15 found himself in the position of the chairman, an attitude of command and responsibility over a body of his friends and equals, and it was not to be expected that they would easily take to the state of things. Nor was the chairman himself, like the secretary, protected and armed by any personal aptitude for practical proceedings. But solely by the certain degree of respect entertained for his character and acquirements, this respect, sincere and even excessive, 
as it frequently was, contrasted somewhat humorously with the common inattention to questions of order. Nor could anything be more noisy than the loyalty of Fordham and Langdon Davies, with the exception of their interruptions. It may then fairly be said that the troubles and discussions of the first months of the club's existence centered practically around the question of order, the first of the great difficulties of this most difficult enterprise. How boys could scarcely be got to behave quietly under the strictest schoolmasters could ever be brought to obey the rebuke of their equal and schoolfellow. How a heterogeneous pack of average schoolboys could organize themselves into a self-governing republic these were problems of real and stupendous difficulty. The fines of a penny and a tuppence, which were instituted at the first meeting, were found hopelessly incompetent to cope with the bursts of obvious hilarity. Fordham in particular, whose constant breaches of order threatened to exhaust even the extensive treasury of that spoilt and opulent young gentleman, soon left calculation far behind. Nor can the story be better or more brightly told than by himself. Mr. F., he wrote, at one time, after considerable calculation, found that he was in debt to the extent of some 10 or 11 shillings, but as he felt that by refusing to pay the sum he would be striking a blow for the liberty of the subject, he manfully held out against what he considered an unjust punishment for such diminutive frivolities as he had indulged in. At times, incidents of a disturbing and playful nature have roused the wrath of the chairman and the secretary to a pitch awful to behold. At one time, Mr. H., a member who soon resigned, spent a considerable part of a meeting under the table until he found himself used as a public footstool and a doormat combined. At another, as Mr. Bentley was departing from the scene of chaos, a penny bun of the sticky order caressingly stung his honored cheek, sped upon its errand of mercy by the unerring aim of Mr. F. G.K. was in fact 16 when the J.D.C. began. Manuscript, History of the J.D.C. Mr. Fordham well remembers how G.K. one day took him aside at the older Shaw's house and told him that he really must be less exuberant. This historic occasion was always alluded to later as the day on which the chairman spoke seriously to Mr. F. After various resignations, order was restored, and a little later two of the chief recalcitrants asked to be received back into the club. I feel so lonely without it, one of them had remarked, and G.K. comments, this has always appeared to the present writer one of the most important speeches in the history of the club. The junior debating club had come through its moments of difficulty and was a fact and an establishment. Nor was the circulation of the debater long confined to members of the club and their own circle of friends and relatives. Some of the boys had no doubt a regular allowance, but probably a small one. Gilbert himself says in his diary that he had no income except errant expenses and printer's bills had to be paid. Moreover, in the first number, the editor, Lucian Oldershot, confessed frankly that one reason for the paper's existence was that the society may not degenerate into the position of a mutual admiration society by totally lacking the admiration of outsiders. The staff were able immediately to note any apprehensions we may have felt on the morning of the publication of the debater were speedily dispelled when by nightfall we had disposed of all our copies. Of a later issue, the energetic editor sold 65 copies in the course of the summer holidays. Masters, too, began to read it, and at last a copy was hid on the table of the High Master, Mr. Walker. Cecil Chesterton describes the High Master as a gigantic man with a booming voice. Some Paulines believe he had given Gilbert the first inspiration for the personality of Sunday in The Man Who Was Thursday. Another contemporary says that he was reputed to take no interest in anything except examination successes, and that the boys were amazed at the effect on him of reading the debater. Reading in the light of his future, one sees qualities in Gilbert's work not to be found in that of the other contributors. But it is worth noting that the JDC members were, in fact, a quite unusually able group. Almost every one of them took brilliant scholarships to Oxford or Cambridge. 
The high master had never boasted of so many scholarships from one set of boys, and in reading The Debater, an enjoyment I wish others could share, one has to bear in mind the relative ages of the contributors. It is, I think, striking that all these boys should have recognized Gilbert's quality and accepted his leadership, for they were all a year or so younger than he was, and yet were in the same form. They knew that this was only because G.K. would not bother to do his schoolwork. Still, I think at that age, they showed insight by knowing it. Gilbert's work is to be found in every number of the debater, usually verse as well as prose. Both Fordham and Oldershaw remember most vividly the effect of reading a fanciful essay on dragons in the first number. The dragon, it began, is the most cosmopolitan of impossibilities. And the boys, rolling the words on their tongues, murmured to one another, this is literature. Except for an occasional flash, the one element not yet visible in these debater essays is humor. This is curious because some of his most brilliant fooling belongs to the same period. In a collection made after his death, The Colored Lands, is an illustrated jeu d'esprit of 1891, Half Hours in Hades, an elementary handbook on demonology, which is as amusing a thing as he ever wrote. The drawings he made for it show specimens of the evolution of various types of devil into various types of humans. The devils themselves are carefully classified common or garden serpent, Tentator or Tensis, the Red Devil, the Abolus, Mephistopheles, the Blue Devil, Carulus, Lugubrius, etc. Mr. J. Milton's specimen is discussed in various methods of pursuing observations in supernatural history which possess an interest which will remain after health, youth, and even life have departed. There is nothing of this kind in the debater. Besides the historical soliloquies mentioned in the letter to Bentley, there are poems in which he is beginning to feel after his religious philosophy. One of these, in a very early number, shows considerable power for a boy not yet 17. Adveniat Regnum Tuum Not that the widespread wings of wrong brood o'er a moaning earth, not from the clean curse of gold, the random lot of birth. Not from the misery of the weak, the madness of the strong. Goes upward from our lips, the cry, How long, O Lord, how long? Not only from the huts of toil, the dens of sin and shame. From lordly halls and peaceful homes, the cry goes up the same. Deep in the heart of every man, where his life be spent, There is a noble weariness, a holy discontent. Where the mortal eyes has come, in silence dark and lone, some glimmer of the far-off light the world has never known, some ghostly echoes from a dream of Earth's triumphal song, that as the vision fades we cry, How long, O Lord, how long? Long ages from the dawn of time, men's toiling march has flown. Towards the world they ever sought, the world they never found. Still far before their toiling path, the glimmering promise lay. Still hovered round the struggling race, a dream by night and day. Mid darkening care and clinging sin, they sought their unknown home. Yet ne'er the perfect glory came. Lord, will it ever come? The weeding of earth's gardens, broad from all its growths of wrong, when all man's soul shall be a prayer, and all his life a song. I, though through many a starless night we guard the flaming oil, though we have watched a weary watch, a toil, a weary toil. Though in the midnight wilderness we wander still forlorn, yet bear we in our hearts the proof that God shall send the dawn. Deep in the tablets of our hearts, writes that yearning still, the lung that his hand hath wrought shall not his hand fulfill. Though death shall close upon us, all before that hour we see. The goal of ages yet is there, the good time yet to be. Therefore tonight from varied lips in every house and home goes up to God the common prayer, Father, thy kingdom come. The Debater, Volume 1, March, April, 1891. Gilbert's prose work in The Debater must have been 
a little less surprising to any master who had merely watched him slumbering at a desk. His historical romance, The White Cockade, is immature and unimportant. But essays on Spencer, Milton, Pope, Gray, Cowper, Burns, Wordsworth, humor and fiction, boys' literature, Sir Walter Scott, Browning, the English dramatists, showed a range and a quality of literary criticism alike surprising. Perhaps most surprising, however, is the fact that all this does not seem to have been made clear to either masters or parents the true nature of Gilbert's vocation. He suffered at this date from having too many talents, for he still went on drawing. His drawings seemed to many the most remarkable thing about him, and were certainly the thing he most enjoyed doing. Even now his schoolwork had not brought him into the highest form, called not the sixth, as in most schools, but the eighth. The highest form he ever reached was 6B. But in the summer term of 1892, he entered a competition for a prize poem and won it. The subject chosen was St. Francis Xavier. I give the poem in Appendix A. It is not as notable as some other of his work at that time. What is interesting is that in it, this schoolboy expresses with some power a view he was later to explode yet more powerfully. He might have claimed for himself what he said of earlier writers. It is not true that they did not see our modern difficulties, they saw through them. Never before had this contest been won by any but an eighth form boy. And almost immediately afterwards, Gilbert was amazed to find a short notice posted on the board. G.K. Chesterton to rank with the eighth. F.W. Walker, High Master. The High Master, at any rate, had traveled far from the atmosphere of the form reports when Mrs. Chesterton visited him in 1894 to ask his advice about her son's future. For he said, six foot of genius, cherish him, Mrs. Chesterton, cherish him. Gilbert Keith Chesterton by Maisie Ward. Chapter four, art schools and university college. When all Gilbert's friends were at Oxford or Cambridge, he used to say how glad he was that his own choice had been a different one. He never sighed for Oxford. He never regretted his rather curious experiences at an art school, two art schools really, although he only talks of one in the autobiography, for he was for a short time at a school of art in St. John's Wood, Calderon's, Lawrence Solomon thought, whence he passed to the Slade School. He was there from 1892 to 1895, and during part of that time he attended lectures on English literature at University College. The chapter on the experiences of the next two years is called, in the autobiography, How to Be a Lunatic, and there is no doubt that these years were crucial and at times crucifying in Gilbert's life. During a happily prolonged youth, he was now 18 and a half, he had developed very slowly but normally. Surrounded by pleasant friendships and home influences, he had never really become aware of evil. Now it broke upon him suddenly, probably to a degree exaggerated by his strong imagination and distorted by the fact that he was undergoing physical changes, usually belonging to an earlier age. Toward the end of his school life, Gilbert's voice had not yet broken. His mother took him to a doctor to be overhauled and was told that his brain was the largest and most sensitive the doctor had ever seen. A genius or an idiot was the verdict on the probabilities. Above all things, she was told to avoid for him any sort of shock, physically, mentally, spiritually. He was on a very large scale, and probably for that reason, of a slow rate of development. The most highly differentiated organisms are the slowest to mature, and without question, Gilbert did mature very late. He was now passing through the stage described by Keats, the imagination of a boy is healthy and the mature imagination of a man is healthy, but there is space of life between, a period, unhealthy, or at least ill-focused. Intellectually, Gilbert suffered at this time from an extreme skepticism. As he expressed it, he felt as if everything might be a dream as if he had projected the universe from within. The agnostic doubts the existence of God. Gilbert, at moments, doubted the existence of the agnostic. Morally, his temptation seemed to have been in some strange psychic region rather than merely physical. The whole period is best summarized in a passage from the autobiography. For looking back after 40 years, 
Gilbert still saw it as deeply and darkly significant, as both a mental and moral extreme of danger. There is something truly menacing in the thought of how quickly I could imagine the maddest when I had never committed the mildest crime. There was a time when I had reached that condition of moral anarchy within, in which a man says, in the words of Wilde, "Let us with the blood-stained knife were better than the thing I am. I've never indeed felt the faintest temptation to the particular madness of Wilde, but I could at this time imagine the worst, the wildest disproportions and distortions of more normal passion. The point is that the whole mood was overpowered and oppressed with a sort of congestion of imagination. As Bunyan, in his morbid period, described himself as prompted to utter blasphemies, I had an overpowering impulse to record or draw horrible ideas and images, plunging deeper and deeper as in a blind spiritual suicide. Pages 88 to 89. Two of his intimate friends, finding at this time a notebook full of these horrible drawings, asked one another, is Chesterton going mad? He dabbled too in spiritualism until he realized that he reached the verge of forbidden and dangerous ground. I would not altogether rule out the suggestion of some that we were playing with fire or even with hellfire. In the words that were written for us, there was nothing ostensibly degrading, but any amount that was deceiving. I saw quite enough of the thing to be able to testify with complete certainty that something happens which is not in the ordinary sense natural or produced by the normal conscious human will. Whether it is produced by some subconscious but still human force, or by some powers, good, bad, or indifferent, which are external to humanity. I would not myself attempt to decide. The only thing I will say with complete confidence about that mystic and invisible power is that it tells lies. The lies may be larks, or they may be lures to the imperiled soul, or they may be a thousand other things. But whatever they are, they are not truths about the other world, or, for that matter, about this world. Autobiography, page 77. He told Father O'Connor some years later that he had used the planchette freely at one time, but had to give it up on account of headaches ensuing. After the headaches came a horrid feeling as if one were trying to get over a bad spree with what I can best describe as a bad smell in the mind. Father Brown on Chesterton, page 74. Idling at his work, he fell in with other idlers and has left a vivid description in a daily news article called The Diabolist of one of his fellow students. It was strange, perhaps, that I liked his dirty, drunken society. It was stranger still, perhaps, that he liked my society. For hours of the day, he would talk with me about Milton or Gothic architecture. For hours of the night, he would go where I have no wish to follow him, even in speculation. He was a man with a long, ironical face and close red hair. He was by a class a gentleman and could walk like one, but preferred for some reason to walk like a groom carrying two pails. He looked like a sort of super jockey, as if some archangel had gone on the turf. And I shall never forget the half hour in which he and I argued about real things for the first and last time. He had a horrible fairness of the intellect that made me despair of his soul. A common, harmless atheist would have denied that religion produced humility or humility a simple joy, but he admitted both. He only said, but shall I not find an evil a life its own. Granted that for every woman I ruin, one of those red sparks will go out. Will not the expanding pleasure of ruin. Do you see that fire, I asked? If we had a real fighting democracy, someone would burn you in it, like the devil worshipper you are. Perhaps, he said, in his tired, fair way. Only what you call evil, I call good. He went down the great steps alone, and I felt as if I wanted the steps swept and cleaned. I followed later, and as I went to find my hat in the low, dark passage where it hung, I suddenly heard his voice again, and the words were inaudible. I stopped, startled, but then I heard the voice of one of the vilest of his associates saying, Nobody can possibly know. And then I heard those two or three words which I remember in every syllable and cannot forget. 
I heard the diabolist say, I tell you I have done everything else. If I do that, I shan't know the difference between right and wrong. I rushed out without daring to pause, and as I passed the fire, I did not know whether it was hell or the furious love of God. I have since heard that he died. It may be said, I think, that he committed suicide, though he did it with tools of pleasure, not with tools of pain. God help him, I know the road he went, but I have never known or even dared to think what was that place at which he stopped and refrained. Quoted in G.K. Chesterton, a criticism, Alston Rivers Limited, 1908, pages 20 to 22. Revulsion from the atmosphere of evil took Gilbert to no new thing, but to a strengthening of old ties and a mystic renewal of them. The JDC was idealized into a mystical city of friends, a list. I know a friend, very strong and good. He is the best friend in the world. I know another friend, subtle and sensitive. He is certainly the best friend on earth. I know another friend, very quiet and shrewd. There is no friend so good as he. I know another friend who is enigmatical and reluctant. He is the best of all. I know yet another who is polished and eager. He is far better than the rest. I know another who is young and very quick. He is the most beloved of all friends. I know a lot more, and they are all like that. Amen. The Cosmic Factories What are little boys made of? Bentley is made of hardwood with a knot in it, a complete set of browning and strong spring. Oldershaw, of a box of lucifer matches and a stylographic pen. Lawrence, of a barrister's wig, files of punch and salt. Morris, of watch wheels, three riders and a clean collar. Grenad is made of moonlight and tobacco. Bertram is mostly a handsome black walking stick. Waldo is a nice cabbage with a vanishing odor of cigarettes. Salter is made of sand and fire and a university extension ticket. But the strongest element in all cannot be expressed. I think it is a sort of star from the notebook. There are fragments of a morality play entitled The Junior Debating Club of a modern novel in which every one of the debaters makes his appearance of a medieval story called The Legend of Sir Edmund of the Brotherhood of the Jongleur de Dieu. Notes, fragments, letters, all show an intense individual interest that covered the life of each of his friends. If one of them is worried, he worries too. If one rejoices, he rejoices exceedingly. They write to him about their ideas and views, their relations with one another, their reactions in the world of Oxford life, their love affairs. I am in need of some literary tonic or bloodletting, says Burnett, which you alone can supply. I only hope, writes Bertram, you may be as much use in the world in the future as you have been in the past to your friends. Most of the absent club, writes Salter, separated from the others, lie together in my pocket at this moment. Gilbert writes in the notebook, an idol. Tea is made, the red fogs shut round the house, but the gas burns. I wish I had at this moment round the table a company of fine people. Two of them are at Oxford, and one in Scotland, and two at other places. But I wish they would all walk in now, for the tea is made. Gilbert was devoted to them all, but as we have seen, Bentley's was the supreme friendship of his youth. It was a friendship of foolery, as we are told by the dedication of Greybeards at play. He was, through boyhood storm and shower, my best, my nearest friend. We wore one hat, smoked one cigar, one standing at each end. It was a deeply serious friendship, as we are told in the dedication of the man who was Thursday. With Bentley alone, he shared the doubts that drove us through the night as we two talked amain. And day had broken on the streets, ere it broke upon the brain. Most young men write or at least begin novels of which they are themselves the heroes. Gilbert wrote and illustrated a fairy story about a boyish romance of Lucian Oldershaw's, while two unfinished novels have Bentley for hero. He is, too, in the medieval story, Sir Edmund of the Brotherhood of the Jongleur de Dieu. Gilbert sings, like all young poets of first love, but it is Bentley's, not his own. He was as much excited about a girl Bentley had fallen in love with as if he had fallen in love with her himself. 
And where a London street has a special significance, one discovers it is because of a memory of Bentley's. To Bentley, then, with whom all was shared, Gilbert wrote, when through friendship and the goodness of things, he had come out again into the daylight. The second thought that had saved him had largely grown out of the first. The JDC meant friendship. Friendship meant the highest of all good things, and all good things called for gratitude. As he gave thanks, he drew near to God. Dunedin Lodge, 4th Street, North Warwick, undated, probably a long vacation in 1894. Your letter was most welcome, in which, however, it does not differ widely from most of your letters. I read somewhere in some fatuous, complete letter writer or something, that it is correct to imitate the order of subjects, etc., observed by your correspondent. In obedience to this rule of breeding, I will hurriedly remark that my holiday has been nice enough in itself. We walk about, lie on the sand, go and swim in the sea when it generally rains, and the combination gets in our mouths and we say the name of the professor in the water babies. Inwardly speaking, I have had a funny time. A meaningless bit of depression, taking the form of certain absurd psychological worries, came upon me. And instead of dismissing it and talking to people, I had it out and went very far into the abysses, indeed. The result was that I found that things, when examined, necessarily spelt such a mystically satisfactory state of things that without getting back to earth, I saw lots that made me certain it is all right. The vision is fading into common day now, and I am glad. The frame of mind was the reverse of gloomy, but it would not do for long. It is embarrassing, talking with God face to face as a man speaketh to his friend. In another letter, a cosmos one day, being rebuked by a pessimist, replied, How can you, who revile me, consent to speak to my machinery? Permit me to reduce you to nothingness, and then we will discuss the matter. Moral, you should not look a gift universe in the mouth. Another powerful influence in the direction of mental health was the discovery of Walt Whitman's poetry. I shall never forget, Lucian Older Shaw writes, reading to him from the Canterbury Walt Whitman in my bedroom at West Kensington. The seance lasted from two to three hours, and we were intoxicated with the excitement of the discovery. For some time now, we shall find Gilbert dismissing belief of any positive existence of evil and treating the universe on the Whitman principle of jubilant and universal acceptance. He writes, too, in the Whitman style, by far the most important of his notebooks is one which by amazing good fortune can be dated beginning in 1894 and continuing for several years in its attitude to man it is whitman-esque to a high degree yet it is also most characteristically chestertonian whitman is content with a shouting roaring optimism about life and humanity chesterton had to find it a philosophical basis Hardly, as he disliked the literary pessimism of the hour, he was not content simply to exchange one mood for another. For whether he was conscious of it at the time or not, he did later see Whitman's outlook as a mood and not a philosophy. It was a mood, however, that Chesterton himself never really lost, solely because he did discover the philosophy needed to sustain it. And thereby, even in this early notebook, he goes far beyond Whitman. Even so early, he knew that a philosophy of man could not be a philosophy of man only. He already feels a presence in the universe. It is evening, and into the room enters again a large, indiscernible presence. Is it a man or a woman? Is it one long dead or yet to come that sits with me in the evening? This again might have only been a mood had he not found the philosophy to sustain it. It is remarkable how much of this philosophy he had arrived at in the notebook before he had come to know Catholics. Indeed, the notebook seems to me so important that it needs a chapter to itself with abundant quotation. Meanwhile, what was Gilbert doing about his work at University College? Professor Fred Brown told Lawrence Solomon that when he was at the Slade School, he always seemed to be writing, and while listening to lectures, he was always drawing. It is probably true that, as Cecil Chesterton says, he shrank from the technical toils of the artist as he never did later from those of authorship, and none of the professors regarded him as a serious art student. They pointed later to his illustrations of biography for beginners as proof that he never learnt to draw. 
Yet how many of the men who did learn seriously could have drawn those sketches, full of crazy energy and vitality? I know nothing about drawing, but anyone may know how brilliant are the illustrations to Greybeards at Play or Biography for Beginners, and later to Mr. Belloc's novels. And anyone can see the power of line with which he drew in his notebooks unfinished suggestions of humanity or divinity. Anyone too can recognize a portrait of a man and faces full of character continue to adorn G.K.'s exercise books. Of living models, he affected chiefly Gladstone, Balfour, and Joe Chamberlain. In Hours of Thought, he made drawings of our Lord, with a crown of thorns or nailed to a cross. These suddenly appear in any of his books between fantastic drawings or lecture notes. As the mind wandered and lingered, the fingers followed it. And as Gilbert listened to lectures, he would even draw on the top of his own notes. He had always had facility, and that facility increased so that in later years he often completed in a couple of hours the illustrations to a novel of Belloc's. Nor were these drawings merely illustrations of an already completed text, for Belloc has told me that the characters were often half suggested to him by his friend's drawings. On one at any rate of his vacations, Gilbert went to Italy, and two letters to Bentley show how much of the way his thoughts were going. Hotel New York, Florence, undated, probably 1894. Dear Bentley, I turned to write my second letter to you and my first to Gray, or Solomon, just after having a very interesting conversation with an elderly American like Colonel Newcomb, though much better informed, with whom I compared notes on Botticelli, Ruskin, Carlyle, Emerson, and the world in general. I asked him what he thought of Whitman. He answered frankly that in America they were hardly up to him. We have one town, Boston, he said precisely that has got up to Browning. He then added that there was one thing everyone in America remembered, Whitman himself. The old gentleman quite kindled on the topic. Whitman was a real man, a man who was so pure and strong that he could not imagine him doing any unmanly thing anywhere. It was odd words to hear at a uh, table d'hote from your next door neighbor. It made me quite excited over my salad. You see, this humanitarianism in which we are entangled asserts itself where? By all guidebook laws, it should not. When I take up my pen to write to you, I am thinking more of a white-mustached old Yankee at a hotel than about the things I have seen within the same 24 hours. The frescoes of Santa Croce, the illuminations of St. Marco, the white marbles of the Tower of Giotto, and the very Madonnas of Raphael, and the, the very David of Michelangelo. Throughout this tour, in pursuance of our theory of traveling, we have avoided the guide. He is the death knell of individual liberty. Once only, he broke through our rule, and that was in favor of an extremely intelligent, nay, impulsive young Italian in Santa Maria Novella, a church where we saw some of the most interesting pieces of medieval painting I have ever seen. Interesting, not so much from an artistic as from a moral and historical point of view. Particularly noticeable was the great fresco expressive of the grandest medieval conception of the communion of saints, a figure of Christ surmounting a crowd of all ages and stations, among whom were not only Dante, Petrarca, Giotto, etc., etc., but Plato, Cicero, and best of all, Arius. I said to the guide in a tone of expostulation, heretico, a word of impromptu manufacture, whereupon he nodded, smiled, and was positively radiant with the latitudinarianism of the old Italian painter. It was interesting, for it was a fresh proof that even the early church united had a period of thought and tolerance before the dark ages closed around it. There's one thing I must tell you more of when we meet, the Tower of Giotto. It was built in a square of Florence near the cathedral by a self-made young painter and architect who had kept sheep as a boy on the Tuscan hills. It is still called the Shepherd's Tower. What I want to tell you about is the series of bas-reliefs which uh, Giotto traced on it, representing the creation and the progress of man, his discovery of navigation, astronomy, law, music, and so on. It is religious in the grandest sense, but there is not a shred of doctrine. Even the fall is admitted from this history in stone. If Walt Whitman had been an architect, he would have built such a tower with such a story in it. As I want to go out and have a look at it before we start for Venice tomorrow, I must cut this short. 
I hope you're enjoying yourself as much as I am, and thinking about me half as much as I am about you. Your very sincere friend, Gilbert K. Chesterton. No one would have enjoyed more than Gilbert rereading this letter in after years and noting the suggestion that the 15th century belonged to the early church and preceded the Dark Ages. And I think, too, that even in Giotto's Tower, he might later have discovered some roots of doctrine. Grand Hotel de Milan, undated. Dear Bentley, I write you a third letter before coming back while Venice and Verona are fresh in my mind. Of the former, I can really only discourse a viva voce. Imagine a city whose very slums are full of palaces, whose every other house wall has a battered fresco or a gothic bas-relief. Imagine a sky fretted with every kind of pinnacle from the great dome of the Salute to the gothic spires of the Ducal Palace, and the downright arabesque orientalism of the minarets of St. Mark's. And then imagine the whole flooded with a sea that seems only intended to reflect sunsets, and you still have no idea of the place I stopped in for more than 48 hours. Thence, we went to Verona, where Romeo and Juliet languished, and Dante wrote most of hell. The principal products? One, tombs, particularly those of the Scala, a very good old family with an excellent taste in fratricide. There are three tombs, one to each man, I mean, one man, one grave, are really glorious examples of three stages of Gothic, of which more when we meet. Two balconies with young ladies hanging over them, really quite a preponderating feature. Whether this was done in obedience to local associations and in expectation of a Romeo, I can't say. I can only remark that if such was the object, the supply of Juliet's seems very much in excess of the demand. Three Roman remains, of which, however, I did not pronounce a soliloquy beginning wonderful people, which is the correct thing to do. Just as I get to this, I receive your letter and resolve to begin another sheet of paper. I did read Rosebery's speech and was more than interested. I was stirred. The old order of parliamentary forms, peerages, Whiggism, and the right honorable friends has changed, yielding place to the new of industrialism, county council sanitation, education, and the kingdom of heaven at hand. And whatever the Archbishop of Canterbury may say, God fulfills himself in many ways, even by local government. Several things in your letter require notice. First, the accusation leveled against one of being prejudiced against Professor Huxley. I repel with indignation and scorn. You are not prejudiced against cheese because you like oranges, or though the professor is not Isaiah or St. Francis or Whitman or Richard de Gallien, to name some of those whom I happen to affect, I should be the last person in the world to say a word against an earnest, able, kind-hearted, and most refreshingly rational man. By far the best man of his type I know. As to what you say on education generally, I am entirely with you, but it will take a good interview to say how much. As for the little Solomons, I'm prepared to be fond of all of them, as I am of all children, even the grubby little mendicants that run these Italian streets. I am glad you and Gray have pottered. Potter again. I have had such a nice letter from Lawrence. It makes me think it is all going to be the fair beginning of time. Had the months of art study only developed in Gilbert Chesterton his power of drawing, they might still have been worthwhile. But they gave him, too, a time to dream and to think which working for a university degree would never have allowed. His views and his mind were developing fast, and he was also developing a power to which we owe some of his best work, depth of vision. Most art criticism is the work of those who never could have been artists, which is possibly why it tends to be so critical. Gilbert, who could perhaps have been an artist, preferred to appreciate what the artist was trying to say and put into words what he read on the canvas. Hence, both in his Watts and his Blake, we get what some of us ask of an art critic, the enlargement of our own power of vision. This is what made Ruskin so great an art critic. Fact once realized, today forgot. He may have made a thousand mistakes, he had a multitude of foolish prejudices, but he opened the eyes of a whole generation to see and understand great art. G.K. was to begin his published writings with poetry and art criticism. In other words, with vision. And this vision he partly owed to the Slade School. 
Here is a letter undated to Bentley containing a hint of what eight years later became a book on Watts. On Saturday, I saw two exhibitions of pictures. The first was the Royal Academy, where I went with Salter. There was one picture there, though the walls were decorated with frames very prettily. As to the one picture, if you look at an Academy catalog, you will see Jonah by G.F. Watts, and you will imagine a big silly picture of a whale. But if you go to Burlington House, you will see something terrible. A spare, wild figure clad in a sort of green with his head flung so far back that his upper part is a miracle of foreshortening. His hands thrust out, his face ghastly with ecstasy, his dry lips yelling aloud, a figure of everlasting protest and defiance. And as a background, perfect in harmony of color, you have the tracery of the Assyrian bas-reliefs, such as survived in wrecks in the British Museum. A row of those processions of numberless captives bowing before smiling kings. A cruel sort of art, and the passionate energy of that lonely screaming figure in front makes you think of a great many things besides Assyrians, among others of some words of Renan. I quote from memory, but the trace of Israel will be eternal. She, it was, who alone among the tyrannies of antiquity raised her voice for the helpless, the oppressed, the forgotten. But this only expresses a fraction of it. The only thing to do is to come and look at this excited gentleman with bronze skin and hair that approaches green, his eyes simply white with madness, and Jonah said, Yea, I do well to be angry, even unto death. He had learned to look at color, to look at a line, to describe pictures. But far more important than this, he could now create in the imagination gardens and sunsets and sheer color, so as to give to his novels and his stories pictorial value, to his fantasies glow, and to his poetry vision of the realities of things. In his very first volume of essays, The Defendant, were to be passages that could be written only by one who had learned to draw. For instance, in defense of skeletons. The actual sight of the little wood, with its gray and silver sea of life, is entirely a winter vision. So dim and delicate is the heart of the winter woods, a kind of glittering gloaming, that a figure stepping towards us in the checkered twilight seems if we were breaking through unfathomable depths of spider webs. In the year 1895, in which G.K. left art and publishing, he came of age with a loud report. He writes to Bentley, Being 21 years old is really rather good fun. It is one of those occasions when you remember the existence of all sorts of miscellaneous people. A cousin of mine, Alice Chesterton, daughter of my uncle Arthur, writes me a delightful, cordial letter from Berlin, where she is a governess. And better still, my mother has received a most amusing letter from an old nurse of mine, an exceptionally nice and intelligent nurse, who writes on hearing that it is my 21st birthday. Billy, an epithet is suppressed, gave me a little notebook and a little photograph frame. The first thing I did with the notebook was to make a note of his birthday. The first thing I shall do with the frame will be to get Gray to give me a photograph of him to put in. Yes, it is not bad being 21 in a world so full of kind people. I've just been out and got soaking and dripping wet. One of my favorite dissipations. I never enjoy weather so much as when it is driving, drenching, rattling, washing rain. As Mr. Meredith says in the book you gave me, rain, oh, the glad refresher of the grain, and welcome water spouts of blessed rain. It is in a poem called Earth and Wedded Woman, which is fat. Seldom have I enjoyed a walk so much. My sister water was all there and most affectionate. Everything I passed was lovely. A little boy piggybacking another little boy home. Two little girls taking shelter with a gigantic umbrella. The gutters boiling like rivers the hedges glittering with rain. And when I came to our corner, the shower was over, and there was a great watery sunset right over number 80, what Mr. Ruskin calls an opening into eternity. Eternity is pink and gold. This may seem a very strange rant, but it is one of my specimen days. I suppose you could really prefer me to write as I feel, and I am so constituted that these daily incidents get me that way. Yes, I like rain. It means something. I'm not sure why. Something refreshing cleaning, washing out, taking in hand, not caring a damn what you think, doing its duty, robust, noisy, moral, wet. 
It is the baptism of the Church of the Future. Yesterday afternoon, Sunday, Lawrence and Morris came here. We were merely infants at play, at skipping races around the garden and otherwise raced. Runner, run thy race, said Confucius, and in the running, find strength and reward. After that, we tried talking about Magnus and came to some hopeful conclusions. Magnus is all right. As for Lawrence and Gray, if there is anything righter than all right, they are that. There's an expression in Meredith's book which struck me immensely, the largeness of the evening earth. The sensation that the cosmos has all its windows open is very characteristic of evening. Just as it is at this moment, I feel very good. Everything out the window looks very, very flat and yellow. I do not know how else to describe it. It is like the benediction at the end of the service. Gilbert Keith Chesterton by Maisie Ward Chapter 5 The Notebook I am writing this chapter at a table facing Notre Dame de Paris, in front of a cafe filled with arguing French workmen, in the presence of God and of man. And I feel as if I understood the one hatred of G.K.'s life, his loathing of pessimism. Is a man proud of losing his hearing, eyesight, or sense of smell? What should we say of him who prides himself on beginning as an intellectual cripple and ending as an intellectual corpse? From the Notebook. Some Prophecies Woe unto them that keep a god like a silk hat, that believe not in God, but in a God. Woe unto them that are pompous, for they will sooner or later be ridiculous. Woe unto them that are tired of everything, for everything will certainly be tired of them. Woe unto them that cast out everything, for out of everything they will be cast out. Woe unto them that cast out anything, for out of that thing they will be cast out. Woe unto the flippant, for they shall receive flippancy. Woe unto them that are scornful, for they shall receive scorn. Woe unto him that considereth his hair foolishly, for his hair will be made the type of him. Woe unto him that is smart, for men will hold him smart always, even when he is serious. Also from the notebook. A pessimist is a man who has never lived, never suffered. Show me a person who has plenty of worries and troubles, and I will show you a person who, whatever he is, is not a pessimist. This idea G.K. developed later in the Dickens, dealing with the alleged over-optimism of Dickens. Dickens, who, if he had learned to whitewash the universe, had learned it in a blacking factory. Dickens, who had learned through hardship and suffering to accept and love the universe. But that, he wrote later. The quotations given here come from the notebook, begun in 1894 and used at intervals for the next four or five years, in which Gilbert wrote down his philosophy step by step, as he came to discover it. The handwriting is the work of art that he must have learnt and practiced. So different is it from his boyhood's scrawl. Each idea is set down as it comes into his mind. There is no sequence. In this book, and in the colored lands may be seen the creation of the Chesterton view of life. It all took place in his early 20s. From the seed thoughts here, orthodoxy and the rest were to grow. Here, they are only seeds, but seeds contain unmistakably the flower of the future. They should not hear from me a word of selfishness or scorn. If only I could find the door, if only I were born. He makes the unborn babe say this in his first volume of poems. And in the notebook, we see how the babe coming into the world must keep this promise by accepting life with its puzzles, its beauty, its fleetingness. Are we all dust? What a beautiful thing dust is, though. This round earth may be a soap bubble, but it must be admitted that there are some pretty colors in it. What is the good of life? It is fleeting. What is the good of a cup of coffee? It is fleeting. Ha, ha, ha. The birthday present of birth, as he was later to call it in orthodoxy, involved not bare existence only, but a wealth of other gifts. A grievance. He heads this thought. 
Give me a little time. I shall not be able to appreciate them all. If you open so many doors and give me so many presents, O oh Lord God. He is almost overwhelmed with all that he has and with all that is, but accepts it ardently in its completeness. If the arms of a man could be a fiery circle embracing the round world, I think I should be that man. Yet in the face of all this splendor, the pessimist dares to find flaws. The mountains praise thee, O Lord. But what if a mountain said, I praise thee, but put a pine tree halfway up on the left. It would be much more effective, believe me. It is time that the religion of prayer gave place to the religion of praise. If the mountains must praise God, if the religion of praise expresses the truth of things, how much more does it express the truth of humanity, or rather of men? For he saw humanity not as an abstraction, but as the sum of human and intensely individual beings. Once I found a friend. Dear me, I said, he was made for me, but now I find more and more friends who seem to have been made for me, and more, and yet more made for me. Is it possible we were all made for each other, all over the world? And on another page comes perhaps the most significant phrase in the book. I wonder whether there will ever come a time when I shall be tired of any one person. Hence a fantastic thought of a way of making the discovery of more people to know and to like. The Human Circulating Library Notes Get out a gentleman for a fortnight, then change him for a lady or your ticket. No person to be kept out after a fortnight, except with the payment of a penny a day. Any person morally or physically damaging a man will be held responsible. The library omnibus calls once a week, leaving two or three each visit. Man of the season, old standard man. Or better still, my great ambition is to give a party at which everybody should meet everybody else and like them very much. An invitation. Mr. Gilbert Chesterton requests the pleasure of humanity's company to tea, December 25th, 1896. Humanity Esquire, the Earth, Cosmos East. G.K. liked everybody very much and everything very much. He liked even the things most of us dislike. He liked to get wet, liked to be tired. After that one short period of struggle, he liked to call himself always perfectly happy, and therefore he wanted to say thank you. You say grace before meals. All right, but I say grace before the play and the opera, and grace before the concert and the pantomime, and grace before I open a book, and grace before sketching, painting, swimming, fencing, boxing, walking, playing, dancing, and grace before I dip the pen in the ink. Each day seemed a special gift, something that might not have been. Evening. Here dies another day, during which I have had eyes, ears, hands, and the great world round me, and with tomorrow begins another. Why am I allowed to? The Prayer of a Man Walking I thank thee, O Lord, for the stones in the street. I thank thee for the hay carts yonder, and for the houses built and half-built that fly past me as I stride, but most of all for the great wind in my nostrils as if thine own nostrils were close. The prayer of a man resting. The twilight closes round me. My head is bowed before the universe. I thank thee, O Lord, for a child I knew seven years ago, and whom I have never seen since. Praise be God for all sides of life, for friends, lovers, art, literature, knowledge, humor, politics, and for the little red cloud away there in the west. For if he was to be grateful, to whom did he owe gratitude? Here is the chief question he asked and answered at this time. At school, he was looking for God. But at the age of 16 he was, he tells us in orthodoxy, an agnostic, in the sense of one who was not sure one way or the other. Largely it was this need for gratitude 
for what seemed personal gifts that brought him to the belief in a personal God. Life was personal. It was not a mere drift. It had will in it. It was more like a story. A story is the highest mark, for the world is a story in every part of it, and there is nothing that can touch the world or any part of it that is not a story. And again, with the heading, A Social Situation. We must certainly be in a novel. What I like about this novelist is that he takes such trouble about his minor characters. The story shapes from man's birth and is as he meets the other characters that he finds he is in the right story. A man born on the earth. Perhaps there has been some mistake. How does he know he has come to the right place? When he finds his friends, he knows he has come to the right place. You say it is a love affair. Hush, it is a new garden of Eden. And a new progeny will people a new earth. God is always making these experiments. Life is a story. Who tells it? Life is a problem. Who sets it? The world is a problem, not a theorem. And the word of the last day will be Q-E-F. Quadrat faciendum. God sets the problem. God tells the story. But can those know him who are characters in his story, who are working out his problem? Have you ever known what it is to walk along a road in such a frame of mind that you thought you might meet God at any turn of the path? For this, a man must be ready against this. He must never shut the door. There is one kind of infidelity, blacker than all infidelities, worse than any blow of secularist, pessimist, atheist. It is that of those persons who regard God as an old institution. Voices. The axe falls on the wood, it thuds, God, God. The cry of the rook, God, answers it. The crack of the fire on the hearth, the voice of the brook, say the same name. All things, dog, cat, fiddle, baby, wind, breaker, sea, thunderclap, repeat in a thousand languages, God. Next in his thought comes a point where he hesitates as to the meeting place between God and man. How and where can these two incommensurates find a meeting place? What is incarnation, the greatness, and the littleness of man obsessed Chesterton as it did Pascal? It is the eternal riddle. Two strands. Man is a spark flying upwards. God is everlasting. Who are we? To whom this cup of human life has been given? To ask for more. Let us love mercy. Walk humbly. What is man that thou regardest him? Man is a star unquenchable. God is in him incarnate. His life is planned upon a scale colossal of which he sees glimpses. Let him dare all things, claim all things. He is the son of man who shall come in the clouds of glory. I saw these two strands mingling to make the religion of man. A scale colossal of which he sees glimpses. This, I think, is the first hint of the path that led Gilbert to full faith in our Lord. In places in these notes, he regards him certainly only as man, but even then as the man, the only man to whom the colossal scale, the immense possibilities of human nature could be dreamed of as fulfilled. Two notes on Marcus Aurelius are significant of the way his mind was moving. Marcus Aurelius, a large-minded, delicate-witted, strong man, following the better thing like a thread between his hands. Him, we cannot fancy choosing the lower even by mistake. We cannot think of him as wanting for a moment in any virtue, sincerity, mercy, purity, self-respect, good manners. Only one thing is wanting in him. He does not command me to perform the impossible. The Carpenter, the meditations of Marcus Aurelius. Yes, he was soliloquizing, not making something. Do not the words of Jesus ring like nails knocked into a board in his father's workshop. On two consecutive pages are notes showing how his mind is wrestling with the question, the answer to which will complete his philosophy. Christmas Day. Good news, but if you ask me what it is, I know not. 
It is a track of feet in the snow. It is a lantern showing a path. It is a door set open. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I live in an age of varied powers and knowledge, of steam, science, democracy, journalism, art. But when my love rises like a sea, I have to go back to an obscure tribe and a slain man to formulate a blessing. Julian, the Sisti Galilee, he said, and sank, conquered, after wrestling with the most gigantic of powers, a dead man. The Crucified. On a naked slope of a poor province, a Roman soldier stood staring at Egypt. Then he said, surely this was a righteous man. And a new chapter of history opened, having that for its motto. Parables. There was a man who dwelt in the east centuries ago, and now I cannot look at a sheep or a sparrow, a lily or a cornfield, a raven or a sunset, a vineyard or a mountain, without thinking of him. If this be not to be divine, what is it? Cecil Chesterton tells us Gilbert read the Gospels partly because he was not forced to read them. I suppose this really means that he read them with a mature mind, which had not been dulled to their reception by a childhood task of routine lessons. But I do not think at this date it had occurred to him to question the assumption of the period, that official Christianity, its priesthood especially, had trivested the original intention of Christ. This idea is in the Wild Night volume, published in 1900, and more briefly in a suggestion in the notebook for a proposed drama. Gabriel is hammering up a little theater, and the child looks at his hands and finds them torn with nails. Clergyman, the church should stand by the powers that be. Gabriel, yes, that is a handsome crucifix you have there at your chain. That the clergy, that the Christian people, should have settled down to an acceptance of a faulty established order, should not be alert to all that our Lord's life signified was one of the problems. It was, too, a matter of that cosmic loyalty which he analyzes more fully in orthodoxy. Here he simply writes, it is not a question of theology, it is a question of whether, placed as a sentinel of an unknown watch, he will whistle or not. Sentinels do go to sleep, and he was coming to feel that this want of vigilance ran through the whole of humanity. In White Wind, a sketch written at this time, which is published in the Colored Lands, he adumbrates an idea to which he was to return again in Man Alive especially, and in Orthodoxy, that we can by custom so lose our sense of reality that the only way to enjoy and be grateful of our possessions is to lose them for a while. The shortest way home is to go round the world. In this story of White Wind, he applies the parable only to each man's life and the world he lives in. But in orthodoxy, he applies it to the human race, who have lost revealed truth by getting so accustomed to it that they no longer look at it. And already in the notebook, he is calling the attention of a careless multitude to that great empire upon which the sun never sets. I allude to the universe. Most of the quotations about our Lord come in the later part of the book. In the earlier pages, he dreams that to this age, it is given to write the great new song, and to compile the new Bible, and to found the new church, and preach the new religion. And in one rather obscure passage, he seems to hint at the thought that Christ might come again to shape this new religion. Going round the world, Gilbert was finding his way home. The explorer was rediscovering his native country. He himself has given us all the metaphors for what was happening now in his mind. Without a single Catholic friend, he had discovered this wealth of Catholic truth, and he was still traveling. All this I felt, he later summed up in Orthodoxy, that the age gave me no encouragement to feel it. And all this time, I had not even thought of Catholic theology. Gilbert Keith Chesterton by Maisie Ward. Chapter six, Towards a Career. A curious little incident comes towards the end of Gilbert's time at the Slade School. In a letter, he wrote to E.C. Bentley, we see him on the eve of his 21st birthday being invited to write for the Academy. 
Mr. Cotton is a little bristly, bohemian man, as fidgety as a kitten, who runs round the table while he talks to you. When he agrees with you, he shuts his eyes tight and shakes his head. When he means anything rather seriously, he ends up with a loud, nervous laugh. He talks incessantly and is mad on the history of Oxford. I sent him my review of Ruskin, and he read it before me. Note hell, and delivered himself with astonishing rapidity to the following effect. This is very good. You've got something to say. Oh yes, this is worth saying. I agree with you about Ruskin and about the century. This is good. You've no idea. If you saw some stuff, some reviews I get, the fellows are practiced, but of all the damn fools, you've no idea. They know the trade in a way, but such infernal asses as send things up. But this is very good. That sentence does run nicely, but I like your point. Make it a little longer and then send it in. I've got another book for you to review. You know Robert Bridges? Oh, very good, very good. Here it is, about two columns you know. By the way, keep the Ruskin for yourself. You deserve that anyhow. Here I got a word in, one of protest and thanks. But Mr. Cotton insisted on my accepting the Ruskin. So, I am really to serve Laban. Laban proves on analysis to be of the consistency of brick. It is such men as this that have made our cosmos what it is. At one point he said, literally dancing with glee, Oh, the other day I stuck some pins into Andrew Lang. I said, Dear me, that must be a very good game. It was something about an addition of Scott, but I was told that Andrew took the painful operation very well. We sat up horribly late together, talking about Browning, Afghans, Notes, the Yellow Book, the French Revolution, William Morris, Norseman, and Mr. Richard the Gallian. I don't despair for anyone, he said suddenly. Hang it all. That's what you mean by humanity. This appears to be a rather good editor of the Academy. And my joy in having begun my life is very great. I am tired, I said to Mr. Bod Ribb of writing only what I like. Oh well, he said heartily. You have no reason to make that complaint in journalism. But here is a mystery. Nowhere in the Academy columns for 1895 or 1896 are to be seen the initials GKC. Yet, at that date, all the reviews were signed. Mr. Eccles, who was writing for it at the time, told me that he had no recollection of GK among the contributors. And later, he came to know him well when both were together on the speaker. In any case, the idea of reviewing for no reward, except the book, reviewed, would scarcely appeal to a more practical man than Gilbert as a hopeful beginning. Perhaps the mystery is solved by the fact that soon after the date of this letter, Mr. Cotton got an appointment in India. To Mr. Eccles, it appeared somewhat ironical that the unpaid contributors to the Academy were circulized with a suggestion of contributions of money towards a parting present for their late editing. The actual beginning of G.K.'s journalism was in the Bookman, and in the autobiography he insists that it was a matter of mere luck. These opportunities were merely things that happened to me. While still at the Slade School, he was, as we have seen, attending English lectures at University College. There, he met a fellow student. Ernest Potter Williams, of the family which controlled the publishing house of Potter Stout. He gave Chesterton some books on art to review for the Bookman, a monthly paper published by the firm. I need not say, G.K. comments, that having entirely failed to learn how to draw or paint, I tossed off easily enough some criticisms of the weaker points of Rubens or the misdirected talents of Tintoretto. I discovered the easiest of all professions. I have pursued ever since. But neither in the art criticism he wrote for the Bookman, nor in the poems he was to publish in the outlook of the speaker, was there a living. He left the Slade School and went to work for a publisher. Mr. Redway, in whose office Gilbert now found himself, was a publisher largely of spiritualist literature. Gilbert has described in his autobiography his rather curious experience of ghostly authorship, but he relates nothing of his office experience, which is described in another undated letter to Mr. Bentley. 
I am writing this letter just when I like most to write one, late at night, after a beastly lot of midnight oil over a contribution for a Slade magazine intended as a public venture. I am sending them a recast of that picture of Tuesday. Like you, I am beastly busy, but there is something exciting about it. If I must be busy, as I certainly must, being an approximately honest man, I had much rather be busy in a varied, mixed-up way, with half a hundred things to attend to, than with one blank day of monotonous study before me. To give you some idea of what I mean, I have been engaged in three different tiring occupations, and enjoyed them all. One, Redway says, we've got too many manuscripts. Read through them, will you? and send back those that are too bad at once. I go slap through a room full of manuscripts, criticizing, deduced conscientiously, with the result that I post back some years of manuscripts to addresses which I should imagine must be private asylums. But one feels worried somehow. Two, Redway says, I'm going to give you entire charge of the press department, sending copies to reviews, etc., consequence is, one has to keep an elaborate book and make it tally with other elaborate books, and one has to remember all the magazines that exist and what sort of books they crack up. I used to think I hated responsibility. I am positively getting to enjoy it. 3. There is that confounded picture of Tuesday, which I've been scribbling at the whole evening, and have at last got it presented. This sounds like mere amusement, but now that I have tried other kinds of hurry and bustle, I solemnly pledge myself to the opinion that there is no work so tiring as writing, that is, not for fun, but for publication. Other work has a repetition, a machinery, a reflex action about it somewhere, but to be on the stretch inventing fillings, making them out of nothing, making them as good as you can for a matter of four hours, leaves me more inclined to lie down and read Dickens than I ever feel after nine hours ramp at Redways. The worst of it is that you always think the thing's so bad, too, when you're in that state. I can't imagine anything more idiotic than what I've just finished. Well, enough of work and all its works. By all means, come on Monday evening, but don't be frightened if, by any chance, I'm not in till about 6.30 as Monday is a busy day. Of course you'll stop to dinner. What an idiotically long time eight weeks is. This letter does not seem to bear out the suggestion in Cecil's book, G.K. Chesterton and Criticism, see page 23, of Gilbert's probable uselessness to the publishers for whom he worked. After all, literacy is more needful to most publishers than automatic practicality, because it is so very much rarer. Probably G.K. would have been absolutely invaluable had he been a little less kind-hearted. His dislike of sending back a manuscript and making an author unhappy would have been a bar to his utility as a reader. But there are lots of other things to do besides rejecting manuscripts. And two later letters show how capable Gilbert was, felt to be, in doing most of them. The exact date at which he left Redways for the publishing firm of Fisher Unwin of 11 Pater Noster buildings, I cannot discover, but it was fairly early, and he was several years with Fisher Unwin, only gradually beginning to move over into journalism. He did nothing for himself, says Lucian Oldershaw, till we, Bentley and Oldershaw, came down from Oxford and pushed him. The following letters belong to 1898, being written to Francis when they were already engaged. But I put them here as they give some notion of the work he did for his employer. The book I have to deal with for Unwin is an exhaustive and I am told interesting work on Rome and the Empire, a kind of realistic modern account of the life of the ancient world. I've got to fix it up, choose illustrations, introductions, notes, etc. And all because I am the only person who knows a little Latin and precious little Roman history and no more archaeology than a blind cat. It is entertaining, and just like our firm's casual way. Work ought to be done by an authority on Roman antiquities. If I hadn't been there, they would have given it to the office boy. However, I shall get through it all right. The more I see of the publishing world, 
the more I come to the conclusion that I know next to nothing, but that the vast mass of literary people know less. This is something called having a public school education. Extract from Undated Letter, postmarked August 11, 1898. I have a lot of work to do, as Unwin has given me the production of an important book entirely into my hands, as a kind of invisible editor. It's complimentary, but very worrying, and will mean a lot of time at the British Museum. Extract from Undated Letter, postmarked August 29, 1898. 11 Paternoster Buildings, postmark December 1898. For fear that you should really suppose that my observations about being busy are the subterfuges of a habitual liar, I may give you briefly some idea of the irons at present in the fire. As far as I can make out, there are at least seven things that I have undertaken to do, and every one of them I ought to do before any of the others. First, there is the book about ancient Rome, which I have to do for TFU, arrange and get illustrations, etc. This all comes of showing off. It is a story with a moral. Greedy Gilbert, or little boys should be seen and not heard. A short time ago, I had to read a treatise by Dean Stubbs on the ideal woman of the poets, in which the Dean remarked that all the women admired by Horace were wantons. This struck me as a downright slander, slight as it is my classical knowledge. And in my report, I asked loftily what Dean Stubbs made of those noble lines on the wife who hid her husband from his foes. Splendide mendax e in omne virgo nobilis Ivan. One of the purest and stateliest tributes ever made to a woman. The lines might be roughly rendered a magnificent liar and a noble lady for all eternity. But no translation can convey the organ voice of the verse, in which the two strong, lonely words, noble and eternity, stand solitary for the last line. In consequence of my taking up the cudgels against a live dean for the manly moral sense of the dear old Epicurean, the office became impressed with a vague idea that I know something about Latin literature. Whereas, as a matter of fact, I have forgotten even the line before the one I quoted. However, in the most confidential and pathetic manner, I was entrusted with doing with Rome et l'Empire work, which ought to be done by a scholar. Second, then there is Captain Webster. You ask, in gruff, rumbling tones, who is Captain Webster? I will tell you. Captain Webster is a small man with a carefully waxed mustache in a very Bond Street getup, living at the Grosvenor Hotel. Talking to him, you would say he is an ass, but an agreeable ass, a humble, transparent, honorable ass. He is an innocent and an idiotic butterfly. The interesting finishing touch is that he has been to New Guinea for four years or so, and had some of the most hideous and extravagant adventures that could befall a modern man. His yacht was surrounded by shoals of canoes full of myriads of cannibals of a race who file their teeth to look like the teeth of dogs and hang weights in their ears till their ears hang like dogs' ears on the shoulder. He held his yacht at the point of the revolver and got away, leaving some of his men dead on the shore. All night long he heard the horrible noise of the banqueting gongs and saw the huge fires that told his friends were being eaten. Now he lives in the Grosvenor Hotel. Captain Webster finds the pen not only mightier than the sword, but also much more difficult. He has written his adventures, and we are to publish them. And I am translating the honest captain into English grammar, a thing which appalls him much more than the Papuan savages. This means going through it carefully, of course, and rewriting many parts of it, where relatives and dependent sentences have been lost past recovery. I went to see him, and his childlike dependence on me was quite pathetic. His general attitude was, you see, I'm such a damn fool, and so he is. But when I compare him with the Balzacian hauteur and the preposterous posing of many of our Fleet Street decadent geniuses, I feel a movement of the blood which declares that perhaps there are worse things than war. Between ourselves, I have sneaking sympathy with fighting. I fought horribly at school, 
as well, you should know my illogicalities. Third, there is the selection of illustrations for the history of China we are producing. I know no more of China than the man in the moon. Bless, for he has seen it at any rate. Except what I got from reading the book. But of course I shall make the most of what I do know. And the early talk of Lao Tzu and Wu Sankwei and criticized Cheng Tang and Fu Che compared to Chu Leung with his great successor, whose name I have forgotten, and the Napoleonic vigor of Li with the weak optimism of Wu. Before I have done, I hope people will be looking behind for my pigtail. The name I shall adopt will be Chase Ter Tung. Fourth, a manuscript to retranslated from the Norwegian, A History of the Kiss, Ceremonial, Amicable, Amatory, etc., in the worst French sentimental style. God alone knows how angry I am with the author of that book. I'm not sure that I shall not send up the brief report, a Sniveling Hound. Fifth, the book for Nut, Greybeards at Play, which has reached its worst stage, that of polishing up for the eye of Nut, instead of merely rejoicing in the eye of God. You know this is the only one of the lot for which I am at all worried. I do not feel as if things like the fish poem are really worth publishing. I know they are better than many books that are published, but heaven knows that it is not saying much. In support of some of my work, I would fight to the last. With regard to this occasional verse, I feel a humbug. To publish a book of my nonsense verses seems to me exactly like summoning the whole of the people of Kensington to see me smoke cigarettes. But Gregor told me that I should do much better in the business of literature if I found the work more difficult. My facility, he said, led me to undervalue my work. I wonder whether this is true, and those silly rhymes are any good after all. Six, the collection of more serious poems of which I spoke to you. You shall have a hand in the selection of these when you get back. Seven, the novel, which though I have put it aside for the present, it has become too much a part of me not to be constantly having chapters written or rather growing out of the others. And all these things, with the exception of the last one, are supposed to be really urgent and to be done immediately. Now I hope I have sickened you forever of wanting to know the details of my dull affairs, but I hope it may give you some notion of how hard it really is to get time for writing just now. For you see, there are none of them, even mechanical things. They all require some thinking about. I am afraid that if you really want to know what I do, you must forgive me for seeming egoistic. That is the tragedy of the literary person. His very existence is an assertion of his own mental vanity. He must pretend to be conceited, even if he isn't. Beginning to publish, beginning to write, and still developing mentally at a frantic rate, this is a summary of the years 1895-8. to 8. As the notebook shows, Gilbert was reflecting deeply at this time on the relations both between God and man and between man and his fellow man. The realization that their relations had gone very far wrong was necessarily followed, for Gilbert's mind was an immensely practical one. By the question of what the proposed remedies were worth, he has told us that he became a socialist at this time only because it was intolerable not to be a socialist. The socialists seemed the only people who were looking at conditions as they were and finding them unendurable. Christian socialism seemed at first sight for anyone who admired Christ to be the obvious form of socialism. And in a fragment of this period, G.K. traces the resemblance of modern collectivism to early Christianity. The points in which Christian and socialistic collectivism are at one are simple and fundamental. As, however, we must proceed carefully in this matter, we may state these points of resemblance under three heads. One, both rise from the deeps of an emotion, the emotion of compassion for misfortune as such. This is really a very important point. Collectivism is not an intellectual fad, even if erroneous, but a passionate protest and aspiration. It arises as a secret of the heart, a dream of the injured feeling, long before it shapes itself as a definite propaganda at all. 
The intellectual philosophies ally themselves with success and preach competition, but the human heart allies itself with misfortune and suggests communism. Two, both trace the evil state of society to covetousness, the competitive desire to accumulate riches. Thus, both in one case and the other, the mere possession of wealth is in itself an offense against moral order, the absence of it in itself a recommendation and training for the higher life. 3. Both propose to remedy the evil of competition by a system of bearing each other's burdens in the literal sense, that is to say, of leveling, silencing, and reducing one's own chances for the chance of your weaker brethren. The desirability, they say, of a great or clever man acquiring fame is small compared with the desirability of a weak and broken man acquiring bread. The strong man is a man and should modify or adapt himself to the hopes of his mates. He that would be first among you, let him be the servant of all. These are the three fountains of collectivist passion. I have not considered it necessary to enter into elaborate proof of the presence of these three in the Gospels, that the main trend of Jesus' character was compassion for human ills, that he denounced not merely covetousness, but riches again and again, and with an almost impatient emphasis, and that he insisted on his followers throwing up personal aims and sharing funds and fortune entirely. These are plain matters of evidence presented again and again, and in fact, of common admission. Yet that uncanny thing in Gilbert, which always forced him to see facts, mutinied again at this point and produced another fragment in which he has moved closer to Christianity and thereby further away from modern socialism. The world he lived in contained a certain number of Christians who were, he found, highly doubtful about the Christian impulse of socialism. And most of his socialist friends had about them a tone of bitterness and an atmosphere of hopelessness utterly unlike the tone and the atmosphere of Christianity. Just as atheists were the first people to turn Gilbert from atheism towards dogmatic Christianity, so the socialists were now turning him from socialism. The next fragment is rather long, but was never published, and I think so important as showing how his mind was moving that it cannot well be shortened. It is a document of capital importance for the biography of Chesterton. Now, for my own part, I cannot, in the least agree with those who see no difference between Christian and modern socialism, nor do I, for a moment, join in some Christian socialists' denunciations of those worthy middle-class people who cannot see the connection. For I cannot help thinking that, in a way, these latter people are right. No reasonable man can read the Sermon on the Mount and think that its tone is not very different from that of most collectivist speculation of the present day. And the Philistines feel this, though they cannot distinctly express it. There is a difference between Christ's socialist program and that of our own time, a difference deep, genuine, and all-important. And it is this which I wish to point out. Let us take two types side by side, or rather the same type in the two different atmospheres. Let us take the rich young man of the Gospels and place him beside the rich young man of the present day on the threshold of socialism. If we were to follow the difficulties, theories, doubts, results, and conclusions of each of these characters, we should find two very distinct threads of self-examination running through the two lives. And the essence of the difference was this. The modern socialist is saying, what will society do, while his prototype, as we read, said, what shall I do? Properly considered, this latter sentence contains the whole essence of the older communism. The modern socialist regards his theory of regeneration as a duty which society owes to him. The early Christian regarded it as a duty which he owed to society. The modern socialist is busy framing schemes for its fulfillment. The early Christian was busy considering whether he would himself fulfill it there and then. The ideal of modern socialism is an elaborate utopia to which he hopes the world may be tending. The ideal of the early Christian was an actual nucleus, living the new life, to whom he might join himself if he liked. Hence the constant note running through the whole gospel of the importance, difficulty, and excitement 
of the call, the individual and practical request made by Christ to every rich man. Sell all thou hast and give to the poor. To us, socialism comes speculatively as a noble and optimistic theory of what may be the crown of progress. To Peter and James and John, it came practically as a crisis of their own daily life, a stirring question of conduct and renunciation. We do not, therefore, in the least agree with those who hold that modern socialism is an exact counterpart or fulfillment of the socialism of Christianity. We find the difference important and profound, despite the common ground of anti-selfish collectivism. The modern socialist regards communism as a distant panacea for society. The early Christian regarded it as an immediate and difficult regeneration of himself. The modern socialist reviles, or at any rate reproaches, society for not adopting it. The early Christian concentrated his thoughts on the problem of his own fitness and unfitness to adopt it. To the modern socialist, it is a theory. To the early Christian, it was a call. Modern socialism says, elaborate a broad, noble, and workable system and submit it to the progressive intellect of society. Early Christianity said, sell all thou hast and give to the poor. This distinction between the social and personal way of regarding the change has two sides, a spiritual and a practical, which we propose to notice. The spiritual side of it, though of less direct and revolutionary importance than the practical, has still a very profound philosophic significance. To us it appears something extraordinary that this Christian side of socialism, the side of the difficulty of personal sacrifice and the patience, cheerfulness, and good temper necessary for the protected personal surrender is so constantly overlooked. The literary world is flooded with old men seeing visions and young men dreaming dreams with various stages of anti-competitive enthusiasm, with economic apocalypses, elaborate utopias, and mushroom destinies of mankind. And, as far as we have seen, in all this whirlwind of theoretic excitement, there is not a word spoken of the intense practical difficulty of the summons to the individual, the heavy, unrewarding cross borne by him who gives up the world. For it will not surely be denied that not only will socialism be impossible without some effort on the part of individuals, but that socialism, if once established, would be rapidly dissolved or worse still, diseased, if the individual members of the community did not make a constant effort to do that, which, in the present state of human nature, must be an effort to live the higher life. Mere state systems could not bring about and still less sustain a reign of unselfishness without a cheerful decision on the part of the members to forget selfishness even in little things. And for that most difficult and at the same time most important personal decision, Christ made provision and the modern theorists make no provision at all. Some modern socialists do indeed see that something more is necessary for the golden age than fixed incomes and universal stores tickets and that the fountainheads of all real improvement are to be found in human temper and character. William Morris, for instance, in his News from Nowhere, gives a beautiful picture of a land ruled by love and rightly grounds the give and take camaraderie of his ideal state upon an assumed improvement in human nature. But he does not tell us how such an improvement is to be effected, and Christ did. Of Christ's actual method in this matter, I shall speak afterwards. When dealing with the practical aspect, my object just now is to compare the spiritual and emotional effects of the call of Christ as compared to those of the vision of Mr. William Morris. When we compare the spiritual attitudes of two thinkers, one of whom is considering whether social history has been sufficiently a course of improvement to warrant him in believing that it will culminate in universal altruism, while the other is considering whether he loves other people enough to walk down tomorrow to the marketplace and distribute everything but his staff and his script. It will not be denied that the latter is likely to undergo certain deep and acute emotional experiences, which will be quite unknown to the former. And these emotional experiences are what we understand as the spiritual aspect of the distinction. For three characteristics, or at least the Galilean program makes more provision, humility, activity, cheerfulness, 
the real triad of Christian virtues. Humility is a grand and stirring thing, the exalting paradox of Christianity, and the sad want of it in our time is, we believe, what really makes us think life dull, like a cynic, instead of marvelous, like a child. With this, however, we have at present nothing to do. What we have to do with is the unfortunate fact that among no persons is it more wanting than among socialists, Christian and other. The isolated or scattered protest for a complete change in social order, the continual harping on one string, the necessarily jaundiced contemplation of a system already condemned, and above all, the haunting, pessimistic whisper of a possible hopelessness of overcoming the giant forces of success, all these impart undeniably to the modern socialist a tone excessively imperious and bitter. Nor can we reasonably blame the average money-getting public for their impatience with the monotonous virulence of men who are constantly reviling them for not living communistically, and who, after all, are not doing it themselves. Willingly do we allow that these latter enthusiasts think it impossible in the present state of society to practice their ideal? For this fact, while vindicating their indisputable sincerity, throws an unfortunate vagueness and inconclusiveness over their denunciations of other people in the same position. Let us compare with this arrogant and angry tone among the modern utopians who can only dream the life, the tone of the early Christian who was busy living it. As far as we know, the early Christians never regarded it as astonishing that the world as they found it was competitive and unregenerate. They seem to have felt that it could not, in its pre-Christian ignorance, have been anything else, and their whole interest was bent on their own standard of conduct and exhortation which was necessary to convert it. They felt that it was by no merit of theirs that they had been enabled to enter into the life before the Romans, but simply as a result of the fact that Christ had appeared in Galilee and not Rome. Lastly, they never seemed to have entertained a doubt that the message would itself convert the world with a rapidity and ease which left no room for severe condemnation of the heathen societies. With regard to the second merit, that of activity, there can be little doubt as to where it lies between the planner of the utopia and the convert of the brotherhood. The modern socialist is a visionary, but in this he is on the same ground as half the great men of the world, and to some extent of the early Christian himself, who rushed towards a personal ideal very difficult to sustain. The visionary who yearns toward an ideal, which is practically impossible, is not useless or mischievous, but often the opposite. The person who is often useless, always mischievous, is the visionary who dreams with the knowledge, or the half-knowledge, that his ideal is impossible. The early Christian might be wrong in believing that by entering the brotherhood, men could in a few years become perfect, even as their Father in Heaven was perfect, but he believed it and acted flatly and fearlessly on the belief. This is the type of the higher visionary. But all the insidious dangers of the vision, the idleness, the procrastination, the mere mental aestheticism, come in when the vision is indulged, as half our socialist conceptions are, as a mere humor or fairy tale where the consciousness, half confessed, that is beyond practical politics and that we need not be troubled with its immediate fulfillment. The visionary who believes in his own most frantic vision is always noble and useful. It is the visionary who does not believe in his vision who is the dreamer, the idler, the utopian. This then is the second moral virtue of the older school, an immense direct sincerity of action, the cleansing away by the sweats of hard work of all those subtle and perilous instincts of mere ethical castle building which have been woven like the spells of an enchantress round so many of the strong men of our own time. The third merit, which I have called cheerfulness, is really the most important of all. We may perhaps put the comparison in this way. It might strike many persons as strange that in a time on the whole so optimistic in its intellectual beliefs as this is, in an age when only a small minority disbelieve in social progress and a large majority believe in an ultimate social perfection, there should be such a tired and blasé feeling among numbers of young men. This we think is due, 
not to the want of an ultimate ideal, but to that of an immediate way of making for it. Not of something to hope for, but of something to do. A human being is not satisfied and never will be satisfied with being told that it is all right. What he wants is not a prediction of what other people will be hundreds of years hence. Make him cheerful, but a new and stirring test and task for himself, which will assuredly make him cheerful. A knight is not contented with the statement that his commander has hid his plans so as to ensure victory. What the knight wants is a sword. This demand for a task is not mere bravado. It is an eternal and natural part of the higher optimism, and as deep-rooted as the foreshadowing of perfection. I do not know whether Gilbert would yet have actually called himself a Christian. He was certainly tending towards the more Christian elements in his surroundings. It seems pretty clear from all he wrote and said later that he did not hold that transformation have been fully effected until after his meeting with Francis, to whom he wrote many years later. Therefore I bring these rhymes to you who brought the cross to me. These papers are undated and are arranged in no sequence. It is possible this last one was written after their first meeting. Certain it is that in it, he had begun feeling after a more Christian arrangement of society than socialism offered, and particularly after an arrangement better suited to the nature of man. This thought of man's nature, as primary, was to remain the basis of the social thinking at the end of his life. Gilbert Keith Chesterton by Maisie Ward Chapter 7 Incipiat Vita Nova In the notebook may be seen Gilbert's occasional thoughts about his own future love story. Suddenly in the midst. Suddenly in the midst of friends, of brothers known to me more and more, and their secrets, histories, tastes, hero worships, schemes, love affairs known to me, suddenly I felt lonely. Felt like a child in a field with no more games to play because I have not a lady to whom to send my thought at that hour that she might crown my peace. Madonna Mia, about her whom I have not yet met, I wonder what she is doing now at this sunset hour. Working perhaps, or playing, worrying, or laughing. Is she making tea, or singing a song, or writing, or praying, or reading? Is she thoughtful, as I am thoughtful? Is she looking now out the window, as I am looking out the window? But a few pages later comes the entry, FB. You are a very stupid person. I don't believe you have the least idea how nice you are. FB was Francis, daughter of a diamond merchant sometime dead. The family was of French descent, the name de Blog having been somewhat unfortunately anglicized into Blog. They had fallen from considerable wealth into a degree of poverty that made it necessary for the three daughters to earn a living. Frances was never strong, and Gilbert has told how utterly exhausted she was at the end of each day's toil. She worked very hard as secretary of an educational society in London. The family lived in Bedford Park, a suburb of London, that went in for artistic housing and a kind of garden city atmosphere long before this was at all general. Judging by their photographs, the three girls must all have been remarkably pretty, and young men frequented the house in great numbers. Among them, Brimley Johnson, who was engaged to Gertrude, and Lucian Oldershaw, who later married Ethel. Sometime in 1896, Oldershaw took Gilbert to call, and Gilbert literally at first sight fell in love with Francis. From the Autobiography, page 153. To my lady, God made you very carefully. He set a star apart for you. He stained it green and gold with fields, and aureoled it with sunshine. He peopled it with kings, peoples, republics, and so made you very carefully. All nature is God's book, filled with his rough sketches for you. From the Notebook. When almost 40 years later, Gilbert was writing his autobiography, Francis asked him to keep her out of it. The liking they both had for keeping private life private made him call it this very Victorian narrative. 
Nevertheless, he tells us something of the early days of their acquaintance. Gilbert had mentioned the moon. She told me in the most normal and unpretentious tone that she hated the moon. I talked to the same lady several times afterwards and found that this was a perfectly honest statement of fact. Her attitude on this and other things might be called a prejudice, but it could not possibly be called a fad, still less an affection. She really had an obstinate objection to all those natural forces that seemed to be sterile or aimless. She disliked loud winds that seemed to be going nowhere. She did not care much for the sea, a spectacle of which I was very fond. And by the same instinct, she was up against the moon, which she said looked like an imbecile. On the other hand, she had a sort of hungry appetite for all the fruitful things like fields and gardens and anything connected with production, about which she was quite practical. She practiced gardening. In that curious cockney culture, she would have been quite ready to practice farming. And on the same perverse principle, she actually practiced a religion. This was something utterly unaccountable, both to me and to the whole fussy culture in which she lived. Any number of people proclaimed religions, chiefly oriental religions, analyzed or argued about them, but that anybody could regard religion as a practical thing like gardening was something quite new to me and to her neighbors, new and incomprehensible. She had been by accident brought up in the school of an Anglo-Catholic convent, and to all the agnostic or mystic world, practicing a religion was much more puzzling than professing it. She was a queer card. She wore a green velvet dress, barred with gray fur, which I should have called artistic, but that she hated all the talk about art. And she had an attractive face, which I should have called elfish, but that she hated all talk about elves. But what was arresting and almost blood-curdling about her is that social atmosphere it was not so much that she hated it, as that she was entirely unaffected by it. She never knew what was meant by being under the influence of Yeats or Shaw or Tolstoy or anybody else. She was intelligent with a great love of literature and especially of Stevenson. But if Stevenson had walked into the room and explained his personal doubts about personal immortality, she would have regretted that he should be wrong upon the point, but would otherwise have been utterly unaffected. She was not at all like Robespierre, except in a taste for neatness and dress. And yet it is only in Mr. Belloc's book on Robespierre that I have ever found any words that describe the unique quality that cut her off from the current culture and saved her from it. God had given him in his mind a stone tabernacle in which certain great truths were preserved imperishable. Autobiography, pages 151 to 153. A letter to a friend, Mildred Wayne, who is now engaged to Waldo Abigdor, makes the future tolerably easy to foresee. My brother wishes me to thank you with ferocious gratitude for the music, which he is enjoying tremendously. It reminds me rather of what Miss Francis blog, but that is another story. In your past letter, you inquired whether I saw anything of the blogs now. If you went and put that question to them, there would be a scene. Mrs. Blog would probably fall upon the fire irons. Nollies would foam in convulsions on the carpet. Ethel would scream and take refuge on the mantelpiece, and Gertrude would faint and break off her engagement. Francis would, but no intelligent person can affect an interest in what she does. Lawrence Solomon told me that Mrs. Edward Chesterton did not approve of the rather arty, crafty atmosphere of Bedford Park, that earliest of garden cities, so conveniently unconventional, where Francis lived. She did not like her son's friendship with Bloggs, and she had chosen for him a girl who she felt would make him an ideal wife. Very open air, Mr. Solomon said, not booky, but good at games and practical. He was not sure whether Gilbert realized this, but personally, I believe that Gilbert realized everything. Of course you know, Annie Furman wrote to me, that Aunt Marie never liked Francis or Bentley. Annie was the girl chosen by Gilbert's mother. She was very much a member of the family. Did Gilbert ever speak to you? 
she wrote to me recently, of the old Saturday night parties at Barnes at the home of the grandparents. Every Saturday night, the family, or as many of it as could, used to go down to Barnes to supper. And the boys and Tom Gilbert, Alice Chesterton's husband, used to sing round the supper table. Many a one I went to when I was staying at Warwick Gardens. We used to go on a red Hammersmith bus before the days of motor cars. On a longer trip, they stayed at Burke in Belgium, and Cecil had a strange idea, apparently regarded by him as humorous, which measures the family absence of a Christian sense at this date. Cecil urged me to sit at the foot of the big crucifix in the village street and let him photograph me as Mary Magdalene. I didn't, and I don't know how he thought he'd get away with the modern clothing. Whatever, Gilbert's mother may have planned for them. Neither she nor Gilbert had any romantic feeling for each other. Indeed, Cecil was definitely her favorite, and she believed him the favorite of both parents also. He had more heart, she says, than the more brilliant Gilbert. Anyhow, his heart was shown more openly to her. Cecil was not much given to versifying, she wrote in another letter. He sent me the enclosed when my son was born. I value it so much. Headed to Annie, the poem is a long one. It begins with the ancient comradeship, loyal and unbroken, in which they had first seen life together. Shining nights, tumultuous days, joy swift caught in sudden ways. All the laughter, love and praise, all the joys of living. These we shared together, dear, plot and jest and story. This is hid, shut off, unknown, seeing that to you alone is the wondrous kingdom shown in the power and glory. Annie's thoughts then, and Cecil's, were not greatly on the elder brother, who was pursuing his own romance with a heart that seems to have been fairly adequate in its energies. Most mothers have watched their sons through one or more experiences of calf love. Gilbert indicates in the autobiography, and I knew it too, from some jokes he and Francis used to make, that he had one or two fancies before the coming of reality. He must then convince his mother that reality had come. He must overcome a prejudice avowed by neither. He must call on the deeps of a mother's feelings so effectively that it would never now be avowed that it might indeed be swept away. And so, sitting at a table in a seaside lodging, as his mother sat in the same room or moved about making cocoa for the family, Gilbert tried to express what even for him was the inexpressible. One Roseberry Villas, Granville Road, Felix Stowe. Dearest Mother, You may possibly think this is a somewhat eccentric proceeding. You are sitting opposite and talking about Mrs. Burlock. But I take this method of addressing you because it occurs to me that you might possibly wish to turn the matter over in your mind before writing or speaking to me about it. I'm going to tell you the whole of the situation in which I believe I have acted rightly, though I am not absolutely certain, and to ask for your advice on it. It was a somewhat complicated one, and I repeat that I do not think I could rightly have acted otherwise. But if I were the greatest fool in the three kingdoms and had made nothing but a mess of it, there is one person I should always turn to and trust. Mothers know more of their sons' idiocies than other people can, and this has been particularly true in your case. I've always rejoiced at this and not been ashamed of it. This has always been true and always will be. These things are easier written than said, but you know it is true, don't you? I am inexpressibly anxious that you should give me credit for having done my best and for having constantly had in mind the way in which you would be affected by the letter I am now writing. I do hope you will be pleased. Almost eight years ago, you made a remark. This may show you that if we jeer at your remarks, we remember them. The remark applied to the hypothetical young lady with whom I should fall in love and took the form of saying, if she is good, I shan't mind who she is. I don't know how many times I have said that over to myself in the past two or three days in which I have decided on this letter. Do not be frightened, or suppose that anything sensational or final has occurred. I am not married, my dear mother, neither am I engaged. You are called to the Council of Chiefs very early in its deliberations. If you don't mind, I will tell you briefly the whole story. 
You are, I think, the shrewdest person for seeing things whom I ever knew. Consequently, I imagine that you do not think that I go down to Bedford Park every Sunday for the sake of the scenery. I should not wonder if you know nearly as much about the matter as I can tell in a letter. Suffice it to say, however briefly, for neither of us care much for gushing, this letter is not on Mrs. Radcliffe lines. That the first half of my time of acquaintance with the blogs was spent in enjoying a very intimate but quite breezy and platonic friendship with Francis Blog, reading, talking, and enjoying life together, having great sympathies on all subjects, and the second half in making the thrilling but painfully responsible discovery that platonism on my side had not the field by any means to itself. That is how we stand now. No one knows except her family and yourself. My dearest mother, I am sure you are at least not unsympathetic. Indeed, we love each other more than we shall either of us ever be able to say. I have refrained from sentiment in this letter, for I don't think you like it much. But love is a very different thing from sentiment, and you will never laugh at it. I will not say that you are sure to like Francis, for all young men say that to their mothers, quite naturally, and their mothers never believe them, also quite naturally. Besides, I am so confident I should like you to find her out for yourself. She is in reality very much the sort of woman you like, what is called, I believe, a woman's woman, very humorous, inconsequent, and sympathetic, and defiled with no offensive exuberance of good health. I have nothing more to say except that you and she have occupied my mind for the last week to the exclusion of everything else, which must account for my abstraction, and that in her letter she sent the following message. Please tell your mother soon. Tell her I am not so silly as to expect her to think me good enough, but really I will try to be. An aspiration which, considered from my point of view, naturally provokes a smile. Here you give me a cup of cocoa. Thank you. Believe me, my dearest mother, always your affectionate son, Gilbert. What exactly Gilbert meant by saying they were not engaged is hard to surmise in view of Francis' message to her future mother-in-law of his sensations when proposing Gilbert gives some idea in the autobiography. It was fortunate, however, that our next most important meeting was not under the sign of the moon, but of the sun. She has often affirmed, during our later acquaintance, that if the sun had not been shining to her complete satisfaction on that day, the issue might have been quite different. It happened in St. James Park, where they keep the ducks and the little bridge, which has been mentioned in no less authoritative a work than Mr. Belloc's essay on bridges. Since I find myself quoting that author once more, I think he deals in some detail, in his best topographical manner, with various historic sites on the continent, but later relapses into a larger manner, somewhat thus. The time has now come to talk at large about bridges. The longest bridge in the world is the fourth bridge, and the shortest bridge in the world is a plank over a ditch in the village of Loudwater. The bridge that frightens you most is the Brooklyn Bridge, and the bridge that frightens you least is the bridge in St. James Park. I admit that I crossed that bridge in undeserved safety, and perhaps I was affected by my early romantic vision of the bridge leading to the Princess's Tower, but I can assure my friend, the author, that the bridge in St. James Park can frighten you a good deal. From the Autobiography, pages 154 to 155. Now, with Francis' promise to him, Gilbert could enjoy everything properly, could execute, verbally at least, a wild fantasia. Among the first of his friends to be written to was Mildred Wayne, because, as he says in a later letter, he felt towards her deep gratitude for forming a topic of conversation on my first visit to a family with which I have since formed a dark and shameful connection. Dear Mildred, on rising this morning, I carefully washed my boots in hot water and blackened my face. Then, assuming my coat with graceful ease, and with the tails in front, I descended to breakfast, where I gaily poured the coffee on the sardines and put my hat on the fire to boil. These activities will give you some idea of my frame of mind. My family, observing me leave the house by way of the chimney and take the fender with me under one arm, 
thought I must have something on my mind. So I had. My friend, I am engaged. I am only telling it at present to my real friends, but there is no doubt about it. The next question that arises is, whom am I engaged to? I have investigated this problem with some care, and as far as I can make out, the best authorities point to Frances Blog. There can, I think, be no reasonable doubt that she is the lady. It is as well to have these minor matters clear in one's mind. I am very much too happy to write much, but I thought you might remember my existence sufficiently to be interested in the incident. Waldo has been of so much help to me in this and in everything, and I am so much interested in you for his sake and your own that I am encouraged to hope our friendship may subsist. If ever I have done anything rude or silly, it was quite inadvertent. I have always wished to please you. To Annie Furman, he wrote, I can only think of the day, one of the earliest I can recall of my life, when you came in and helped me to build a house with bricks. I am building another one now, and it would not have been complete without your going over it. To others, he wrote such sentences as he could put together in the whirlwind of his happiness. For himself, he stammered in a verse that grew with the years into his great love poetry. God made thee mightily, my love. He stretched his hands out of his rest and lit the star of east and west. Brooding o'er darkness like a dove, God made thee mightily, my love. God made thee patiently, my sweet. Out of all stars, he chose a star. He made it red with sunset bar. And green with greeting, for thy feet, God made thee mightily, my sweet. Gilbert Keith Chesterton by Macy Ward Chapter 8 To Francis This chapter can be written only by Gilbert himself. It might seem that he had no words left for an emotion heightened beyond the love of his friends and the joyous acceptance of existence. But in these letters, he shows the truth of his own theory that to love each thing separately strengthens the power of loving. To have tried to love everyone is, as he tells Francis, no bad preparation for loving her. The emotion of falling in love had both intensified his appreciation of all things and cast for him a vivid light on past, present, and future, so that in the last of these letters, he sketches his life down to the moment when a new life begins. I am looking over the sea and endeavoring to reckon the estate I have to offer you. As far as I can make out, my equipment for starting on a journey to Fairyland consists of the following items. First, a straw hat. The oldest part of this admirable relic shows traces of pure Norman work. The vandalism of Cromwell's soldiers has left us little of the original hat band. Second, a walking stick. Very knobby and heavy admirably fitted to break the head of any denizen of Suffolk who denies that you are the noblest of ladies, but of no other manifest use. Third, a copy of Walt Whitman's poems, once nearly given to Salter, but quite forgotten. It has his name in it still, with an affectionate inscription from his sincere friend Gilbert Chesterton. I wonder if he will ever have it. Fourth, a number of letters from a young lady containing everything good and generous and loyal and holy and wise that isn't in Walt Whitman's poems. Fifth, an unwieldy sort of pocket knife, the blades mostly having an edge of a more varied and picturesque outline than is provided by the prosaic cutter. The chief element, however, is a thing to take stones out of a horse's hoof. What a beautiful sensation of security it gives one to reflect that if one should ever have money enough to buy a horse and should happen to buy one and the horse should happen to have a stone in its hoof, one is ready. One stands prepared with a defiant smile. Sixth, passing from the last miracle of practical foresight, we come to a box of matches. Every now and then I strike one of these because fire is beautiful and burns your fingers. Some people think this waste of matches, the same people who object to the building of cathedrals. Seventh, about three pounds in gold and silver, the remains of one of Mr. Unwin's bursts of affection, those explosions of spontaneous love for myself, which, such is the perfect order and harmony of his mind, occur at startling exact intervals of time. Eighth, a book of children's rhymes, in manuscript, called The Weather Book, 
about three quarters finished and destined for Mr. Nutt. This was Greybeards at play. I've been working at it fairly steady, which I think jolly credible under the circumstances. One can't put anything interesting in it. They'll understand those things when they grow up. Night, a tennis racket. Nay, start not. It is part of a new regime, and the only new and neat-looking thing in the museum. We'll soon mellow it, like the straw hat. My brother and I are teaching each other lawn tennis. Tenth, a soul, hitherto idle, and omnivorous, but now happy enough to be ashamed of itself. Eleventh, a body, equally idle and quite equally omnivorous, absorbing tea, coffee, claret, seawater, and oxygen to its own perfect satisfaction. It is happiest swimming, I think, the sea being about a convenient size. Twelfth, a heart, mislaid somewhere, and that is about all the property of which an inventory can be made at present. After all, my tastes are stoically simple. A straw hat, a stick, a box of matches, and some of his own poetry. What more does a man require? The city of Felix Stowe, as seen by the local prophet from the neighboring mountain peak, does not strike the eye as having anything uncanny about it. At least I imagine that it requires rather careful scrutiny before the eerie curl of the chimney pot or the elfin wink of a lonely lamppost brings home to the startled soul that it is really the city of a fearful folk. That the inhabitants are not human in the ordinary sense is quite clear, yet it has only just begun to dawn on me, after staying a week in the town of unreason, with its monstrous landscape and grave, unmeaning customs, do I seem to be raving? Let me give my experiences. I am bound to admit that I do not think I am good at shopping. I generally succeed in getting rid of money, but other observances, such as bringing away the goods that I've paid for and knowing what I've bought, I often pass over as secondary. But to shop in a town of ordinary tradesmen is one thing shop in a town of raving lunatics is another. I set out one morning happy and hopeful with the intention of buying A. A tennis racket, B. Some tennis balls, C. Some tennis shoes, D. A ticket for a tennis ground. I went to the shop pointed out by some villager, probably mad, and went in and said I believe they kept tennis rackets. The young man smiled and assented. I suggested that he might show me some. The young man looked positively alarmed. Oh, he said, we haven't got any, not got any here. I asked where. Oh, they're out, you know, all round. He explained wildly and with a graphic gesture in the direction of the sea and the sky. All out brown. We've left them all round at places. To this day, I don't know what he meant, but I merely asked when they would quit these weird retreats. He said in an hour, and in an hour I called again. Were they in now? Well, not in, not in just yet, he said, with a sort of feverish confidentialness, as if he wasn't quite sure. Are they still all out at places, I asked, with restrained humor. Oh, no, he said, with a burst of reassuring pride. They are only out there, out behind, you know. I hope my face expressed my beaming comprehension of the spot alluded to. Eventually, at a third visit, the rackets were produced. None of them, I was told by my brother, were of any first-class maker, so that was outside the question. The choice was between some good, neat, first-handed instruments which suited me and some seedy-looking second-hand objects with plain deal handles, which would have done in a pinch. I thought that perhaps it would be better to get a good class racket in London and content myself for the present with economizing on one of the second-hand monuments of depression. So I asked the price. 10.6 was the price of the second-hand article. I thought this large for the tool and wondered if the first-hand rackets were much dearer. What price for the first-hand? 7.6, said the creature, cheery as a bird. I did not faint. I am strong. I rejected the article, which was dearer, because it had been hallowed by human possession and accepted the cheap new crude racket. Except the newness, there was no difference between them whatever. I then asked the smiling maniac for balls. He brought me a selection of large red globes, nearly as big as Dutch cheeses. I said, are these tennis balls? 
He said, oh, did you want tennis balls? I said, yes, they often come in handy at tennis. The goblin was, however, quite impervious to satire, and I left him endeavoring to draw my attention to his wares in general, particularly to some zinc baths, which he seemed to think should form part of the equipment of a tennis player. Never before or since have I met a being of that order and degree of creepiness. He was a nightmare of unmeaning idiocy. But some mention ought to be made of the old man at the entrance to the tennis ground, who opened his mouth in parables on the subject of the fee for playing there. He seemed to have been wound up to make only one remark. It's expense. Under these circumstances, the attempt to discover whether the sixpence covered a day's tennis or a week or fifty years was rather baffling. At last, I put down the sixpence. This seemed to galvanize him into life. He looked at the clock, which was indicating five past eleven, and said, It's sixpence an hour, so you'll be all right till two. I fled, screaming. Since then, I have examined the town more carefully and feel the presence of something nameless. There is a claw curl in the sea-bent trees, an eye gleam in the dark flints in the wall that is not of this world. When we set up house, darling, honeysuckle, porch, you clipped hedge, bees, poetry, and eight shillings a week, I think you will have to do the shopping, particularly at Felixstone. There was a great and glorious man who said, give us the luxuries of life and we will dispense with the necessities. That, I think, would be a splendid motto to write in letters of brown gold over the porch of our hypothetical home. There will be a sofa for you, for example, but no chairs, for I prefer the floor. There will be a select store of chocolate creams to make you do the carp with, and the rest will be bread and water. We will each retain a suit of evening dress for great occasions, and at other times clothe ourselves in the skins of wild beasts. How pretty you would look, which would fit your taste in furs and be economical. I have sometimes thought it would be very fine to take an ordinary house, a very poor commonplace house in West Kensington, say, and make it symbolic. Not artistic, heaven, oh heaven forbid. My blood boils when I think of the affronts put by knock-kneed pictorial epicures on the strong, honest, ugly, patient shapes of necessary things the brave old bones of life. There are aesthetic pottering prigs who can look on a saucepan with one tear of joy or sadness, mongrel decadence who can see no dignity in the honorable scars of the kettle. So they concentrate all their house decoration on colored windows that nobody looks out of and vases of the lilies that everybody wishes out of the way. No, my idea, which is much cheaper, is to make a house really allegoric really explain its own essential meaning. Mystical or ancient sayings should be inscribed on every object. The more prosaic the object, the better, and the more coarsely and rudely the inscription was traced, the better. Hast thou sent the rain upon the earth should be inscribed on the umbrella stand, perhaps on the umbrella. Even the hairs of your head are all numbered, would give a tremendous significance to one's hairbrushes. The words about living water would reveal the music and sanctity of the saint, while our God is consuming fire might be written over the kitchen grate to assist the mystic musings of the cook. Shall we ever try that experiment, dearest? Perhaps not, for no words would be golden enough for the tools you had to touch. You would be beauty enough for one house. By all means, let us have bad things in our dwelling and make them good things. I shall offer no objection to your having an occasional dragon to dinner or a penitent griffin to sleep in the spare bed. The image of you taking a Sunday school of little devils is pleasing. They will look up, first in savage wonder, then in vague respect. They will see the most glorious and noble lady that ever lived since their prince tempted Eve, with a halo of hair and great heavenly eyes that seem to make the good at the heart of things almost too terribly simple and naked for the sons of flesh. And as they gaze, their tails will drop off, and their wings will sprout, and they will become angels in six lessons. I cannot profess to offer any elaborate explanation of your mother's disquiet, but I admit it does not wholly surprise me. 
You see, I happen to know one factor in the case, and one only, of which you are wholly ignorant. I know you. I know one thing which has made me feel strange before your mother. I know the value of what I take away. I feel, in a weird moment, like the angel of death. If you say you want to talk to me about death, my views about death are bright, brisk, and entertaining. And when Azrael takes a soul, it may be to other and brighter worlds, like those whither you and I go together. The transformation called death may be something as beautiful and dazzling as the transformation called love. It may make the dead man happy, just as your mother knows that you are happy. But nonetheless, it is a transformation, and sad sometimes for those left behind. A mother whose child is dying can hardly believe that in the inscrutable unknown, there is anyone who can look to it as well as she. And if a mother cannot trust her child easily to God Almighty, shall I be so mean as to be angry because she cannot trust it easily to me? I tell you, I have stood before your mother and felt like a thief. I know you are not going to part, neither physically, mentally, morally, or spiritually, but she sees a new element in your life, wholly from outside. Is it not natural, given her temperament, that you should find her perturbed? Oh, dearest, dearest Francis, let us always be very gentle to older people. Indeed, darling, it is not they who are the tyrants, but we. They may interrupt our building in the scaffolding stages. We turn their house upside down when it is their final home and rest. Your mother certainly would have been worried if you had been engaged to the Archangel Michael, who indeed is bearing his disappointment very well. How much more when you are engaged to an aimless, tactless, reckless, unbrushed, strange-hatted, opinionated scarecrow who has suddenly walked into the vacant place. I could have prophesied her unrest. Wait, and she will calm down all right here. God comfort her, I dare not. Gilbert Keith Chesterton was born of comfortable but honest parents on the top of Camden Hill, Kensington. He was christened at St. George's Church, which stands just under that more imposing building, the Waterworks Tower. This place was chosen apparently in order that the whole available water supply might be used in the intrepid attempt to make him a member of Christ, a child of God, and an inheritor of the kingdom of heaven. Of the early years of this remarkable man, few traces remain. One of his earliest recorded observations was the simple exclamation, full of heartfelt delight, look at baby, funny baby. Here we see the first hint of that ineffable conversational modesty, that shy social self-effacement, which has ever hidden his light under a bushel. His mother also recounts with apparent amusement an incident connected with his imperious demand for his father's top hat. Give me that hat, please. No, dear, you mustn't have that hat. Give that hat. No, dear. If you don't give it to me, I'll say at. An exquisite selection in the manner of hats has indeed always been one of the great man's hobbies. When he had drawn pictures of all the blinds and tablecloths and towels and walls and window panes, it was felt that he required a larger sphere. Consequently, he was sent to Mr. Buescher, who gave him desks and copy books and Latin grammars and atlases to draw pictures on. He was far too innately conscientious not to use these materials to draw on. To other uses, asserted by some to belong to these objects, he paid little heed. The only really curious thing about his school life was that he had a weird and quite involuntary habit of getting French prizes. They were the only ones he ever got, and he never tried to get them. But though the thing was quite mysterious to him, and though he made every effort to avoid it, it went on, being evidently a part of some occult, natural law. For the first half of his time at school, he was very solitary and futile. He never regretted the time, for it gave him two things, complete mental self-sufficiency and a comprehension of the psychology of outcasts. But one day, as he was roaming about a great naked building land, which he haunted in the play hours, rather like an outlaw in the woods, he met a curious, agile youth with hair brushed up off his head. Seeing each other, they promptly hit each other simultaneously and had a fight. Next day, they met again and fought again. 
These Homeric conflicts went on for many days, till one morning, in the crisis of some insane grapple, the subject of this biography quoted, like a war chant, something out of Macaulay's lays. The other started and relaxed his hold. They gazed at each other. Then the foe quoted the following line. In this land of savages, they knew each other. For the next two hours, they talked books. They have talked books ever since. The boy was Edmund Clarehue Bentley. The incident just narrated is the true and real account of the first and deepest of our hero's male connections. But another was to ensure probably equally profound and far more pregnant with awful and dazzling consequences. Bentley always had a habit of trying to do things well. Twelve years of the other's friendship has not cured him of this. Being seized with a peculiar desire to learn conjuring, he had made the acquaintance of an eerie and supernatural young man who instructed him in the black art. A gun, the Thistophelian sort of individual, who our subject half thought was a changeling. Our subject has not quite got over the idea yet, though for practical social purposes he calls him Lucian Oldershaw. Our subject met Lucian Oldershaw that night, as Shakespeare says, there was a star. These three persons soon became known through the length and breadth of St. Paul's School as the founders of a singular brotherhood. It was called the JDC. No one, we believe, could ever have had better friends than did the hero of this narrative. We wish that we could bring before the reader the personality of all the knights of that eccentric round table. Most of them are known already to the reader. Even the subject himself is possibly known to the reader. Bertram, who seems somehow to have been painted by Van Dyke, a somber and stately young man, blend of cavalier and puritan, with the physique of a military father and the views of an ethical mother and a soul of his own, which, for sheer simplicity, is something staggering. Burnett, with an oriental and inscrutable placidity, varied every now and then with dazzling agility and Meredithian humor. Waldo Davignor, who masks with complete fashionable triviality a Hebraic immutability of passion tried in a more ironical and bitter service than his father Jacob. Lawrence and Morris Solomon, who show another side of the same people, the love of home, the love of children, the meek and malicious humor, the tranquil service of the law. Salter, who shows how beautiful and ridiculous a combination can be made of the most elaborate mental cultivation and artistic sensibility, and an omniscience and a receptiveness and a humility extraordinary in any man. These were his friends. May he be forgiven for speaking of them at length and with pride. Someday we hope the reader may know them all. He knew these people. He knew their friends. He heard Mildred Wayne say blog, and he thought it was a funny name. He had been told that he would ever pronounce it with the accents of tears and passion he would have said in his pride. But the name was not suitable for that purpose. But there are book F. Emmett. He went for a time to an art school. There he met a great many curious people. Many of the men were horrible black guards. Not exactly that, so they naturally found each other interesting. He went through some rather appalling discoveries about human life, and the final discovery was that there is no devil. No, not even such a thing as a bad man. One pleasant Saturday afternoon, Lucian said to him, I'm going to take you to see the blogs. The what? said the unhappy man. The blogs, said the other, darkly. Naturally assuming that it was the name of a public house, he reluctantly followed his friend. He came to a small front garden. If it was a public house, it was not a business-like one. They raised the latch, they rang the bell, and if the bell was not in the close time just then, no flower in the pots winked, no brick grin, no sign in heaven or earth warned him. The birds sang on in the trees. He went in. The first time he spent an evening at the blogs, there was no one there. That is to say, there was a worn but fiery little lady in a gray dress who didn't approve of catastrophic solutions of social problems. That, he understood, was Mrs. Blog. There was a long, blonde, smiling young person who seemed to think him quite off his head, and who was addressed as Ethel. There were two people whose meaning and status he couldn't imagine, one of whom had a big nose and the other hadn't. Lastly, there was a Juno-like creature in a tremendous hat who eyed them all the time half wildly, like a shying horse, 
because he said he was quite happy. But the second time he went there, he was plumped down on a sofa beside a being of whom he had a vague impression that brown hair grew at intervals all down her like a caterpillar. Once in the course of conversation, she looked straight at him, and he said to himself as plainly as if he had read it in a book, If I had anything to do with this girl, I should go on my knees to her. If I spoke with her, she would never deceive me. If I depended on her, she would never deny me. If I loved her, she would never play with me. If I trusted her, she would never go back on me. If I remembered her, she would never forget me. I may never see her again. Goodbye. It was all said in a flash, but it was all said. Two years, as they say in the playbills, is supposed to elapse. And here is the subject of this memoir, sitting on a balcony above the sea. The time, evening. He is thinking of the whole bewildering record of which the foregoing is a brief outline. He sees how far he has gone wrong, and how idle and wasteful and wicked he has often been. How miserably unfitted he is for what he is called upon to be. Let him now declare it, and hereafter forever hold his peace. But there are four lamps of thanksgiving always before him. The first is for his creation out of the same earth with such a woman as you. The second is that he has not, with all his faults, gone after strange women. You cannot think how a man's self-restraint is rewarded in this. The third is that he has tried to love everything alive, a dim preparation for loving you. And the fourth is... No words can express that. Here ends my previous existence. Take it. It led me to you. Gilbert Keith Chesterton by Maisie Ward. Chapter 9. A Long Engagement. Gilbert sympathized with his future mother-in-law's anxiety at Francis' engagement to a self-opinionated scarecrow. But I doubt if it had all quickly occurred to him that the basis of that anxiety was the fact that he was earning only 25 shillings a week. Francis herself, and Shinolder Shaw, and the rest of his friends believed he was a genius with a great future, and this belief they tried to communicate to Francis' family. But even if they succeeded, faith in the future did not pay dividends in a present income on which to set up a house. A widow, considering her daughter's future, might well feel a little anxiety. But one can see wheels within wheels of family conclaves and matters to perplex the simple which drew another letter from Gilbert to Francis. It is a mystic and refreshing thought that I shall never understand blogs. That is the truth of it, that this remarkable family atmosphere, this temperament with its changing moods and its everlasting will, its divine trust in one's soul and its tremulous speculations as to one's future, its sensitiveness like a tempered sword vibrating but never broken, its patience that can wait for eternity and its impatience that cannot wait for tea, its power of bearing huge calamities, and its queer little moods that even those calamities can never overshadow or wipe out, its brusqueness that always pleases, and its overtactfulness that sometimes wounds, its terrific intensity of feeling that sometimes paralyzes the outsider with conversational responsibility, its untranslatable humor of courage and poverty, in its unfathomed epics of past tragedy and triumph. All this glorious confusion of family traits, which, in no exaggerative sense, make the Gentiles come to your light and the folk of the nations to the brightness of your house, is a thing so utterly outside my own temperament that I was formed by nature to admire and not understand it. God made me very simply, as he made a tree or a pig or an oyster to perform certain functions. The best thing he gave me was a perfect and unshakable trust in those I love. Gilbert's sympathy with his future mother-in-law may have been put to some slight strain by an incident related by Lucian Oldershaw. Mrs. Blog begged him to talk to Gilbert about his personal appearance, clothes and such matters, and to entreat him to make an effort to improve it. One can imagine how much he must have disliked the commission. Anyhow, he decided it would be better to do it away from home and he suggested to Gilbert a trip to the seaside. Arrived there, he broached the subject. Gilbert, he says, was not the least angry, but answered quite seriously that Francis loved him as he was, and that it would be absurd for him to try to alter. It was also out of the latter and deeper experience of women that he was able to write, man's friends like him, 
but they leave him as he is. The man's wife loves him and is always trying to change him. A good many things happened in the course of this long engagement. Francis and Gilbert were both young and long engagements were normal at that period, when the idea of a wife continuing to earn after marriage was unheard of. There were obvious disadvantages in the long delay before marriage, but also certain advantages. The two got to know each other with a close intimacy. They were comrades as well as lovers and carried both these relationships into married life. For the biography, the advantage has been immense since every separation between the pair meant a batch of letters. The discerning will have noted that there are in these letters considerable excisions, parts Francis would not show even to the biographer. But they are the richest quarry from which to dig for the most important period of any man's life, the period richest in mental development and the shaping of character. It is, too, the only period of his adult life when Gilbert wrote letters at all, unless they were absolutely unavoidable. Even in a small family, two members will tend to draw together more closely than the rest, and this was so with Frances and her sister Gertrude. They adored one another, and Frances offered her to Gilbert as a sister, with especially confident pride. He had never had a sister since babyhood, and he enjoyed it. The happiness of the engagement was terribly broken into by the sudden death of Gertrude in a street accident. Francis was absolutely shattered. The next group of letters belongs to the months after Gertrude's death, when Gilbert was still trying to be a publisher, but urged on by Francis, beginning also to be a writer. During part of this time, she had gone abroad for rest and recovery after the shock. Gilbert pictures her reading his letters under the shadow of an alien cathedral. None of these letters are dated, but most of them have kept their postmarks. 11 Paternoster Buildings, postmarked July 8, 1899. I am black but comely at this moment because the cyclo style has blackened me. Fear not, I shall wash myself, but I think it my duty to render an accurate account of my physical appearance every time I write, and shall be glad of any advice and assistance. I've been reading Lewis Carroll's remains, mostly logic, and have much pleasure in enlivening you with the following hilarious query. Can a hypothetical, whose protasis is false, be legitimate? Are two hypotheticals of the form, if A, then B, and if A, then not B, compatible? I should think a hypothetical could be, if it tried hard. To return to the cycle style. I like the cycle style ink. It is so inky. I do not think there is anyone who takes quite such a fierce pleasure in things being themselves as I do. The startling wetness of paper excites and intoxicates me. The fieriness of fire, the steeliness of steel, the unutterable muddiness of mud it is just the same with people. When we call a man manly or a woman womanly, we touch the deepest philosophy. I will not ask you to forgive this rambling levity. I, for one, have sworn, I do not hesitate to say it, by the sword of God that has struck us, and before the beautiful face of the dead, that the first joke that occurred to me I would make, and the first nonsense poem I thought of I would write, and that I would begin again at once with a heavy heart at times, as to other duties, to the duty of being perfectly silly, perfectly extravagant, perfectly trivial, and as far as possible, amusing. I have sworn that Gertrude should not feel, wherever she is, that the comedy has gone out of our theater. This, I am well aware, will be misunderstood. But I have long grasped that whatever we do, we are misunderstood. Small blame to other people, for we know ourselves. Our best motives are things we could do neither explain nor defend. And I would rather hurt those who could show than her who is silent. You might tell me what you feel about this, but I am myself absolutely convinced that gaiety, that is, the bubble of love, does not annoy me. The old round of stories, laughter, family ceremonies seems to me far less really inappropriate than a single moment of forced silence or unmanly shame. I have always imagined Frances did not know of her mother's efforts to tidy Gilbert, but very early in their engagement she began her own abortive attempts to make him brush his hair, tie his tie straight, and avoid made-up ones attend to the buttons on his coat and all the rest. It would seem that for a time, at any rate, he made some efforts, but evidently simply regarded the whole thing as one huge joke. 11 Warwick Gardens, postmarked July 9th, 1899. I am clean. I am wearing a frock coat, which from a superficial survey seems to have no end of buttons. It must be admitted 
and I'm wearing a bow tie. But on careful research, I find that these were constantly worn by Vikings. A distinct allusion to them is made in that fine fragment, the Trigriphasa Saga, where the poet says in the short, alliterative lines of early Norse poetry, Frock coat folding then, Hakon hard drada, bow tie buckle, wait for war. I resume my appearance, as I have suggested, in a singularly exemplary. My boots are placed, after the fastidious London fashion, on the feet. The laces are done up, the watch is going, the hair is brushed, the sleeve links are inserted, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. As for my straw hat, I put it on 18 times consecutively, taking a run and a jump to each try, till at last I hit the right angle. I have not taken it off for three days and nights, lest I should disturb that exquisite pose. Ladies, princes, queens, ecclesiastical processions go by in vain. I do not remove it. That angle of the hat is something to mount guard over. As Swinburne says, not twice on earth do the gods do this. It is at present what it is, I believe, called a lovely summer's night. To say that it is hot would be as feeble a platitude as the remark would be in the small talk of Satan and Beelzebub. If there were such a thing as blue hot iron, it would describe the sky tonight. I cannot help dreaming of some wild fairy tale in which the whole round cosmos should be a boiling pot with the flames of purgatory under it, and that soon I shall have the satisfaction of seeing such a thing as boiled mountains, boiled cities, and a boiled moon and stars. A tremendous picture. Yet, I am perfectly happy as usual. After all, why should we object to be boiled? Potatoes, for example, are better boiled than raw. Why should we fear to be boiled into new shapes in the cauldron? These things are an allegory. I am so glad to hear you say that, in your words, it is good for us to be here, where you are at present. The same remark, if I remember right, was made on the mountain of the Transfiguration. It has always been one of my unclerical sermons to myself that that remark which Peter made on seeing the vision of a single hour ought to be made by us all, contemplating every panoramic change in the long vision we call life. Other things superficially, but this always in our depths. It is good for us to be here. It is good for us to be here, repeating itself eternally. And if, after many joys and festivals and frivolities, it should be our fate to have to look on while one of us is in a most awful sense of the words, transfigured before our eyes, shining with the whiteness of death at least, I think we cannot easily fancy ourselves wishing not to be at our post. Not I, certainly. It was good for me to be there. 11 Warwick Gardens, postmarked July 11, 1898. The novel, after which you so kindly inquire, is proceeding headlong. I received another indirect stimulus today when Mr. Garnet insisted on taking me out to lunch, gave me a gorgeous repast at a restaurant, succeeded in plucking the secret of my private employment from my bosom, and made me promise to send him some chapters of it. I certainly cannot complain of not being sympathetically treated by the literary men I know. I wonder where the jealous, spiteful, depreciating man of letters we read of in books has got to. It's about time he turned up, I think. Excuse me for talking about these trivialities. I've made a discovery, or I should say, seen a vision. I saw it between two cups of black coffee in a Gaelic restaurant in Soho, but I could not express it if I tried. But this was one thing that it said, that all good things are one thing. There is no conflict between the gravestone of Gertrude and a comic opera tune played by Mildred Wayne. But there is everlasting conflict between the gravestone of Gertrude and the obscene pomposity of the hired mute. And there is everlasting conflict between the comic opera tune and any mean or vulgar words to which it may be set. These, which man hath joined together, God shall most surely sunder. That is what I am feeling, now every hour of the day. All good things are one thing. Sunsets, schools of philosophy, babies, constellations, cathedrals, operas, mountains, horses, poems, all these are merely disguises. One thing is always walking among us in fancy dress, in the gray cloak of the church or the green cloak of a meadow. He is always behind. His form makes the folds fall superbly, and that is what the savage old Hebrews, alone among the nations, guessed, 
and why their rude tribal god has been erected on the ruins of all polytheistic civilizations. For the Greeks and Norsemen and Romans saw the superficial wars of nature and made the sun one god and the sea another and the wind a third. They were not thrilled as some rude Israelite was, one night in the wastes alone by the sudden blazing idea of all being the same god, an idea worthy of a detective story. 11 Peter Noster Buildings, postmarked July 14, 1899. Costumes slightly improved. The truth is that a mystical and fantastic development has taken place. My clothes have rebelled against me. Weary of scorn and neglect, they have all suddenly come to life and they dress me by force every morning. My frock coat leaps upon me like a lion and hangs on, dragging me down. As I struggle, my boots trip me up and the laces climb up my feet never missing a hole like snakes or creepers. At the same moment, the celebrated gray tie springs at my throat like a wildcat. I'm told that the general effects produced by this remarkable psychical development are superb. Really, the clothes must know best. Still, it is awkward when a Macintosh pursues one down the street. There is nothing in God's earth that really expresses the bottom of the nature of a man in love, except Burns' songs. To the man not in love, they must seem inexplicably simple. When he says, my love is like the melody that's sweetly played in tune, it seems almost a crude way of referring to music. But a man in love with a woman feels a nerve move suddenly that Dante groped for and Shakespeare hardly touched. What made me think of Burns, however, was that one of his simple and sudden things, hitting the right nail so that it rings, occurs in the song of Oh Ah, the Arts, the Wind Can Blow where he merely says that there is nothing beautiful anywhere, but it makes him think of the woman. That is not really a mere aesthetic fancy, a chain of sentimental association. It is an actual instinctive elemental movement of the mind, performed automatically and instantly. Felix Stowe, Undated. I have, as you see, arrived here. I have done other daring things, such as having my hair shampooed, as you commanded, and also cut. The effect of this is so singularly horrible that I have found further existence in London impossible. Public opinion is too strong for me. There are many other reasons I could give for being pleased to come, such as that I have some time for writing the novel, that I can make up stories that don't intend to write, that there are phosphorescent colors on the sea and a box of cigarettes on the mantelpiece. Some fragments of what I felt about Gertrude's death have struggled out in the form of some verses which I am writing out for you. But the real strength, I don't like the word comfort, for real peace, no human words are much good except perhaps some of the unfathomable, unintelligible, uncomfortable epigrams of the Bible. I remember when Bentley had a burning boyish admiration for Professor Huxley, and when the scientist died, some foolish friend asked him to write flippantly in a letter what he felt about it. Bentley replied with a chapter and verse reference to one of the songs, Alone on a Postcard. The text was, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of his saints. The friend I remember thought it a curious remark about Huxley. It strikes me as a miraculous remark about anybody. It is one of those magic sayings where every word hits a chain of association, God knows how. Precious, we could not say that Gertrude's death is happy or providential, or sweet, or even perhaps good, but it is something. Beautiful is a good word, but precious is the only right word. It is this passionate sense of the value of things, of the richness of the cosmic treasure, the world where every star is a diamond, every leaf an emerald, every drop of blood a ruby. It is this sense of preciousness that is really awakened by the death of its saints. Somehow we feel that even their death is a thing of incalculable value and mysterious sweetness. It is awful, tragic, desolating, desperately hard to bear, but still precious. Forgive the verbosity of one whose trade it is to express the inexpressible. The verses he speaks of in this letter Francis treasured greatly. She showed them to me in a book which opens with a very touching prayer in her own writing. In a later chapter, I quote lines in which Gilbert writes of his own tone deafness and of how he saw what music meant as he watched his wife's face. Something of the same effect is produced on me by these verses. Gilbert was, of course, not tone deaf to this tragedy, yet it was chiefly in its effect on Francis that it affected him. The sudden sorrow smote my love. It often falls twixt kiss and kiss. 
and looking forth a while she said, and no man tell me where she is. And again, stricken they sat, and through them moved, my own dear lady, pale and sweet, the soul whose clearness makes afraid, our soul, this holy guiltless one. No cobweb doubts, no passion smoke, have veiled this mirror from thy son. In letters to Francis, he could enter so deeply into her grief as to make it his own. But when he wrote verse and spoke as if it were to himself or to God, the reflected emotion was not enough. These verses could never rank with the real poetry. It was not possible, in fact, for a man so happily in love to dwell lastingly on any sorrow. And I cannot avoid the feeling that, quite apart from any theory, cheerfulness was constantly breaking in, for Gilbert was a very happy man. Across the top of one of his letters is written, You can always tell the real love from the slight by the fact that the latter weakens at the moment of success. The former is quadrupled. The next of his letters is a mingling of the comic and the fantastic, very special to GKC. 11 Paternoster Buildings, postmark September 29, 1899. I fear, as you say, that my letters do not contain many practical details about myself. The letter is not very long to begin with, as I think it better to write something every day than a long letter when I have leisure. And when I have little time to think in, I always think of the cosmos first, and the ego afterwards. I admit, however, that you are not engaged to the cosmos, dear me. What a time the cosmos would have. All its comets would have their hair brushed every morning. The whirlwind would be adjured not to walk about when it was talking. The oceans would be warmed with hot water pipes. Not even the lowest forms of life would escape the crusade of tidiness. You would walk around and round the jellyfish looking for a place to put it in shirt links. Under these circumstances, then, I cannot but regard it as fortunate that you are only engaged to your obedient microcosm, a biped inheriting some of the traits of his mother, the cosmos, its untidiness, its largeness, its irritating imperfection, and its profound and hearty intention to go on existing as long as it possibly can. I can understand what you mean about wanting details about me, for I want just the same about you. You need only tell me, I went down the street to a pillar box, I shall know that you did it in a manner blindingly, staggeringly, crazily beautiful. It is quite true, as you say, that I am a person wearing certain clothes with a certain kind of hair. I cannot get rid of the impression that there is something scorchingly sarcastic about the underlying of this passage. As to what I do every day, it depends on which way you want it narrated. What we all say it is, or what it really is. What we all say happens every day is this. I wake up, dress myself, eat bacon and bread and coffee for breakfast. I walk up to High Street Station, take a four-penny ticket for Blackfriars, read the Chronicle in the train, arrive at 11 Paternoster Buildings, read a manuscript called The Lepers, like comedy reading, and another called The Preparation of Ryerson Embury. You know the style, till two o'clock. Go out to lunch, have, but here perhaps it would be safer to become big, come back, work till six, take my hat and walking stick and come home, have dinner at home, write the novel until 11, then write to you and go to bed. That is what we, in our dreamy, deluded way, really imagine is the thing that happens. But what really happens, the hist, are we observed, is as follows. Out of the starless night of the uncreated, it was before the stars, the soul begins to grope back to light. It gropes its way through strange half-lighted chambers of dreams, where in a brown and gold twilight it sees many things that are dimly significant, true stories twisted into new and amazing shapes, human beings whom it knew long ago, sitting at the windows by dark sunsets or talking in dim meadows. But the awful invading light grows stronger in the dreams till the soul in one last struggle plunges into a body as into a house and wakes up within it. Then he rises and finds himself in a wonderful vast world of white light and clear, frankly colored shapes, an inheritor of a million stars. On inquiry is formed that his name is Gilbert Keith Chesterton. This amuses him. He goes through a number of extraordinary and fantastic rituals, which the pompous elf land he has entered demands. The first is that he shall get inside a house of clothing, 
a tower of wool and flax, that he shall put on this foolish armor solemnly, one piece after another, and each in its right place. The things called sleeve links he attends to minutely. His hair he beats angrily with a bristly tool, for this is the law. Downstairs, a more monstrous ceremony attends him. He has to put things inside himself. He does so, being naturally polite. Nor can it be denied that a weird satisfaction follows. He takes a sword in his hand, for what may not be fallen in so strange a country, and goes forth. He finds a hole in the wall, a little cave wherein sits one who can give him the charm that rules the horse of water and fire. He finds an opening and descends into the bowels of the earth. Down among the roots of the eternal hills, he finds a sunless temple wherein he prays, and in the center of it he finds a lighted temple in which he enters. Then there are noises as of an earthquake and smoke and fire in the darkness, and when he opens the door again, he is in another temple, out of which he climbs into another world, leagues and leagues away. And when he asks the meaning of the vision, they talk gibberish and say, it is a dream. So the day goes, full of eerie publishers and elfin clerks, till he returns and again puts things inside him, and then sits down and makes men in his own head and writes down all that they said and did. And last of all comes the real life itself. For half an hour he writes words upon a scrap of paper, words that are not picked and chosen like those that he has used to parry the strange talk of the folk all day but words in which the soul's blood pours out, like the body's blood from a wound. He writes secretly this mad diary, all his passion and longing, all his queer religion, his dark and dreadful gratitude to God, his idle allegories, the tales that tell themselves in his head, the joy that comes on him sometimes, he cannot help it, at the sacred intoxication of existence, the million faults of idleness and recklessness, and the one virtue of the unconquered adoration of goodness, that dark virtue that every man has and hides deeper than all his vices. He writes all this down as he is writing it now. And he knows that he sticks it down and puts a stamp on it and drops it into the mouth of a little red goblin at the corner of the street. He knows that all this wild soliloquy will be poured into the soul of one wise and beautiful lady sitting far away beyond seas and rivers and cities under the shadow of an alien cathedral. This is not all so irrelevant as you may think. It was this line of feeling that taught me, an utter rationalist as far as dogma goes, the lesson of the entire spirituality of things, an opinion that nothing has ever shattered since. I can't express myself on the point, nobody can, but it is only the spirituality of things that we are sure of. That the eyes in your face are eyes I do not know. They may have other names and uses. I know that they are good or beautiful, or rather spiritual. I do not know on what principle the universe is run. I know or feel that it is good or spiritual. I do not know what Gertrude's death was. I know that it was beautiful, for I saw it. We do not feel that it is so beautiful now. Why? Because we do not see it now. What we see now is her absence, but her death is not her absence, but her presence somewhere else. That is, what we knew was beautiful, as long as we could see it. Do not be frightened, dearest, by the slow, inevitable laws of human nature. We shall climb back into the mountain of vision. We shall be able to use the word with the accent of Whitman, disembodied, triumphant, dead. In the notebook he was writing, There is a heart within a distant town who loves me more than treasure or renown. Think you it strange and wear it as a crown. It is not the marvel here that since the kiss and dizzy glories of that blinding bliss one grief has ever touched me after this we see gilbert in the next two letters more concerned about a grand dinner of the jdc than about his future fame and fortune in the second he mentions almost casually that he is leaving fisher unwin from now on he was to live by his pen 11 warwick gardens west Tuesday night, 3rd of October, 1899. Nothing very astonishing has happened yet, though many astonishing things will happen soon. The final perfection of humanity I expect shortly. The speaker for this week, the first of the new speakers, is coming out soon. It may contain something of mine 
though I cannot be quite sure. The rush of the Boers on Natal, strategically quite possibly successful, is anticipated by politicians. The rising of the sun tomorrow morning is predicted by astronomers. My father again is engaged in the crucial correspondence with Fisher Unwin. At least it has begun by TFU, stating his proposed terms. A rise of five. From October, another rise possible but undefined in January. 10% royalty for the Paris book and expenses for a fortnight in Paris. These, as I got my father to hardly agree, are vitiated to the bone in his terms by the absence of any assurance that I shall have to wipe Paris, for which I am really paid nothing outside the hours of work for which I am paid, 25. In short, the net result would be that instead of gaining more liberty to rise in the literary world, I should be selling the small liberty of rising that I have now for five more shillings. This my father is declining and asking for a better settlement. The diplomacy is worrying, yet I enjoy it. I feel like Mr. Chamberlain on the eve of war. I would stop with TFU for a hundred pounds a year, but not for less, which means I think that I shall not stop at all. But all these revolutions, literary, financial, and political, fade into insignificance compared with the one really tremendous event of this week. It will take place on Saturday next. The sun will stand still upon Leicester Square and the moon on the valley of Warder Street, where then will assemble the grand commemorative meeting of the Junior Debating Club. The secretary, Mr. L. R. F. Oldershaw, will select a restaurant, make arrangements, and issue the proclamations, or, to use the venerable old club phrase, the writs. When this gorgeous function is over, we must expect a colossal letter. Every one of the old brotherhood, scattered over many cities and callings, has hailed the invitation in his coming, with the exception of Bentley, who will send a sensational telegram from Paris. The fun is expected to be fast and furious. The undercurrent of emotion, 12 years old, is not likely to be much disguised. As I say, I will write you a sumptuous description of it. It is somewhat your due, for the thing is, and always will be, one of the main strands of my life. None can say what will occur, it is one of those occasions when Englishmen are not much more like the pictures of them in the continental satires. There is more in this old affair of ours than possibly meets the eye. It is a thing that has left its roots deep in the hearts of twelve strangely different men. And now that seven of us have found the new life that can only be found in woman, it would mean indeed not to turn back and thank the old. 11 Warwick Gardens West This is the Colossal Letter. I trust you will excuse me if the paper is conceived on a similar scale of Babylonian immensity. I cannot make out exactly whether I did or did not post the letter I wrote to you on Saturday. If I did not, I apologize for missing the day. If I did, you will know by this time one or two facts that may interest you, the chief of which is that I am certainly leaving Fisher Unwin with much mutual courtesy and goodwill. This fact may interest you. I repeat, at this moment I am not sure whether it interests me. For my head, to say nothing of another organ, is filled with the thundering cheers and songs of the dinner on Saturday night. It was, I may say, without hesitation, a breathless success. Chalmelli, who must be experienced being both a schoolmaster, a diner out, and a clever man, told me he had never in his life heard 11 better speeches. I quite agree with him, merely adding his own. Everyone was amusing, and what is much better, singularly characteristic. Will you forgive me, dearest, if I reel off to the only soul that can be trusted to enjoy my enjoyment, a kind of report of the meeting? I will revivify my own memories. One thing at least that I said in my speech I thoroughly believed in. If there is any prayer I should be inclined to make, it is that I should forget nothing in my life. The proceedings opened with dinner. The illustrated menus were wildly appreciated. Every person got all the rest to sign on the menu and then took it away as a memento. Then the telegrams from Kruger, Chamberlain, Dreyfus, and George Meredith were read. Then I proposed the toast of the Queen. I merely said that nothing could ever be alleged against the Queen except the fact that she is not a member of the JDC, and that I thought it spoke well for the chivalry of Englishmen that, with this fact, she had never been publicly taunted. I said I knew that the virtues of Queen Victoria had become somewhat platitudinous, but I thought it was a fortunate country in which the virtues of its powerful ones are platitudes. The toast was then drunk. After a pause and a little conversation, I called upon Lawrence Solomon to propose the toast of the school. He was very amusing indeed. 
Most of his speech would not be very comprehensible to an outsider, for it largely consisted of an ingenious dovetailing of the sentences in the Latin and Greek Arnold. I shall never forget the lucid and precise enunciation with which he delivered the idiotic sentences in those works, more especially where he said, such a course would be more agreeable to Mr. Chalmelly, and I would rather gratify such a man as he than see the king of the Persians. Chalmelly, amid roars of welcome, rose to respond. I think I must have told you in a former letter that Chomeli is a former classmaster of ours, a former housemaster of Bentley's, and one of the nicest men at St. Paul's. We invited him as the only visitor. He said a great deal that was very amusing, mostly a commentary on Solomon's remarks about the Latin Arnold. One remark he made was that he possessed one particular Latin Arnold, formerly the property of the president, which he had withdrawn from him with every expression of contumely, because it was drawn all over with devils. He made some very sound remarks about the club as an answer to the common charge against St. Paul's school that it was aridly scholastic without spontaneous growth in culture or sentiment. Then Fordham proposed the ladies. He was killing. Fordham is a personality whom I think you do not know. He was one of the most profoundly humorous men I ever knew. But his humor is more thickly coated on him, so to speak, than Bentley or Oldershaw. For example, it is much more difficult to make him serious. He is one of the most fascinating typical Englishmen I ever knew, strong, generous, flippant on principle, rowdy by physical inspiration, successful, popular, married, a man to discharge all the normal functions of life well. But his most entertaining gift, which he displayed truly sumptuously on this occasion, is a wonderful gift of burlesque and stereotyped rhetoric. With melodramatic gestures, he drew attention to the torrents of the president's blood pouring from the wound of the tiny god. Amid sympathetic demonstration, he protested against the pathos of the toast, the conquered on the field of battle toasting the conquerors. As the only married member of the club, he ventured to give us some advice on A, food, B, education, C, intercourse. He sat down in a pure whirlwind of folly without saying a word about the feeling that were in all hearts, including his own, just then. But I was delighted to find that marriage had not taken away an inch of his incurable silliness. Nothing could be a greater contrast than the few graceful and dignified but very restrained words in which Bertram responded to the toast. He is not a man who cares to make fun of women, however genially. Then came Langdon Davies, whom I called upon to propose the club. His was perhaps the most interesting case of all. When I knew Langdon Davies in the junior debating club, he was one of the most frivolous young men I ever knew. But knowing that he was a good speaker in a light style and had been president of the Cambridge Union, I put him down to propose the club, thinking that we should have enough serious speaking and would be well to err on the side of entertainment. Langdon Davies got up and proceeded to deliver a speech that made me jump. It was, I thought, the best speech of the evening, but I am sure it was the most serious, the most sympathetic, and a long way from the most frankly emotional. He said that the club was not now a club in the strict sense. It was two things, preeminently and everlastingly, a memory and an influence. He spoke with a singular sort of subdued vividness of the influence the club had had on him in boyhood. He then turned to the history of the club. And here, my dearest lady, I'm pained to have to report that he launched suddenly and dramatically into a most extraordinary and apparently quite sincere eulogium upon myself and the influence I had on my schoolfellows. I will not repeat his words. I did not believe them, but they took me by surprise and shook me somewhat. Mr. B. N. Langdon Davies, I may remark, and yourself are the only persons who have ever employed the word genius in connection with me. I trust it will not occur again. I replied, my speech was a medley, but it appeared very successful. I discussed largely the absence of any successor to the JDC. I described how I watched the boys leaving school today, a solitary figure clad in the latest fashion, moodily pacing the Hammersmith Road, and asked myself, where among these is the girlish gush of Bentley, the passionate volubility of a Vernier, and the half-ethereal shyness of Fordham? I admitted that we had had misfortunes. One of us had a serious illness. Another had had a very good story in the Strand magazine. But I thought that the debating club of 12 members that had given three presidents to the university unions had not done badly. The rest was sentimental. Then began a most extraordinary game of battle door and shuttlecock. Burnett, 
proposed the secretary, Mr. Oldershaw. Mr. Oldershaw, instead of replying properly, proposed Mr. Bentley and the absent members. Waldo responded for these, or rather, instead of responding, proposed Mr. Morris Solomon. Mr. Morris Solomon, instead of responding, proposed Mr. Salter. The latter was the only one who had not spoken in on rising and explained his reasons for refusing. He had not been in the same room with Mr. Chumley, he said, since he had sat five years ago in the lower fourth, and Mr. Chumley had told him that he talked too much. He had no desire on his first reappearance to create in Mr. Chumley's mind the idea that he had been at it ever since. After this, we passed on to singing and nearly brought down the roof of Pinoli's restaurant. Chumley, the awful being whose classic taste in Greek iambics had once stood in awe, sang with great feeling a fragment of lyric literature of which the following was as far as I remember the refrain. Singing Chiral E, Chirali Tididi, also Chirali Chirali Te, enchanting Chirali Chirali Dididi, not forgetting Chirali Chirali Te. Bernard sang a Sussex pothouse chorus in an indolent and refined way, which was exquisitely incongruous. Waldo and Langdon Davies also sang. I recited an ode which I had written for the occasion, and Lucian recited one of Bentley's poems that came out in an Oxford magazine. Then we sang the anthem of the JDC, of which the words are, I am a member, I am a member, member of the JDC. I belong to it forever. Don't you wish that you were me? It was sung to the tune of Clementine. Then we paid the bill. Then we borrowed each other's arms and legs in an inextricable tangle and sang Old Lang Syne. Then we broke up. There now, five mortal pages of writing and nothing about you in it. How relieved you must be, wearied out with allusions to your hair and your soul and your clothes and your eyes, and yet it has been, every word of it, about you really. I like to make my past vivid to you, especially this past, not only because it was, on the whole, a fine, healthy, foolish, manly, enthusiastic, idiotic past, with a very soul of youth in it, not only because I am a victim of a prejudice common, I trust to all mankind, that no one ever had such friends as I had. Readers of the autobiography will remember that many, many years later, at the celebration of the Lair Bullock's 60th birthday, the guests threw the ball to one another in just this same fashion. Chesterton had by then so far forgotten this earlier occasion that he spoke of the Bellock birthday party as the only dinner in his life at which he had made a speech. Two more extracts from his letters must be given, showing the efforts made by Francis to look after Gilbert and his reactions. One of his friends remarked that Gilbert's life was unique in that, never having left home for a boarding school or university, he passed from the care of his mother to the care of his wife. I think, too, that the degree of his physical helplessness affected all who came near him, to the feeling that while he might lead them where he would intellectually, it was their task to look after a body that would otherwise be wholly neglected. The old religionists used to talk about a man being a fool for Christ's sake. Certainly, I have been a blithering fool for your sake. I went to see the doctor as you requested. He asked me what he could do for me. I told him I hadn't the least idea, but people thought my cold had been going on long enough. He said, I have no doubt it has. He then, to afford some relief to the idiotic futility of the situation, wrote me a prescription, which I read on my way up to business, weeping over the pathetic parts and laughing heartily at the funny ones. I have since had some of it. It tastes pretty aimless. I cannot remember for certain whether I mentioned in my letter that I had had an invitation, including yourself, from my Aunt Kate for this Friday. As you do not refer to it, I expect I didn't. So I wrote to her, giving both our thanks and explaining the state of affairs. All is over, I said, between that lady and myself. Do not name her to me, lest the hideous word woman should blind me to the seraphic word aunt. My life is a howling waste. But what matter? Ha ha ha. I cannot remember my exact words, of course. I am a revolting object. My hair is a matted chaos spread all over the floor. My beard is like a hard broom. My necktie is on the wrong way up. My bootlaces trail halfway down Fleet Street. Why not? When one's attempts at reformation are not much believed in, what other course is open but a contemptuous relapse into liberty? Your last letter makes me much happier. I put great faith in the healing power of the great winds and the sun. Nature, as Walt Whitman says, and her primal sanities. Mrs. S. also is a primal sanity. 
It is not, I believe, considered complimentary in a common way to approach an attractive lady and say pleasantly, you are thousands of years old, or you seem to me as old as the mountains. Therefore, I do not say it, but I always feel that anyone beautiful and strong is really old, for the really old things are not decrepit. Decrepit things are dying early. The Roman Empire was decrepit. A sunrise cloud is old. So, I think there are some people who, even in their youth, seem to have existed always. They bear the mark of the elemental things, the things that recur. They are as old as springtime, as old as daybreak, as old as youth. Recording by Candace Tuttle. Gilbert Keith Chesterton by Maisie Ward. Chapter 10, Part 1. Who is GKC? The Boer War, and the whole country enthusiastically behind it. The Liberal Party, as a whole, went with the Conservatives. The leading Fabians, Bernard Shaw, Mr. and Mrs. Sidney Webb, Hubert Bland, Cecil Chesterton, and the semi-detached Fabian H.G. Wells, were likewise for the war. Only a tiny minority remained in opposition, most of whom were pacifists or cranks of one kind or another. To the same minority of this minority, Gilbert found himself belonging. It is something of a tribute to the national feeling at such a moment of tension that, as an American has noted, Chesterton was the one British writer, utterly unknown before, who built up a great reputation, and it was gained not through nationalistic support, but through determined and persistent opposition to British policy. In his daily news column, a correspondent later asked him to define his position. Chesterton replied, The unreasonable patriot is one who sees the faults of his fatherland with an eye which is clearer and more merciless than any eye of hatred, the eye of an irrational and irrevocable love. His attitude sprang, he claimed, not from defect, but from excess of patriotism. It is hard to imagine anything that would clarify better the ideas of a strong mind than finding itself in opposition. This opposition began at home, in argument with Cecil. Later, the two brothers would agree about most main issues, but now Cecil was a Tory Democrat, Gilbert a pro-Boer, and what was known as a Little Englander. The tie between the two brothers was very close, as the innocent child developed into the combative companion, there is no doubt that he proportionately affected Gilbert. All their friends talk of the endless, amicable arguments through which both grew. Conrad Knoll remembers parties at Warwick Gardens during the Boer War, at which the two brothers would walk up and down like the two pistons of an engine, to the disorganization of the company and the dismay of their parents. It was at this time that Francis, engaged to a deeply devoted Gilbert, found even that devotion insufficient to pry him and Cecil apart when an argument had got well underway. I must go home, Gilbert. I shall miss my train. Usually he would have sprung to accompany her, but now she must miss many trains before the brothers could be separated. Francis told me that when they were at the seaside, the landlady would sometimes clear away breakfast leaving the brothers arguing, come to set lunch, and later set dinner, while still they argued. They had come to the seaside, but never saw the sea. Once Frances was staying with them at a house they had taken by the sea. Her room was next to Cecil's, and she could not sleep for the noise of the discussion that went on hour after hour. About one in the morning, she rapped on the wall and said, Oh, Cecil, do send Gilbert to bed. A brief silence followed, and then the remark, in a rather abashed voice, There's no one here. Cecil had been arguing with himself. Gilbert, too, argued with himself, for the stand he was taking was a hard one. Mr. Bellock has told me that he felt Gilbert suffered at any word against England, that his patriotism was passionate. And now he had himself to say that he believed his country to be in the wrong, to admit it to himself to state it to others. This autumn of 1899, G.K. began to write for the speaker. The weekly of this title had long been in a languishing condition 
when it was taken over by a group of young liberals of very marked views. Hammond became editor, and Philip Coman's Carr sub-editor. Sir John Simon was among the group for a short while, but he soon told one of them that he feared close association with the speaker might injure his career. F.Y. Eccles was in charge of the review department. He is able to date the start of what was known as the new speaker with great exactitude, for when the first number was going to press, the ultimatum had been sent to Kruger, and the editors hesitated as to whether they should take the risk of announcing that it was war in South Africa. They decided against it, but before their second number appeared, war had been declared. My difficulty in getting a picture of the first meeting of Bellock and Chesterton illustrates the problem of human testimony and the limits of that problem. For I imagine a scripture critic, old style, would end by concluding that the men never met at all. F.Y. Eccles, E.C. Bentley, and Lucian Oldershaw all claim to have made the momentous introduction. Mr. Eccles adding that it took place at the office of the speaker, while Gilbert himself has described the meeting twice, once in the street, once in a restaurant. Bellock remembers the introduction as made in the year 1900 by Lucian Oldershaw, who was living at the time with Hammond. Mr. Oldershaw usually has the accuracy of the hero worshipper, and upon this matter he adds several amusing details. For some time he had been trying to get the group on the speaker to read Chesterton, and had in vain taken several articles to the office. Mr. Eccles declared the handwriting was that of a Jew, and he prejudiced Bellock, says Oldershaw, against reading anything written by my Jew friend. But when at last they did meet, Bellock opened the conversation by saying in his most pontifical manner, Chesterton, you write very well. Chesterton was then 26, Bellock four years older. It was at Mont Blanc, a restaurant in Girard Street, Soho, and the meeting was celebrated with a bottle of Moulin Avant. The first description given by Gilbert himself is at once earlier and more vivid than the better known one in the autobiography. When I first met Bellock, he remarked to the friend who introduced us that he was in low spirits. His low spirits were, and are, much more uproarious and enlivening than anybody else's high spirits. He talked into the night, and left behind in it a glowing track of good things. When I have said that, I mean things that are good, and certainly not merely bon mot. I have said all that can be said in the most serious aspect about the man who has made the greatest fight for good things of all the men of my time. We met between a little Soho paper shop and a little Soho restaurant. His arms and pockets were stuffed with French nationalist and French atheist newspapers. He wore a straw hat shading his eyes, which are like a sailor's, and emphasizing his Napoleonic chin. The little restaurant to which we went had already become a haunt for three or four of us who held strong but unfashionable views about the South African War which was then in its earliest prestige. Most of us were writing on the speaker. What he brought into our dream was this Roman appetite for reality and for reason and action. And when he came into the door, there entered with him the smell of danger. It was from that dingy little Soho cafe, Chesterton writes in the autobiography, that there emerged the quadruped, the twi-formed monster Mr. Shaw has nicknamed the Chester Bellock. Listening to Bellock is intoxicating. I have heard many brilliant talkers, but none to whom that word can so justly be applied. He goes to your head. He takes you off your feet. He leaves you breathless. He can convince you of anything. My mother and brother both counted it as one of the great experiences of their lives to have dined with Bellock in a small Paris restaurant, En Vaudan de Bourgogne and then to have walked with him the streets of that glorious city while he discoursed of its past. Imagination staggers before the picture of a Belloc in his full youth and vigor, in a group fitted to strike from him his brightest fire at a moment big with issues for the world's future. In Chesterton's autobiography, a chapter is devoted to the portrait of a friend, 
while Belloc, in turn, has something of Chesterton in obituary notices and also in a brief study of his position in English literature. None of these documents give much notion of the intellectual flame struck out by one mind against the other. It has often been asked how much Belloc influenced Chesterton. The best test of an influence in a writer's life is to compare what he wrote before with what he wrote after he was first subjected to it. It is easy to apply this test to Belloc's influence on GKC because of the mass we still have of his boyhood writings. In pure literature, in philosophy and theology, he remains untouched by the faintest change. Pages from the notebook could be woven into orthodoxy, essays from the debater introduced into the Victorian age in literature, and it would look simply like buds and flowers on the same bush. Belloc has characterized himself as ignorant of English literature and says he learned from Chesterton most of what he knows of it. While there is no doubt Chesterton was by far the greater philosopher. With politics, sociology, and history, and the relation of religion to all three, it is different. Belloc himself told me he thought the chief thing he had done for Chesterton when they first met was to open his eyes to reality. Chesterton had been unusually young for his 26 years, and unusually simple in regard to the political scene. He was, in fact, the young man he himself was later to describe as knowing all about politics and nothing about politicians. The four years between the two men seemed greater than it was, partly because of Belloc's more varied experience of life, French military training, life at Oxford, wide travel, and an early marriage. Belloc then could teach Chesterton a certain realism about politics which meant a certain cynicism about politicians. Far more valuable, however, was what Belloc had to give him in sociology. We have seen that G.K. was already dissatisfied with socialism before he met Belloc. It may be that by his consideration of the nature of man, he would later have reached the positions so individually set out in what's wrong with the world. But this can only remain a theoretical question. For Belloc did actually, at this date, answer the sociological question that Chesterton, at this date, was putting. Answered it brilliantly, and answered it truly. Every test that G.K. could later apply, of profound human reality, of truth divinely revealed, convinced him that the answer was true. He had, he has told us, been a socialist, because it was so horrible not to be one but he now learned of the historical Christian alternative, equally opposed to socialism and to capitalism, well-distributed property. This had worked in the past, was still working in many European countries, could be made to work again in England. The present trend appeared to Belloc to be toward the servile state, and in the book with this title, and a second book, The Restoration of Property, he later developed his sociology. After this meeting, two powerful and very different minds would reciprocally influence one another. An admirer of both told me that he thought Chesterton got the idea of small property from Belloc, but gave Belloc a fuller realization of the position of the family. One difference between them is that Belloc writes sociology as a textbook, while Chesterton writes it as a human document. All the wealth of imagination that Belloc pours into the path to Rome, or the four men, he sternly excludes from the servile state. The poet, traveler, essayist is one man, the sociologist another. The third field of influence was history. Here, Belloc did Chesterton two great services. He restored the proportion of English history, and he put England back into its context. Since the Reformation, English history had been written with all the stress of the Protestant period. Lingard had written earlier, but had not been popularized, and certainly would not be used at St. Paul's School. And even Lingard had laid little stress on the social effects of the Reformation. Mr. Hammond's contemporary work on English social history fitted into Belloc's more vivid, if less documented, vision. None of this could be disregarded by later writers. 
Belloc too restored that earlier England to the Christendom to which it belonged. The England of Macaulay, or of Green, had, like Mr. Mantellini's dowager, either no outline or a demmed outline, for it was cut out of a larger map, and Chesterton was always seeking an outline of history. To get England back into the context of Christendom is a great thing. Just how great must depend upon how rightly Christendom is conceived. One cannot always escape the feeling that Belloc conceives it too narrowly. His famous phrase, the faith is Europe, and Europe is the faith, omits too much. The East, out of which Christianity came, the new world, into which Europe has flowed. Belloc, of course, knows these things, and has often said them. It is rather a question of emphasis, of how things loom in the mind when judgments have to be made. In that sense, he does tend to narrow the faith to Europe. In exactly the same sense, he does tend to narrow Europe to France. Born in France of a French father, educated in England, Belloc chose his mother's nationality, chose to be English. But his creator had chosen differently, and there is not much a man can do in competition with his creator. I do not for a moment suggest that Belloc, having chosen to be English, is conscious of anything but loyalty to the country of his adoption. The thing lies far below the mind's conscious movements. Belloc thinks of himself as an Englishman, with a patriotic duty to criticize his country. But his feelings are not really those of an Englishman. Once, at least, he recognized this, when he wrote the verse, England to me that never have malingered, nor spoken falsely, nor your flattery used, nor even in my rightful garden lingered. What have you not refused? And just as France was Belloc's rightful garden, so England was Chesterton's. When first they talked of the church, he told Belloc that he wanted the example of someone entirely English who should nonetheless have come in. When criticizing his country, his voice has the note of pain that only love can give. Belloc saw him as intensely national, English of the English, a mirror of England. He writes with an English accent. It is of some interest that after meeting Belloc, Gilbert added notes to two early poems, each note reflecting a judgment of Belloc's. On the Dreyfus case, which Belloc saw as all French Catholics saw it, on Anglo-American relations, which Belloc saw as most Latin Europeans would see it. The first was the poem entitled, To a Certain Nation, addressed to France in commentary on the Dreyfus case of 1899 which must be briefly explained for those who are too young to remember the excitement it caused. Captain Dreyfus, a Jewish officer in the French army, had been found guilty of treachery and sent to Devil's Island. All France was divided into two camps on the question of his guilt or innocence. In general, Catholics, and what we should call the right, were for his guilt. Atheists, anti-clericals, and believers in the Republic were for his innocence. Passions were roused to fury on both sides. English opinion was almost entirely for his innocence. I was a small girl at the time, and I remember that my brother and I amused ourselves by crying, Viva Dreyfus! on all possible and impossible occasions, for the annoyance of our pious French governess. I remember also that our parents were startled by the vehemence of the French Catholic paper La Croix, from which our governess imbibed her views. Ultimately, the case was reopened, and Dreyfus, after years of horror on Devil's Island, found not guilty and restored to his rank in the army. But there are, I know, Catholic Frenchmen alive today who refuse to believe in his innocence and hold that the whole thing was a Jewish Masonic plot that hampered the French espionage service and nearly lost us the war of 1914. In the first edition of The Wild Night, written before the meeting with Belloc, Gilbert, like any other English liberal, had assumed Dreyfus's innocence, and in the poem To a Certain Nation, had reproached the France of the Revolution, the France he had loved, as unworthy of herself. And we who knew thee once, we have a right to weep. 
The note in the second edition shows him as now undecided about Dreyfus's guilt and concludes, there may have been a fog of injustice in the French courts. I know that there was a fog of injustice in the English newspapers. In an alliance, Chesterton had gloried in the blood of Hengist and hymned an Anglo-American alliance with the enthusiasm of a young Republican who took for granted the links of language and of origin that might draw together two great countries into something significant. In change, eclipse and peril, under the whole world scorn, by blood and death and darkness, the Saxon peace is sworn. But all our fruit be gathered, and all our race take hands, and the sea be a Saxon river that runs through Saxon lands. But in the note to the second edition, he says, In the matter of the Anglo-American alliance, I have come to see that our hopes of brotherhood with America are the same in kind as our hopes of brotherhood with any other of the great independent nations of Christendom. And a very small study of history was sufficient to show me that the American nation, which is a hundred years old, is at least fifty years older than the Anglo-Saxon race. The poem was, of course, only a boyish expression of a boyish dream. Like all dreams, like all boyhood dreams especially, it omitted too much. Yet it contained a thought that might well have borne rich fruit in Gilbert's Catholic life. My mother told me once that when after three years' study of Queen Elizabeth's character, she came to a different conclusion from Bellet, she found it almost impossible to resist his power and hold on to her own view. It must be realized that Chesterton actually preferred the attitude of a disciple. A mutual friend has told me that Chesterton listened to Belloc all the time and said very little himself. In matters historical, where he felt his own ignorance, Gilbert's tendency was simply to make an act of faith in Belloc. On nothing were the two men more healthily in accord than on the Boer War. In an interesting study of Belloc, prefixed to a French translation of contemporary England, F.Y. Eccles explains how he and most of the speaker group differed from the pacifist pro-Boers, who hated the South African War because they hated all wars. The young liberals on the speaker were not pacifists. They hated the war because they thought it would harm England, harm her morally, to be fighting for an unjust cause and even materially to be shedding the blood of her sons and pouring out her wealth at the bidding of a handful of alien financiers. Thus far, Gilbert was among one group with whom he was in fullest sympathy, but I think he went further. Mr. Eccles told me that most of the speaker group had no sympathy with the Boers. Gilbert had. He thought of them as human beings who might well have been farmers of Sussex or of Kent something of an older civilization, resisting money power and imperialism, and perishing thereby. Few indeed of the Liberal Party held Chesterton's ideal, and England, territorially small, spiritually great. The speaker was struggling against odds. It was the voice of a tiny group. To Gilbert, it seemed that this mattered nothing, so long as that little group held to their great ideas so long as the paper represented not merely a group or a party, but the liberal idea. In an unfinished letter to Hammond is to be found this idea, as he saw it, and his dawning disappointment, even with the paper that most nearly stood for it. I am just about to commit a serious impertinence. I believe, however, that you will excuse it, because it is about the paper, and I know that there is not another paper, dead or alive, for which I would take the trouble or run the risk of offense. I am hearing on all sides the speaker complained of by the very people who should be, and would be, if they could, its enthusiastic supporters. And I cannot altogether deny the truth of their objections, though I am glad to notice both in them and in myself the fact that those objections are tacitly based on the assumption of the speaker having an aim and standard higher than other papers. If the speaker were a mere party rag like Judy or the Times, it would be only remarkable for moderation. But to us who have built hopes on it as the pioneer of a younger and larger political spirit, 
It is difficult to be silent when we find it, as it seems to us, poisoned with that spirit of ferocious triviality, which is the spirit of Birmingham eloquence, and with that evil instinct which has disintegrated the Irish party, the instinct for hating the man who differs from you slightly more than the man who differs from you altogether. Of two successive numbers during the stress of the fight, a fight in which we had first to unite our army and then to use it, a considerable portion was devoted, first to sneering at the Daily News, and then to sneering at the Westminster Gazette. There is a sentence in the Book of Proverbs which expresses the whole of my politics. For the liberal man deviseth liberal things, and by his liberality he shall stand. Now what I object to is sneering at the Westminster as a supporter of Chamberlain when everyone knows that it hardly lets a day pass without an ugly caricature of him. What I object to in this is that it is talking brumudgeon. It is not devising liberal things, but spiteful, superficial, illiberal things. It is claptrap and temporary deception of the patriotism before politics order. To all this, you will say there is an obvious answer. The speaker is a party paper and does not profess to be otherwise. But here, I am sure we are mistaking our mission. What the speaker is, I hope and believe, destined to do is to renovate liberalism. And though liberalism, like every other party, is often conducted by claptrap, it has never been renovated by claptrap, but by great command of temper and the persistent exposition of persuasive and unanswerable truths. It is while we are in the desert that we have the vision. We being a minority must be all philosophers. We must think for both parties in the state. It is no good our devoting ourselves to the flowers of mob oratory with no mob to address them to. We must, like the free traders, for instance, have discoveries, definite truths, and endless patience in explaining them. We must be more than a political party, or we shall cease to be one. Time and again in history, victory has come to a little party with big ideas. But can anyone conceive anything with the mark of death more on its brow than a little party with little ideas? Such liberalism was not perhaps of this world. It certainly was not of the liberal party. Gilbert argued much with himself during these years. He had come out of his time of trial with firm faith in God and in man. But his philosophy was still in the making, and he made it largely out of the material supplied by ordinary London suburban society and by the rather less than usual society of cranks and enthusiasts, so plentiful at the end of the 19th century. He has written in the autobiography of the artistic and dilettante groups where everyone discussed religion and no one practiced it, of the Christian socialists and other societies into which he and Cecil found their way, and some of the friendships they formed. Among these, one of the closest was with Conrad Noll, who wrote an answer to my request for his recollections. We met GKC for the first time at the Stapleys in Bloomsbury Square, at a series of meetings of the Christotheosophic Society. He was like a very big fish out of water. He was comparatively thin, however, in those days, nearly 40 years ago. We had been much intrigued by the weekly contribution of an unknown writer to the speaker and the nation. Brilliant work, and my wife and I, independently, came to the conclusion when we heard this young man speak that it must be he. The style was unmistakable. I thought of writing him to congratulate him on his speech, but before I could do so, I got a letter from him saying that he was coming to hear me in the same series in a week or so. It was thus we first became acquainted, and the acquaintance ripened into a warm friendship with both of us. He and his brother Cecil were in and out of our flat in Paddington Green, where I was assistant curate. He was genial, bubbling over with jokes, at which he roared with laughter. The question was becoming insistent. When would there be enough money for Francis and Gilbert to get married? In one letter, Francis asks him what he thinks of Omar Khayyam. He replies at great length and concludes, 
You see the result of asking me for an opinion. I have written it very hurriedly. If I had paused, I might make an essay of it. Commercial pig. Never mind, sweetheart. That essay might be a saucepan someday. Or at any rate, a cheap toast rack. Gilbert Keith Chesterton by Macy Ward Chapter 10, Part 2 Of his belief in God, in man, in goodness, as against the pessimist outlook of his day, Gilbert, as we have seen, felt profound certitude. That his outlook was one that held him back from many fields of opportunity, he was already partly conscious. A fragment of a letter to Francis expresses this feeling. I find I cannot possibly come tonight, as my Canadian uncle keeps his last night in England in a sort of family party, and I abide in my father's house, said Our Lady of the Snows. I have just had a note from Rex, asking me with characteristic precision if I can produce a play in the style of Maeterlinck by 6.50 this afternoon, or words to that effect. The idea is full of humor. He remarks as a matter of fact that there is just a remote chance of his getting the stage society to act my play of the wild night. This opens to me a vista of quite new ambition. Why only at the stage society? I see a visionary program. The Wild Knight, Mr. Charles Hawtree, Captain Redfeather, Mr. Penley, Olive, Miss Katie Seymour, Priest, Sir Henry Irving, Lord Orme, Mr. Arthur Roberts. I am working and must get on with my work. I do not feel any despondency about it, because I know it is good and worth doing. It is extraordinary how much more moral one is than one imagines. At school, I never minded getting into a row if it were really not my fault. Similarly, I have never cared a rap for rejections or criticisms, since I had got a point of view to express which I was certain held water. Some people think it holds water, on the brain, but I don't mind. Bless them. I am afraid, darling, that this doctrine of patience is hard on you. But really, it's a grand thing to think oneself right. It's what this whole age is starving for, something to suffer for and go mad and miserable over. That is the only luxury of the mind. I wish I were a convinced pro boer and could stare down a howling mob, but I am right about the cosmos, and Schopenhauer and company are wrong. Two interesting points in this letter are the remark about wishing to be a convinced pro boer which he certainly became, and the suggestion of a possible performance of the Wild Knight. Perhaps the letter was written before he had finally taken his stand. It has no dating postmark. Or perhaps it merely means that his convictions on the cosmos are more absolute than on the war. As to the Wild Knight, it was never acted, and its publication was made possible only by the generosity of Gilbert's father. For a volume of comic verse, Greybeards at Play, which appeared earlier in the same year, 1900, he could find a publisher, but serious poetry has never been easy to launch. The letter that follows has more immediate bearing on their own future. 11 Warwick Gardens, Good Friday, 1900. As you have tabulated your questions with such alarming precision, I must really endeavor to answer them categorically. 1. How am I? I am in excellent health. I have an opaque cold in my head, cough tempestuously, and am very deaf. But these things I count as mere specks showing up the general blaze of salubrity. I am getting steadily better, and I don't mind how slowly. As for my spirits, a cold never affects them, for I have plenty to do and think about indoors. One or two little literary schemes, trifles doubtless, claim my attention. 2. Am I going away at Easter? The sarcastic might think it a characteristic answer but I can only reply that I had banished the matter from my mind, a vague problem of the remote future, until you asked it. But since this is Easter, and we are not gone away, I suppose we are not going away. 3. I will meet you at Euston on Tuesday evening, 
though hell itself should gape and bid me stop at home. 4. I am not sure whether a review on Crivelli's art is out this week. I am going to look. 5. Alas, I have not been to Nut. There are good excuses, but they are not the real ones. I will write to him now. Yes. Now. 6. Does my hair want cutting? My hair seems pretty happy. You are the only person who seems to have any fixed theory on this. For all I know, it may be at that fugitive perfection which has moved you to enthusiasm. Three minutes after this perfection, I understand, a horrible degeneration sets in. The hair becomes too long, the figure disreputable and profligate, and the individual is unrecognized by all his friends. It is he that wants cutting, then, not his hair. 7. As to shirt links, studs, and laces, I glitter from head to foot with them. 8. I have had a few skirmishes with nollies, but not the general engagement. When this comes off, you shall have news from our correspondent. Nollies was Francis's brother. 9. I have got a really important job in reviewing the life of Ruskin for the speaker. As I have precisely 73 theories about Ruskin, it will be brilliant and condensed. I am also reviewing The Life of the Kendalls, a book on the Renaissance, and one on Caraggio for the bookman. 10. How far is it to Babylon? Babylon, I am firmly convinced, is just round the corner. If one could only be certain which corner. This conviction is the salt of my life. 11. Really and truly, I see no reason why we should not be married in April, if not before. I have been making some money calculations with the kind assistance of Rex, and as far as I can see, we could live in the country on quite a small amount of regular literary work. P.S. Forgot the last question. 12. Oddly enough, I was writing a poem. We'll send it to you. Gilbert's engagement had given him the impetus to earn more, but he was always entirely unpractical. His salary at Fisher Unwin's had been negligible, and he was not making much yet by the journalism, which was now his only source of income. The repeated promise to write to Nutt is very characteristic, for Nutt was the manager of the solitary publisher who was at the moment prepared to put a book of Gilbert's on the market at his own risk. Although they did not manage to get married this year, by the end of it, he was becoming well known. The articles in the speaker, especially, were attracting attention, and Greybeards at Play had a considerable success. This, the first of Gilbert's books to be published, is a curiosity. It is made up of three incredibly witty satirical poems. The oneness of the philosopher with nature, the dangers of attending altruism on the high seas, and the disastrous spread of aestheticism in all classes. The illustrations drawn by himself are as witty as the verses. By the beginning of 1901, his work was being sought for by other liberal periodicals, and he was writing regularly for the Daily News. The following letter to Francis bears the postmark February 8, 1901. Somewhere in the Arabian Nights, or some such place, there is a story of a man who was Emperor of the Indies for one day. I am rather in the position of that person, for I am editor of the speaker for one day. Hammond is unwell, and Hurst has gone to dine with John Morley, so the latter asked me to see the paper through for this number. Hence this note paper, and the great hurry and brevity which I fear must characterize this letter. There are a few minor amusing things, however, that I have a moment to mention. 1. The Daily News have sent me a huge mass of books to review, which block up the front hall. A study of Swinburne, a book on Kipling, the last Richard Le Gallienne, all very interesting. See if I don't do some whacking articles, all about the stars and the moon and the creation of Adam and that sort of thing. I really think I could work a revolution in daily paper writing by the introduction of poetical prose. 2. Among other books that I have to review came, all unsolicited, a book by your old friend Schofield. Ha ha ha! 
It's about the formation of character, or some of those low and beastly amusements. I think of introducing parts of my comic opera of the PNEU into the articles. Three. Another rather funny thing is the way in which my name is being spread about. Belloc declares that everyone says to him, Who discovered Chesterton? And that he always replies, A genius older shop. This may be a trifle Gallic, but Hammond has shown me more than one letter from Cambridge Dons and such people, demanding the identity of GKC in a quite violent tone. They excuse themselves by offensive phrases in which the word brilliant occurs, but I shouldn't wonder if there was a thick stick somewhere at the back of it. Belloc, by the way, has revealed another side of his extraordinary mind. He seems to have taken our marriage much to heart, for he talks to me no longer about French Jacobins and medieval saints, but entirely about the cheapest flats and furniture, on which, as on the others, he is a mine of information, assuring me paternally that it's the carpet that does you. I should think this fatherly tone would amuse you. Now I must leave off, for the pages have come up to be seen through the press. Greybeards at Play, its author never took very seriously. It was not included in his collected poems, and he does not even mention it in his autobiography. He attached a great deal more importance to The Wild Knight and other poems. It was a volume of some fifty poems, many of which had already appeared in The Outlook and The Speaker. It was published in 1900 and produced a crop of enthusiastic reviews and more and more people began to ask one another, who is G.K. Chesterton? One reviewer wrote, if it were not for the haunting fear of losing a humorist, we should welcome the author of The Wild Knight to a high place among the poets. Another spoke of the curious intensity of the volume. Among those who were less pleased was John Davidson, on whom the book had been fathered by one reviewer and who denied responsibility for such frantic rubbish, and also a reverent reviewer who complained, it is scattered all over with the name of God. To Francis, Gilbert wrote, I have been taken to see Mrs. Maino, poet and essayist, who is enthusiastic about the wild night and is lending it to all her friends. Last night, I went to Mrs. Cox's book party. My costume was a great success. Everyone wrestled with it. Only one person guessed it, and the rest admitted that it was quite fair and simple. It consisted of wearing on the lapel of my dress coat the following letters, U-U-N-S-I-J. Perhaps you would like to work this out all by yourself. But no, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. The book I represented was The Letters of Junius. Mrs. Maynell never came to know Gilbert well, and her daughter says in the biography that her mother realized his critical approval, admiration would be a better word, of her own work only by reading his essays. But he once wrote an introduction for a book of hers, and her admiration of him would break out frequently in amusing exclamations. I hope the papers are nice to my Chesterton. He is mine much more, really, than Belloc's. If I had been a man and large, I should have been Chesterton. Brimley Johnson, who was to have been Gilbert's brother-in-law, sent the Wild Knight to Rudyard Kipling. His reply is amusing and also touching, for Mr. Johnson was clearly pouring out in interest in Gilbert's career and in forwarding his marriage with Francis the affections that might merely have been frozen by Gertrude's death. The Elms, Roddingdean, November 28th. Dear Mr. Johnson, Many thanks for The Wild Night. Of course I knew some of the poems before, notably The Donkey, which stuck in my mind at the time I read it. I agree with you that there is any amount of promise in the work, and I think marriage will teach him a good deal too. It will be curious to see how he'll develop in a few years. We all begin with arranging and elaborating all the heavens and hells and the stars and tragedies we can lay our poetic hands on. Later we see folk, just common people under the heavens. Meantime, I wish him all the happiness that there can be, and for yourself, 
such comfort as men say time brings after loss. It's apt to be a weary while coming, but one goes the right way to get it if one interests oneself in the happiness of other folk. Even though the sight of happiness is like a knife turning in a wound. Yours sincerely, Rudyard Kipling. P.S. Merely as a matter of loathsome detail, Chesterton has a bad attack of Orioles. They are spotted all over the book. I think everyone is bound in each book to employ unconsciously some pet word, but that was Rossetti's. Likewise, I notice wan waste and many wands and things that catch and cling. He is too good not to be jolted out of that. What do you say to a severe course of Walt Whitman? Or will marriage make him see people? Gilbert had already taken both prescriptions. Walt Whitman and folk, just common people under the heavens. Many years later, James Agate wrote in Thursdays and Fridays. Unlike some other serious thinkers, Chesterton understood his fellow men. The woes of a jockey were as familiar to him as the worries of a judge. Perhaps some slight echoes of Swinburne did remain in this collection. Many earlier poems exist in the Swinburne manner, not of thought, but of expression. Gilbert left an absolute command that these should never be published. All Englishmen were stricken by the death of Queen Victoria. Mr. Summers Cox, who had come to know Gilbert through his intimacy with Belloc, remembers that he wept when he heard of it. The tears may also be heard in a letter to Francis. Today the Queen was buried. I did not see the procession, first because I had an appointment with Hammond, of which more anon, and secondly, because I think I felt the matter too genuinely. I like a crowd when I am triumphant or excited, for a crowd is the only thing that can cheer, as much as a cock is the only thing that can crow. Can anything be more absurd than the idea of a man cheering alone in his back bedroom? But I think that reverence is better expressed by one man than a million. There is something unnatural and impossible, even grotesque, in the idea of a vast crowd of human beings all assuming an air of delicacy. All the same, my dear, this is a great and serious hour, and it is felt so completely by all England that I cannot deny the enduring wish I have, quite apart from certain more private sentiments, that the noblest Englishwoman I have ever known was here with me to renew, as I do, private vows of a very real character to do my best for this country of mine, which I love with a love passing the love of jingoes. It is sometimes easy to give one's country blood, and easier to give her money. Sometimes the hardest thing of all is to give her truth. I am writing an article on the good friend who is dead. I hope particularly that you will like it. The one I really like so far is Bellix and the Speaker. I had, as I said, many things to say, but owing to the hour and a certain fatigue and idiocy in myself, I have only space for the most important. Hammond sent for me today and asked me seriously if I would help him in writing a book on Fox, sharing work, fame, and profits. I told him that I had no special talent for research. He replied that he had no talent for literary form. I then said that I would be delighted to give him such assistance, as I honestly thought valuable enough for him to split his profits for that I thought I could give him such assistance in the matter of picturesqueness and plan of idea, more especially as Fox was a great hero of mine, and the philosophy of his life involves the whole philosophy of the revolution and of the love of mankind. We arranged that we would make a preliminary examination of the Fox record and then decide. Three more letters, two to Francis, one to his mother complete the outline of this eventful period. He was now determined to get married quickly. For the first time, and entirely without rancor, he realized the inevitable competition in the world of journalism. The struggle for success meant men fighting one another. Other journalists were fighting him, but truly enough, though with a rare dispassionateness, he realized that this meant a need for daily bread and others similar to his own. 
11, Warwick Gardens, W. Postmarked February 19, 1901. I hope that in your own beautiful kindness, you will be indulgent just at this time if I only write rough letters or postcards. I am for the first time in my life thoroughly worried, and I find it a rather exciting and not entirely unpleasant sensation. But everything depends just now, not only on my sticking hard to work and doing a lot of my very best, but on my thinking about it, keeping wide awake to the turn of the market, being ready to do things not in half a week, but in half an hour, getting the feelings and tendencies of other men, and generally living in work. I am going to see Layman tomorrow, and many things may come of it. I cannot express to you what it is to feel the grip of the great wheel of real life on you for the first time. For the first time, I know what is meant by the word enemies, men who deliberately dislike you and oppose your career. And the funny thing is that I don't dislike them at all. Poor devils. Very likely they want to be married in June, too. I am a socialist, but I love this fierce old world, and I'm beginning to find a beauty in making money, in moderation, as in making statues. Always through my head, one tune and words of Kipling set to it. They passed one resolution, your subcommittee believe. You can lighten the curse of Adam when you've lightened the curse of Eve. Until we are built like angels, with hammer and chisel and pen, we'll work for ourselves and a woman, forever and ever. Amen. 11. Warwick Gardens W. Postmark, March 4, 1901. I have delayed this letter in a scandalous manner, because I hoped I might have the arrangements with the Daily News to tell you. As that is again put off, I must tell you later. The following, however, are grounds on which I believe everything will turn out right this year. It is arithmetic. The speaker has hitherto paid me 70 pounds a year. That is six pounds a month. It has now raised it to 10 pounds a month, which makes 120 pounds a year. Moreover, they encourage me to write as much as I like in the paper, so that assuming that I do something extra, poem, note, leader, twice a month, or every other number, which I can easily do, that brings us to nearly 150 pounds a year. So much for the speaker. Now for the daily news. Both certainties and probabilities. Hammond, to whom you will favor me by being eternally grateful, pushed me so strongly with Layman for the post of manager of the literary page that it is most probable that I shall get it. If I do, Hammond thinks they couldn't give me less than 200 pounds a year. So that if this turns out right, we have 350 pounds, say, without any aid from bookmen, books, magazine articles, or stories. Let us, however, put this chance entirely on one side, and suppose that they can give me nothing but regular work on the daily news. I have just started a set of popular fighting articles on literature in the daily news called The Wars of Literature. They will appear at least twice a week, often three times. For each of these, I am paid about a guinea and a half. This makes about three pounds a week, which is 144 pounds a year. Thus, with only the present certainties of speaker and daily news, we have 264 pounds a year, or very likely, with extra speaker items, 288 pounds, close on 300 pounds. This again may be reinforced by all sorts of miscellaneous work, which I shall get now my name is getting known, magazine articles, helping editors or publishers, reading manuscripts, and so on. In all these calculations, I have kept deliberately under the figures, not over them, so that I don't think I have failed altogether to bring my promise within reasonable distance of fact already. Bellick suggested that I should write for the pilot, and as he is on it, he will probably get me some work. Hammond has become leader writer on the Echo, and will probably get me some reviewing on that. And between ourselves, to turn with intense relief from all this egotism, Hammond and I have a little scheme on hand for getting Oldershaw a kind of editorial place on the Echo. 
where they want a brisk but cultivated man of the world, I think we can bring it off. It is a good place for an ambitious young man. It would give me more happiness than I can say, while I am building my own house of peace, to do something for the man who did so much in giving me my reason for it. For well thou knowest, O God most wise, how good on earth was his gift to me. Shall this be a little thing in thine eyes that is greater in mine than the whole great sea? I am afraid that this is a very dull letter. But you know what I am. I can be practical, but only deliberately, by fixing my mind on a thing. In this letter, I sum up my last month's thinking about money resources. I haven't given a thought yet to the application and distribution of them in rent, furniture, etc. When I have done thinking about that, you will get another dull letter. I can keep ten poems and twenty theories in my head at once, but I can only think of one practical thing at a time. The only conclusion of this letter is that on any calculation whatever, we ought to have three hundred pounds a year and be on the road to four in a little while. With this before you, I dare say you, who are more practical than I, could speculate and suggest a little as to the form of living and expenditure. Gilbert's mother, perhaps, needed more convincing. The letter to her has no postmark, but the 300 pounds a year has grown to almost 500 pounds, and a careful economy is promised. Mrs. Barnes, The Orchards, Burley Hans. My dearest mother, thank you very much for your two letters. If you get back to Kensington before me, I shall return on Thursday night. I find I work here very well. Would you mind sending on any letters? You might send on the check, though that is not necessary. There is a subject we have touched on once or twice that I want to talk to you about, for I am very much worried in my mind as to whether you will disapprove of a decision I have been coming to with a very earnest belief that I am seeking to do the right thing. I have just had information that my screw from the speaker will be yet further increased from 120 pounds a year to 150 pounds, or, if I do the full amount I can, 190 pounds a year. I have also had a request from the Daily News to do two columns a week regularly, which is rather over 100 pounds a year, besides other book reviews. My other sources of income, which should bring the amount up to nearly 150 pounds more at any rate, I will speak of in a moment. There is something, as I say, that is distressing me a great deal. I believe I said about a year ago that I hoped to get married in a year if I had money enough. I fancy you took it rather as a joke. I was not so certain about it myself then, I have, however, been coming very seriously to the conclusion that if I pull off one more affair, a favorable arrangement with Reynolds' newspaper, whose editor wants to see me at the end of this week, I shall, unless you disapprove, make a dash for it this year. When I mentioned the matter a short time ago, you said, if I remember right, that you did not think I ought to marry under 400 pounds or 500 pounds a year. I was moved to go into the matter thoroughly then and there, but as it happened, I knew I had one or two bargains just coming, of which would bring me nearer to the standard you named, so I thought I would let it stand over till I could actually quote them. Believe me, my dearest mother, I am not considering this affair wildly or ignorantly. I have been doing nothing but sums in my head for the last months. This is how matters stand. The speaker editor, says they will take as much as I like to write. If I write my maximum, I get 192 pounds a year from them. From the daily news, even if I do not get the post on the staff, which was half promised to me, I shall get at least 100 pounds a year, with a good deal over for reviews outside the wars of literature. That makes nearly 300 pounds. With the Manchester Sunday Chronicle, I have just made a bargain by which I shall get 72 pounds a year, this makes 370 pounds a year altogether. The matter now, I think, largely depends on Reynolds' paper. If I do, as is contemplated, weekly articles and thumbnail sketches, 
They cannot give me less than 100 pounds a year. This would bring the whole to 470 pounds a year, or within 30 pounds of your standard. Of course, I know quite well that this is not like talking of an income from a business or a certain investment. But we should live a long way within this income if we took a very cheap flat, even a workman's flat if necessary, had a woman in to do the laborious daily work, and for the rest waited on ourselves, as many people I know do in cheap flats. Moreover, journalism has its ups as well as downs, and I, I can fairly say, am on the upward way. Without vanity, and in a purely business-like spirit, I may say that my work is talked about a great deal. It is at least a remarkable fact that every one of the papers I write for, as detailed above, came to me and asked me to do the work for them. From the Daily News down to the Manchester Sunday Chronicle. I have, as I say, what seems to me a sufficient income for a start. That I shall have as good and better, I am as certain as that I sit here. I know the clockwork of these papers, and among one set of them, I might almost say that I am becoming the fashion. Do not, please, think that I am entertaining this idea without realizing that I shall have to start in a very serious and economical spirit. I have worked it out, and I am sure we could live well within the above calculations, and leave a good margin. I make all these prosaic statements because I want you to understand that I know the risks I think of running. But it is not any practical question that is distressing me. On that, I think I see my way. But I am terribly worried for fear you should be angry or sorry about all this. I am only kept in hope by the remembrance that I had the same fear when I told you of my engagement and that you dispelled it with a directness and generosity that I shall not forget. I think, my dear mother, that we have always understood each other, really. We are neither of us very demonstrative. We come of some queer stock that can always say least when it means most. But I do think you can trust me when I say that I think a thing really right and equally honestly admit that I can hardly explain why. To explain why I know it is right would be to communicate the incommunicable and speak of delicate and sacred things in bald words. The most I can say is that I know Frances like the back of my hand and can tell without a word from her that she has never recovered from a wound and that there is only one kind of peace that will heal it. I have tried to explain myself in this letter. I can do it better in a letter somehow, but I do not think I have done it very successfully. However, with you, it does not matter, and it never will matter, how my thoughts come tumbling out. You, at least, have always understood what I meant. Always, your loving son, Gilbert. Recording by Dick Bourgeois Doyle. Gilbert Keith Chesterton by Maisie Ward. Chapter 11, Part 1. Married Life in London. The suburbs are commonly referred to as prosaic. That is a matter of taste. Personally, I find them intoxicating. Introduction to Literary London. The wedding day drew near, and the presents were pouring in. I feel like the young man in the gospel, said Gilbert to Annie Furman, sorrowful because I have great possessions. Conrad Noel married Gilbert and Francis at Kensington Parish Church on June 28, 1901. As Gilbert knelt down, the price ticket on the sole of one of his new shoes became plainly visible. Annie caught Mrs. Chesterton's eye, and they began to laugh helplessly. Annie thinks, too, that for once in their lives, Gilbert and Cecil did not argue at the reception. Lucian Oldershaw drove ahead to the station with heavy luggage, put it on the train, and waited feverishly. That train went off with the luggage, then another. And at last, the happy couple appeared. Gilbert had felt it necessary to stop on the way in order to drink a glass of milk in one shop and to buy a revolver with cartridges in another. The milk he drank because in childhood his mother used to give him a glass in that shop. 
The revolver was for the defense of his bride against possible dangers. They followed the luggage by a slow train. This love of weapons, his revolver, his favorite sword stick, remained with him all his life. It suggested the adventures that he always bestowed on the heroes of his stories and would himself have loved to experience. He noted in 12 types Scott's love of armor and of weapons for their own sakes. The texture, the power, the beauty of a sword hilt or a jeweled dagger. As a child would play with these things, Gilbert played with them. But they also stood in his mind for freedom, adventure, personal responsibility, and much else that the modern world had lost. The honeymoon was spent on the Northbrook Broads. On the way, they stopped at Ipswich, and it was like meeting a friend in a fairy tale to find himself under the sign of the White Horse on the first day of my honeymoon. Annie Furman was staying in Warwick Gardens for the wedding and afterwards. Gilbert's first letter from the Northbrook Broads began, I have a wife, a piece of string, a pencil, and a knife. What more can any man want on a honeymoon? Asked on his return what wallpapers he would prefer in the house they had chosen, he asked for brown paper so he could draw pictures everywhere. He had by no means abandoned this old habit, and Annie remembers an illness during which he asked for a long enough pencil to draw on the ceiling. Their quaint little house in Edward Square, Kensington, lent to them by Mr. Boer, an old friend of Francis, was close to Warwick Gardens. I remember the house well, wrote E.C. Bentley later, with its garden of old trees and its general air of Georgian peace. I remember, too, the splendid flaming frescoes done in vivid crayons of knights and heroes and divinities with which G.K.C. embellished the outside wall of the back beneath a sheltering portico. I have often wondered whether the landlord charged for them as dilapidations at the end of the tenancy. They were only in Edward Square for a few months and then moved to Overstrand Mansions, Battersea, where the rest of their London life was spent. It was here I came to know them a few years later. As soon as they could afford it, they threw drawing room and dining room together to make one big one. At one end hung an engagement board with what Father O'Connor has described as a loud inscription, lest we forget. Beside the engagements was pinned a poem by Hilaire Balak. Francis and Gilbert have a little flat, at 80 pounds a year and cheap at that, where Francis, who is Gilbert's only wife, leads an unhappy and complaining life, while Gilbert, who is Francis' only man, puts up with it as gamely as he can. The Bellocks chose life in the country much earlier than the Chestertons, and an undated letter to Battersea threatens due reprisals in an exclusion from their country home if the Chestertons are not prepared to receive them in town at a late hour. Kingsland, Shipley, Horsham. It will annoy you a good deal to hear that I am in town tomorrow, Wednesday evening, and I shall appear at your apartment at 10.45 or 10.30 at the earliest p.m. You are only just returned. You are hardly settled down. It is an intolerable nuisance. You heartily wish I had not mentioned it. Well, you see that arrow pointing to telegrams, Coulomb, Sussex? If you wire there before one, you can put me off. But if you do, I shall melt your keys. Both the exterior one, which forms the body, or form of the matter, and the interior one, which is the mystical content thereof. Also, if you put me off, I shall not have you down here ever to see the oak room, the tapestry room, the green room, etc. Yours, H.B. Early in his Battersea life, Gilbert received a note from Max Beerbohm, the great humorist, introducing himself and suggesting a luncheon together. I am quite different from my writings, and so, I dare say, are you from yours, so that we should not necessarily fail to hit it off. I, in the flesh, am modest, full of common sense, very genial, and rather dull. What you are remains to be seen, or not to be seen, by me according to your decision. Gilbert's decision was for the meeting, and an instant liking grew into a warm friendship. As in JDC days, Gilbert had written verse about his friends, so now did he try to sum up an impression, perhaps after some special talk. 
and Max's queer crystalline sense, lit like a sea beneath the sea, shines through a shameless impudence and shameless uh, humility. For Belloc somewhat rudely roared, but all above him, when he spoke, the immortal battle trumpets broke, and Europe was a single sword. Unpublished fragment. Somewhere about this time must have occurred the incident mentioned by George Bernard Shaw in a note which appeared in the Mark Twain Quarterly, Spring 1937. I cannot remember when I first met Chesterton. I was so much struck by a review of Scott's Ivanhoe, which he wrote for the Daily News in the course of his earliest notable job as a feuilletonist for the paper that I wrote to him, asking who he was and where he came from, as he was evidently a new star in literature. He was either too shy or too lazy to answer. The next thing I remember is his lunching with us on quite intimate terms, accompanied by Belloc. The actual first meeting, forgotten by Shaw, is remembered by Gilbert's brother-in-law, Lucian Oldershaw. He and Gilbert had gone together to Paris, where they visited Rodin, then making a bust of Bernard Shaw. Mr. Oldershaw introduced Gilbert to GBS, who, Rodin's secretary told them, had been endeavoring to explain at some length the nature of the Salvation Army, leading up, one imagines, to an account of Major Barbara. At the end of the explanation, Rodin's secretary remarked to a rather apologetic Shaw, The master says you have not much French, but you impose yourself. Shaw talked Gilbert down. Mr. Oldershaw complained that the famous man should talk more than the beginner is hardly surprising. But all through Gilbert's life, the complaint recurs on the lips of his admirers, just as a similar complaint is made by Lockhart about Sir Walter Scott. Chesterton, like Scott, abounded in cordial admiration of other men and women, and had a simple enjoyment in meeting them. And Chesterton was one of the few great conversationalists, perhaps the only one, who would really rather listen than talk. In 1901 appeared his first book of collected essays, The Defendant. The essays in it had already appeared in The Speaker. Like all his later work, it had the mixed reception of enthusiasts who saw what he meant, and puzzled reviewers who took refuge in that blessed word, paradox. Paradox ought to be used, said one of these, like onions to season the salad. Mr. Chesterton's salad is all onions. Paradox has been defined as truth standing on her head to attract attention. Mr. Chesterton makes truth cut her throat to attract attention. Without denying that his love of a joke led him into indefensible puns and such like fooleries, Though Monsignor Ronald Knox tells me he is prepared to defend all of G.K.'s puns. I think nearly all his paradoxes were either the startling expression of an entirely neglected truth or the startling re-emphasis of the neglected side of a truth. Once he said, it is a paradox, but it is God and not I who should have the credit of it. He proved his case a few years later in the chapter of orthodoxy called The Paradoxes of Christianity. What it amounted to was roughly this. Paradox must be the nature of things because of God's infinity and the limitations of the world and of man's mind. To us limited beings, God can express his idea only in fragments. We can bring together apparent contradictions in those fragments whereby a greater truth is suggested. If we do this in a sudden or incongruous manner, we startle the unprepared and arouse the cry of paradox. But if we will not do it, we shall miss a great deal of truth. Chesterton also saw many proverbs and old sayings as containing a truth which the people who constantly repeated them had forgotten. The world was asleep and must be awakened. The world had gone placidly mad and must be violently restored to sanity. That the methods he used annoyed some is undeniable, but he did force people to think, even if they raged at him as the unaccustomed muscles came into play. I believe he said in a speech at this date, in getting into hot water. I think it keeps you clean, and he believed intensely in keeping out of a narrow stream of merely literary life. To those who exalted the poet above the journalist, he gave this answer. The poet writing his name upon a score of little pages in the silence of his study may or may not have an intellectual right to despise the journalist, but I greatly doubt whether he would not morally be better if he saw the great lights burning on through darkness into dawn, 
and heard the roar of the printing wheels weaving the destinies of another day. Here, at least, is a school of labor and of some rough humility, the largest work ever published anonymously since the great Christian cathedrals. A word for the mere journalist. Darlington North Star, February 3rd, 1902. He plunged then into the life of Fleet Street and held it his proudest boast to be a journalist. But he had his own way of being a journalist. On the whole, I think I owe my success, as the millionaires say, to having listened respectfully and rather bashfully to the very best advice given by all the best journalists who had achieved the best sort of success in journalism and then going away and doing the exact opposite. But what they all told me was that the secret of success in journalism was to study the particular journal and write what was suitable to it. And partly by accident and ignorance, and partly through the real rabid certainties of youth, I cannot remember that I ever wrote any article that was at all suitable to any paper. I wrote on a nonconformist organ, like the old Daily News, and told them all about French cafes and Catholic cathedrals. And they loved it, because they had never heard of them before. I wrote on a robust labor organ, like the old clarion, and defended medieval theology and all the things their readers had never heard of. And their readers did not mind me a bit. Autobiography, pages 185 to 186. Mr. Titterden, who worked also on the Daily News and came at this time to know G.K. at the Pharaoh's Club, says that at first he was rather shy of the other men on the staff. But after a dinner at which he was asked to speak, he came to know and like them and to be at home in Fleet Street. He liked to work amid human contact and would write his articles in a public house or in the club or even in the street, resting the paper against a wall. Frank Swinnerton records a description given him by Charles Masterman of how Chesterton used to sit writing his articles in the Fleet Street Cafe, sampling and mixing a terrible conjunction of drinks while many waiters hovered about him, partly in awe and partly in case he should leave the restaurant without paying for what he had had. One day, the head waiter approached Masterman. Your friend, he whispered admiringly. He very clever man. He sit and laugh, and then he write, and then he laugh at what he write. Georgian scene, page 94. He loved Fleet Street and did a good deal of drinking there, but not only there. When, in the autobiography, he writes of wine and song, it is not Fleet Street and its taverns that come back to his mind, but the moonstruck banquets given by Mr. Morris Baring, the garden in Westminster where he fenced with real swords against one more intoxicated than himself. Song shouted in Oberon Herbert's rooms near Buckingham Palace. After marriage, Francis seems to have given up the struggle so ardently pursued during their engagement to make him tidy. By a stroke of genius, she decided instead to make him picturesque. The conventional frock coat worn so unconventionally, the silk hat crowning a mat of hair disappeared, and a wide-brimmed slouch hat and flowing cloak more appropriately garbed him. This was especially good as he got fatter. He was a tall man, six foot two. As a boy, he had been thin, but now he was rapidly putting on weight. Neither he nor Cecil played games. The tennis did not last. But they used to go for long walks, sometimes going off together for a couple of days at a time. Gilbert still liked to do this with Francis, but the sedentary daily life and the consumption of a good deal of beer did not help towards a graceful figure. By 1903, G.K. was called a fat humorist, and he was fast getting ready to be Dr. Johnson in various pageants. By 1906, he was then 32. He had become famous enough to be one of the celebrities painted or photographed for exhibitions, and Bernard Shaw described a photo of him by Coburn. Chesterton is our Quinbus Flustra, the young man mountain, a large, abounding, gigantically cherubic person who is not only large in body and mind, beyond all decency, but seems to be growing larger as you look at him, swelling, whizbilly, as Tony Weller puts it. Mr. Coburn has represented him as flowing off the plate in the very act of being photographed and blurring his own outlines in the process. 
Also, he has caught the Chestertonian resemblance to Balzac and unconsciously handled his subject as Rodin handled Balzac. You may call the placing of the head on the plate wrong, the focusing wrong, the exposure wrong if you like, but Chesterton is right, and a right impression of Chesterton is what Mr. Coburn was driving at. The change in his appearance, G.K. celebrated in a stanza of his Ballad of the Grotesque. I was light as a penny to spin, I was thin as an arrow to cleave, I could stand on a fishing rod's end, with composure, though on the key be. But from time, all the flying to thieve, the suns and the moons of the year, a different shape I received. The shape is decidedly queer. London, said a recently arrived American, is the most marvelously fulfilling experience. I went to see Fleet Street this morning and met G.K. Chesterton face to face, wrapped in a cloak and standing in the doorway of a pie shop. He was composing a poem, reciting it aloud as he wrote. The most striking thing about the incident was that no one took the slightest notice. I doubt if any writer, except Dickens, has so quickly become an institution as Chesterton. Nor, of course, would his picturesqueness in Fleet Street or his swift success as a journalist have accomplished this but for the vast output of books on every conceivable subject. But before I come to the books written during those years at Battersea, a word must be said of another element besides his journalistic contacts that was linking G.K. with a wider world than the solely literary. We have seen that even when his religion was at its lowest point, in the difficult art school days, he never lost it entirely. I hung on to religion by one thin thread of thanks. In the years of the notebook, he advanced very far in his pondering on and his acceptance of the great religious truths. But this did not as yet mean attachment to the church. Then he met Francis. She actually practiced the religion. This was something utterly unaccountable both to me and to the whole fussy culture in which she lived. Now that they were married, Francis, as a convinced Anglo-Catholic, was bringing more clergy and other Anglican friends into Gilbert's circle. Moreover, he was lecturing all over England, and this brought him into contact with all sorts of strange religious beliefs. Amid all this scattered thinking, I began to piece together fragments of the old religious scheme mainly by the various gaps that denoted its disappearance. And the more I saw of real human nature, the more I came to suspect that it was really rather bad for all these people that it had disappeared. Autobiography, page 177. In 1903-1904, he had a tremendous battle, the detail of which will be treated in the next chapter, in The Clarion, with Robert Blanchford. In it, he adumbrated many of the ideas that were later developed in orthodoxy. Of the arguments used by Blanchford and his atheist friends, G.K. wrote that the effect on his own mind was, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. In a diary kept by Francis spasmodically during the years 1904 and 1905, she notes that Gilbert has been asked to preach as the first of a series of lay preachers in a city church. She writes, March 16th. One of the proudest days of my life, Gilbert preached at St. Paul's Covent Garden for the CSU, the Christian Social Union, Vox Populi, Vox Dei, the Cram Church. He was very eloquent and restrained. Sermons will be published afterwards. Published they were, under the title, Preachers from the Pew. March 30th, the second sermon, The Citizen, the Gentleman, and the Savage. Even better than last week, where there is no vision, people perish. Well, it is remembered that the Browning, the Watts, Twelve Types, and the Napoleon of Notting Hill had all been published and received with acclaim. It is touching that Frances should speak thus of the proudest day of her life. That Gilbert should himself have vision and show it to others remained her strongest aspiration. Not thus felt all his admirers. The Blatchford controversy on matters religious became more than many of them could bear. Plaintive correspondent, says the Daily News, who seems to have had enough of the eternal verities and the eternal other things, sends us the following lines written on reading Mr. J. Key Chesterton's 47th reply to a secularist opponent. What ails our wondrous GKC? Flew late on youth's glad wings, flew fairy-like and gossip-free of translunary things. And thus, in dull, didactic mood, he quits the realms of dream and 
like some pulpit preacher rude, drones on one dreary theme. Stern Blatchford, thou hast dashed the glee of our omniscient babe. Thy name alone now murmurs he, or that of dark McCabe. All vain his cloudy fancy swell, his paradox all vain, obsessed by that malignant spell of Blatchford on the brain. HSS. Daily News, 12th January, 1904. Mr. Noel has a livelier memory of Gilbert's religious and social activities. On one occasion, he went to the Battersea flat for a meeting at which he was to speak and Gilbert take the chair to establish a local branch of the Christian Social Union. The two men got into talk over their wine in the dining room, then still a separate room, and Francis came in much agitated. Gilbert, you must dress. The people will be arriving any moment. Yes, yes, I'll go. The argument was resumed and went on with animation. Francis came back. Gilbert, the drawing room is half full and people are still arriving. At last, in despair, she brought Gilbert's dress clothes into the dining room and made him change there, still arguing. Next, he had to be urged into the drawing room. Established at a small table, he began to draw comic bishops, quite oblivious to the fact that he was to take the chair of the now-assembled meeting. Finally, Francis managed to attract his attention. He leaped up, overthrowing the small table and scattering the comic bishops. Surely the story, said a friend whom I told it, proves what some people said about Chesterton's affectation. He must have been posing. I do not think so, and those who knew Gilbert best believed him incapable of posing. He was perfectly capable of willfulness and of sulking like a schoolboy. It amused him to argue with Mr. Noel. It did not amuse him at all to take the chair at the meeting. So, as he was not allowed to go on arguing, he drew comic bishops. There was, too, more than a touch of his willfulness in the second shock he administered to respectable Battersea later in the evening. An earnest young lady asked the company for counsel as to the best way of arranging her solitary maid's evening out. I'm so afraid, ended the appeal, of her going to the Red Lion. Best place she could go, said Gilbert. And occasionally, he would add example to precept. For society and Fleet Street were not the only places for human intercourse. At present, commented a journalist, he is cultivating the local politics of Battersea. In secluded alehouses, he drinks with the frequenters and learns their opinions on municipal milk and on Mr. John Burns. Good friends and very gay companions, Gilbert calls the Christian Social Union group, of whom, besides Conrad Noel, were Charles Masterman, Bishop Gore, Percy Dermer, and above all, Canon Scott Holland. Known as Scotty and adored by many generations of young men, he was a man with a natural surge of laughter within him, so that his broad mouth seemed always to be shut down on it in a grimace of restraint. Like Gilbert, he suffered from the effect of urging his most serious views with apparent flippancy and fantastic illustrations. In the course of a speech to a respectable Nottingham audience, he remarked, I dare say several of you here have never been in prison. Autobiography, page 169. A ghastly stare, says Gilbert, describing the speech, was fixed on all the faces of the audience, and I have ever since seen it in my own dreams, for it has constituted a considerable part of my own problem. Gilbert's verses, summarizing the meeting as it must have sounded to a worthy Nottingham tradesman, are quoted in the autobiography and completed in Father Brown on Chesterton. I have put them together here, for they show how merrily these men were working to change the world. The Christian Social Union here was very much annoyed. It seems there is some duty which we never should avoid. And so they sang a lot of hymns to help the unemployed. Upon a platform at the end, the speakers were displayed, and Bishop Hoskins stood in front and hit a bell and said that Mr. Carter was to pray. Mr. Carter prayed. Then Bishop Gore of Birmingham, he stood upon one leg and said he would be happier if beggars didn't beg and that if they pinched his palace, it would take him down a peg. He said that unemployment was a horror and a blight. He said that charities produced servility and spite and stood upon the other leg and said it wasn't right. And then the man named Chesterton got up and played with water. He seemed to say that principles were nice and led to slaughter. And how we always compromised and how we didn't arter. 
Then Cannon Holland fired ahead, like 50 cannons firing. We tried to find out what he meant with infinite inquiring, but the way he made the windows jump, we couldn't help admiring. I understood him to remark, it seemed a little odd, that half a dozen of his friends had never been in quad. He said he was a socialist himself, and so was God. He said the human soul should be ashamed of every sham. He said a man should constantly ejaculate, I am. When he had done, I went outside and got into a tram. Partly perhaps to console himself for the loss of his son's daily company, chiefly, I imagine, out of sheer pride and joy and success, Edward Chesterton started after the publication of The Wild Knight, pasting all Gilbert's press cuttings into volumes. Later I learned that it had long been Gilbert's weekly penance to read these cuttings on Sunday afternoon at his father's house. Traces of his passage are visible wherever a space admits of a caricature, and occasionally where it does not, the caricature is superimposed on the text. His growing fame may be seen by the growing size of these volumes and the increased space given to each of his books. Twelve Types in 1902 had a good press for a young man's work and was taken seriously in some important papers, but its success was as nothing compared with that of the Browning a year later. The bulk of Twelve Types, as of the defendant, had appeared in periodicals, but never in his life did Gilbert prepare a volume of his essays for the press without improving, changing, and unifying. It was never merely a collection, always a book. Still, the Browning was another matter. It was a compliment for a comparatively new author to be given the commission for the English Men of Letters series. Stephen Gwynne describes the experience of the publishers. On my advice, the Macmillans had asked him to do Browning in the English Men of Letters, when he was still not quite arrived. Old Mr. Craig, the senior partner, sent for me, and I found him in white fury, with Chesterton's proofs corrected in pencil, or rather not corrected. There were still 13 errors uncorrected on one page, mostly in quotations from Browning. A selection from a Scotch ballad had been quoted from memory, and three of the four lines were wrong. I wrote to Chesterton saying that the firm thought the book was going to disgrace them. His reply was, like the trumpeting of a crushed elephant, but the book was a huge success. Quoted in Chesterton by Cyril Clemens, page 14. In fact, it created a sensation and established GK in the front rank. Not all the reviewers liked it. And one angry writer in the Athenaeum pointed out that, not content with innumerable inaccuracies about Browning's descent and the events of his life, G.K. had even invented a line in Mr. Sludge, the medium. But every important paper had not only a review, but a long review, and the vast majority were enthusiastic. Chesterton claimed Browning as a poet not for experts, but for every man. His treatment of Browning's love affair, poet's obscurity, and of the ring and the book, all receive the same praise, of an originality which casts a true and revealing light for his readers. As with all his literary criticism, the most famous critics admitted that he had opened fresh windows on the subject for themselves. This attack on his inaccuracy and admiration for his insight constantly recurs with Chesterton's literary work. Readers noted that in the Ballad of the White Horse, he made Alfred's left wing face Guthrum's left wing. He was amused when it was pointed out, but never bothered to alter it. His memory was prodigious. All his friends testified to his knowing by heart pages of his favorite authors, and these were not few. Ten years after his time with Fisher Unwin, Francis told Father O'Connor that he remembered all the plots and most of the characters of the thousands of novels he had read for the firm. But he trusted his memory too much and never verified. Indeed, when it was a question merely of verbal quotation, he said it was pedantic to bother. And when laterally Dorothy Collins looked up his references, he barely tolerated it. Again, while he constantly declared that he was no scholar, he said things illuminating even two scholars. Thus, much later, when Chesterton's St. Thomas Aquinas appeared, the Master General of the Dominican Order, Père Gillet, lectured on and from it to large meetings of Dominicans. 
Mr. Eccles told me the talking of Virgil, G.K. said things immensely illuminating for experts on Latin poetry. In a very different field, Mr. Oldershaw noted after their trip to Paris that though he could set Gilbert Wright on many a detail, yet his generalizations were marvelous. He had, said Mr. Eccles, an intuitive mind. He had, too, read more than was realized, partly because his carelessness and contempt for scholarship misled. Where the pedant would have referred and quoted and cross-referred, he went dashing on, throwing out ideas from his abundance and caring little if among his wealth were a few faults of fact or interpretation. Abundance was a word much used of his work just now, and in the field of literary criticism, he was placed high and had an enthusiastic following. We may assume that the Browning had something to do with Sir Oliver Lodge's asking him in the next year, 1904, to become a candidate for the Chair of Literature at Birmingham University, but he had no desire to be a professor. Francis, in her diary, notes some of their widening contacts and engagements. The mixture of shrewdness and simplicity in her comments will be familiar to those who knew her intimately. Meeting her for the first time, I think the main impression was that of the single eye. She abounded in Gilbert's sense, as my mother commented after an early meeting and ministered to his genius. Yet she never lost an individual, markedly feminine point of view, which helped him greatly, as anyone can see who will read all he wrote on marriage. He shows an insight almost uncanny in the section called The Mistake About Women and What's Wrong with the World. Some people, he said in a speech in 1905, when married, gain each other. Some only lose themselves. The Chestertons gained each other, and by the sort of paradox he loved, Frances did so by throwing the stream of her own life unreservedly into the greater river of her husband's. She writes in her diary in 1904, Gilbert and I met all sorts of queer, well-known, attractive, unattractive people, and I expect this book will be mostly about them. February 17th, we went together to Mr. and Mrs. Sidney Colvin's home. It was rather jolly, but too many clever people there to be really nice. The clever people were Mr. Joseph Conrad, Mr. Henry James, Mr. Lawrence Binion, Mr. Morris Hewlett, and a great many more. Mr. and Mrs. Colvin looked so happy. February 3rd, Gilbert went as Mr. Lane's guest to a dinner of the odd volumes at the Imperial Restaurant. The other guest was Baden Powell. He and Gilbert made speeches. March 8th, Gilbert was to speak on education at the CSU meeting at Scion College, but a debate on the Chinese labor in South Africa was introduced instead and went excitingly. There is to be a big meeting of the CSU to protest, though I suppose it's all no good now. When the meeting was over, we adjourned to a tea shop and had immense fun. Gilbert Percy Dermer and Conrad Noel walked together down Fleet Street and never was there a funnier sight. Gilbert's costume consisted of a frock coat, huge felt hat and walking stick brandished in the face of the passers-by to their exceeding great danger. Conrad was dressed in an old lounge suit of sober gray with a clerical hat jauntily stuck on the back of his head, which led someone to remark, are you here in the capacity of a private gentleman, poor curate, or low-class actor? Mr. Dermer was clad in wonderful clerical garments, of which he alone possesses the pattern, which made him look like a Chaucer Canterbury pilgrim or a figure out of uh, Noah's Ark. They swaggered down the roadway talking energetically. At tea, we talked of many things. The future of the Commonwealth, chiefly. March 22nd, meeting of Christian... Theosophical Society, at which Gilbert lectured on how Theosophy appears to a Christian. He was very good. Herbert Burroughs vigorously attacked him in debate afterwards. Napoleon of Notting Hill was published. April 27th, Bellux and the Knowles came here to dinner. The Lair, in great form, recited his own poetry with great enthusiasm the whole evening. May 9th, the Literary Fun Dinner. About the greatest treat I ever had in my life. J. M. Barry presided. He was so splendid and so complimentary. Mrs. J. M. Barry is very pretty, but the most beautiful woman there was Mrs. Anthony Hope. Copper-colored hair, masses, with a wreath of gardenias, green eyes, and a long neck. Very beautiful figure. The speakers were Barry, Lord Tennyson, Communes Carr, 
A.E.W. Mason, Mrs. Craigie, who acquitted herself wonderfully, and Mrs. Flora Annie Steele. After the formal dinner was a reception, at which everyone was very friendly. It is wonderful the way in which they all accept Gilbert. And one well-known man told me he was the brightest man present. Anyhow, there was a feeling of brotherhood and fellowship in the wielding of the lovely and loathly pen. J.M. Barry's speech. May 12th, went to see Max Beerbohm's caricature of Gilbert at the Carfax Gallery. G.K.C., humanist, kissing the world. It's more like Thackeray. Very funny, though. June 9th, a political at home at Mrs. Sidney Webb's. Saw Winston Churchill and Lloyd George. Politics and nothing but politics is dull work, though. An intriguer's life must be a pretty poor affair. Mrs. Sidney Webb looked very handsome and moved among her guests as one to the manner born. I like Mrs. Leonard Courtney, who was always kind to me. Charlie Masterman and I had a long talk on the iniquities of the Daily News. And goodness knows they are serious enough. June 22nd, an at-home at Mrs. Blank's proved rather a dull affair, save for a nice little conversation with Watts Dunton. His walrusy appearance, which makes the bottom of his face look fierce, is counteracted by the kindness of his little eyes. He told us the inner story of Whistler's peacock room, which scarcely redounds to Whistler's credit. The Duchess of Sutherland was there, and many notabilities. Between ourselves, Mr. Blank is a good-hearted snob. His wife, nice, intelligent, but effective, I suppose unconsciously. I don't really like the precious people. They worry me. June 30th, Graham Robertson's at home was exceedingly select. I felt rather too uncultivated to talk much. Mr. Lane tucked his arm into mine and requested to know the news, which means, tell me all your husband is doing or going to do, how much is he getting, who will publish for him, has he sold his American rights, etc. Cobden's three daughters looked out of place, so solid and sincere are they. It was all too grand. No man ought to have so much wealth. July 5th, Gilbert went today to see Swinburne. I think he found it rather hard to reconcile the idea with the man, but he was interested, though I could not gather much about the visit. He was amused at the compliments which Watts Dunton and Swinburne pay to each other unceasingly. December 8th, George Alexander has an idea that he wants Gilbert to write a play for him and sent for him to come and see him. He was apparently taken with the notion of a play on the Crusades, and although there is at present no love incident in Gilbert's mind, Alexander introduced and acted the supposed love scene with great spirit. It may come off someday, perhaps. December 31st, H. Belloc's been very ill, but is better, thank God. 1905, February 1st. Gilbert, a guest at the 80 Club dinner, Rhoda and I went to after-dinner speeches. G.W.E. Russell, chair, Augustine Burrell, guest, and Sir Henry Fowler. It amused me hugely. Russell so imprudent and reckless, Burrell so prudent and incapable of giving himself away, and Sir Henry Fowler so commonplace and trite. He looked so wicked. I thought of Mr. Haldane's story of Fowler's fur coat and a single remark on examining it. Skunk. February 11th, rather an interesting lunch at Mrs. J.R. Green's. Jack Eats and Mrs. Thursby were there. The atmosphere is too political and I imagine Mrs. Green to be a bit of a wire puller, though I believe a nice woman. February 24th, Mr. Hallowell, Sutcliffe, came over. He is amusing and nice. Very puzzled at Gilbert's conduct, which on this particular occasion was peculiarly eccentric. March 9th, I had an amusing lunch at the Hotel Cecil with Miss Bisland, representative of McClure. Evidently thinks a lot of Gilbert and wants his work for McClure. Oh ye gods and little fishes, the diplomatic service ought to be all conducted by women. I offered her Margaret's poems in exchange for a short interview with Meredith, which she wishes Gilbert to undertake. March 14th, Gilbert dined at the Buxton's and met Asquith. March 19th. Leany is in town, and we have been with her to call on the Duchess of Sutherland. When I got used to the splendor, it was jolly enough. Her grace is a pretty sweet woman, who was very nervous, but got better under the fire of Gilbert's chaff. 
she made him write in her album, which he did, a most ridiculous poem of which he should be ashamed. It must be truly awful to live in the sort of way the Duchess does and endeavor to keep sane. May 25th. Words fail me when I try to recall the sensation aroused by a JDC dinner. It seems so odd to think that these men, as boys, to realize what their school life was and what a powerful element the JDC was in the lives of all. And there were husbands and wives, and the tie is so strong, and long, long thoughts of schoolboys and schoolgirls fell on us, as if the battle were still to come instead of raging round us. May 24th, we went together to see George Meredith. I suppose many people have seen him in his little Surrey cottage, Flint Cottage, Box Hill. He has a wonderful face and a frail old body. He talks without stopping except to drink ginger beer. He told us many stories, mostly about society scandals of some time back. I remember he asked Gilbert, Do you like babies? And when Gilbert said yes, he said, So do I, especially in the comet stage. June 5th, Granville Barker came to see Gilbert, touching the possibility of a plague. June 29th, the garden party at the Bishop's House, Kennington, the Bishop told me that A.J. Balfour was very impressed with heretics. The old of St. Matthew's service and rowdy supper. Gilbert made an excellent speech. July 5th, Gilbert dined at the Asquiths, met Roseberry. I think he hated it. July 16th, Gilbert went to see Mrs. Grenfell at Taplow. He met Balfour, Austin Chamberlain, and George Wyndham. Had an amusing time, no doubt. Says Balfour is most interesting to talk to, but appears bored. George Wyndham is delightful. Gilbert Keith Chesterton by Maisie Ward. Chapter 11, Part 2. Married Life in London. One felt always, with both Francis and Gilbert, that this society life stayed on the surface, amusing, distracting, sometimes welcome, sometimes boring, but never infringing the deeper reality of their relationships with old friends and with their own families, with each other. Francis wrote endless business and other letters for them both. In just a handful, mainly to Father O'Connor, does she show her deeper life of thought and feeling. Gilbert had little time now for writing anything but books and articles. Never a very good correspondent, he had become an exceedingly bad one. Annie Furman's engagement to Robert Kidd produced one of the few letters that exist. It is handwritten and undated. A restaurant somewhere. My dear Annie, I have thought of you, I am quite certain, more often than I have thought of any human being for a long time past. Except my wife, who recalls herself continually to me by virtues, splendors, agreeable memories, screams, pokers, brickbats, and other things. And yet, though whenever my mind was for an instant emptied of theology and journalism and patriotism and such rot, it has been immediately filled with you. I have never written you a line. I'm not going to explain this, and for a good reason. It is a part of the mystery of the mail, and you will soon, even if you do not already, get the hang of it by the society of an individual who, while being unmistakably a much better man than I am, is nevertheless male. I can only say that when men want a thing, they act quite differently to women. We put off everything we want to do in an ordinary way. If the Archangel Michael wrote me a complimentary letter tomorrow, as perhaps he may, I should put it in my pocket saying, how admirable a reply shall I write to that in a week or a month or so. I put off writing to you because I wanted to write something that had in it all that you have been to me, to all of us. And now instead, I am scrawling this nonsense in a tavern after lunch. My very dear old friend, I am of a sex that very seldom takes real trouble, that forgets the little necessities of time that is by nature lazy. I never wanted really but one thing in my life, and that I got. Any person inspecting 60 Overstrand mansions may see that somewhat excitable thing, free of charge. In another person, whom with maddening jealousy I suspect of being some inches taller than I am, I believe I notice the same tendency toward monomania. He also, being as I have so keenly pointed out male, he also, 
I think, has only wanted one thing seriously in his life. He also has got it. Another male weakness which I recognize with sympathy. All my reviewers call me frivolous. Do you think all this kind of thing frivolous? Damn it all, excuse me. What can one be but frivolous about serious things? Without frivolity, they are simply too tremendous. That you who, with your hair down your back, played at bricks with me in a house of which I have no memory except you and the bricks, that you should be taken by someone of my miserable sex, as you ought to be, what is one to say? I am not going to wish you happiness, because I am quite placidly certain that your happiness is inevitable. I know it because my wife is happy with me, and the wild, weird, extravagant, singular origin of this is a certain enduring fact in my psychology which you will find paralleled elsewhere. God bless you, my dear girl. Yours ever, Gilbert Chesterton. Married in 1903, Annie and her husband took another flat in Overstrand Mansions. Gilbert never cared what he wore, she writes. I remember one night, when my husband and I were living in the same block of flats, he came in to ask me to go down and sit with Francis, who wasn't very well, while he went down to the house to dine with Hugh Law. Gilbert was very correctly dressed, except for the fact that he had on one boot and one slipper. I pointed it out to him, and he said, Do you think it matters? And I told him I was sure Francis would not like him to go out like that, the only argument to affect him. When he was staying with me here in Vancouver, Dorothy Collins had to give him the once-over before he went lecturing. They had left Francis in Palos Verdes, as she wasn't very well. In 1904, we published a monograph on Watts, The Napoleon of Notting Hill, and an important chapter in a composite book, England a Nation. The Watts is among the results of Gilbert's art studies. Its reviewers admired it somewhat in the degree of their admiration for the painter. But for a young man at that date to have seen the principles of art he lays down meant rare vision. The portrait painter, he says, is trying to express the reality of the man himself, but he is not above taking hints from the Book of Life with its quaint old woodcuts. G.K. makes us see all the painter could have thought or imagined, and he sets us before Memon and Jonah and Hope and bids us read their legend and note the texture and the lines of the painting. His distinction between the Irish mysticism of Yeats and the English mysticism of Watts is especially valuable. In the book, perhaps even more than the Browning or the Dickens, manifests Gilbert's insight into the mind of the last generation. The depths and limitations of the Victorian outlook may be read in G.F. Watts. The story of the writing of the Napoleon was told to me in part by Francis, while part appeared in an interview given by Gilbert, in which he recalled it his first important book. Quoted in Chesterton by Cyril Clemens, pages 16 and 17. I was broke, only ten shillings in my pocket. Leaving my worried wife, I went down Fleet Street, got a shave, and then ordered for myself at the Chester Cheese an enormous luncheon of my favorite dishes and a bottle of wine. It took my all, but I could then go to my publishers fortified. I told them I wanted to write a book and outline the story of Napoleon of Notting Hill. I must have 20 pounds, I said, before I begin. We will send it to you on Monday. If you want the book, I replied, you will have to give it to me today, as I am disappearing to write it. They gave it. Francis, meanwhile, sat at home thinking, as she told me, hard thoughts of his disappearance with their only remaining coin. Then, dramatically, he appeared with 20 golden sovereigns and poured them into her lap. Referring to this incident later, Gilbert said, What a fool a man is when he comes to the last ditch, not to spend the last farthing to satisfy the inner man before he goes out to fight a battle of his wits. But it was his way to let the money shortage become acute, and then deal with it abruptly. Frank Swinterton relates that when, as a small boy, he was working for J.M. Dent, Gilbert appeared after office hours with a Dickens preface, but refused to leave it because Swinterton, the only soul left in the place, could not give him the agreed remuneration. The Napoleon is the story of a war between the London suburbs and grew largely from his meditations on the Boer War. 
Besides being the best of his fantastic stories, it contains the most picturesque account of Chesterton's social philosophy that he ever gave. But it certainly puzzles some of the critics. One American reviewer feels that he might have understood the book if he had an intimate knowledge of the history of the various boroughs of London and of their present-day characteristics. Others treat the story as a mere joke, and many feel that it is a bad descent after the Browning. Too infernally clever for anything, says one. Over on Quinn, King of England, chosen by lot, as are all kings and all other officials by the date of this story, which is a romance of the future, is one of the two heroes of this book. He is simply a sense of humor incarnate. His little elfish face and figure was recognized by old Pauline's as suggested by a form master of their youth, but by the entire reviewing world as Max Beerbohm. The illustrations by Graham Robertson were held to be unmistakably Max, Francis notes in her diary. A delightful dinner party at the Lanes. The talk was mostly about Napoleon. Max took me in to dinner. It was really nice. He is a good fellow. His costume was extraordinary. Why should an evening waistcoat have four large white pearl buttons, and why should he look that peculiar shape? He seems only pleased at the way he has been identified with King Oberon. All right, my dear chap, he said to G, who was trying to apologize? Mr. Lane, I settled it all at lunch. I think he was a little put out at finding no red carpet put down for his royal feet, and we had quite a discussion as to whether he ought to precede me into the dining room. Graham Robertson was on the left. He was jolly too, kept on producing wonderful rings and stones out of his pockets. He said he wished he could go about covered in the pieces of a chandelier. The other guests were Lady Seaton, Mrs. W.K. Clifford, Mr. W.W. Howells, and his daughter, to Vern Jonesy, to be really attractive, Mr. Taylor, police magistrate, and Mrs. Eichholz, Mrs. Lane's mother who is more beautiful than anything except a wee baby. In fact, she looks exactly like one, so dainty and small. She could never at any time have been as pretty as she is now. Gilbert and Max and I drove to his house, Max's, where he basely enticed us in. He gave me fearful preserved fruits, which ruined my dress, but he made himself very entertaining. Home, 1.30. Caring for nothing in the world but a joke, King Oberon decrees that the dull and respectable London boroughs shall be given city guards in resplendent armor. Each borough have its own coat of arms, its city walls, toxic and the like. The idea is taken seriously by the second hero, Adam Wayne of Notting Hill, an enthusiast utterly lacking any sense of humor who goes to war with the other boroughs of London to protect a small street which they have designed to pull down in the interests of commercial development. Pimlico, Kensington, and the rest attack Notting Hill. Men bleed and die in the contest, and by the magic of the sword, the old ideas of local patriotism and beauty and civic life return to England. The conventional politician, Barker, who begins the story in a frock coat and irreproachable silk hat, ends it clad in purple and gold. When Notting Hill, become imperial-minded, goes down to destruction in a sea of blood, Oberon Quinn confesses to Wayne that this whole story, so full of human tragedy and hopes and fears, had been merely the outcome of a joke. To him, all life was a joke, to Wayne, an epic, and this antagonism between the humorist and the fanatic has created the whole wild story. Wayne has the last word. I know something that will alter that antagonism, something that is outside us, something that you and I have all our lives, perhaps taken too little account of. The equal and eternal human being will alter that antagonism, for the human being sees no real antagonism between laughter and respect. The human being, the common man, whom mere geniuses like you and me can only worship like a god. When dark and dreary days come, you and I are necessary, the pure fanatic, the pure satirist. We have between us remedied a great wrong. We have lifted the modern cities into that poetry which everyone who knows mankind knows to be immeasurably more common than the commonplace. But in healthy people there is no war between us. 
We are but the two lobes of the brain of a plowman. Laughter and love are everywhere. The cathedrals, built in the ages that loved God, are full of blasphemous grotesques. The mother laughs continually at the child. The lover laughs continually at the lover. The wife at the husband. The friend at the friend. Oberon Quinn, we have been too long separated. Let us go out together. You have a halberd, and I have a sword. Let us start our wanderings over the world, for we are its two essentials. Come, it is already day. In the blank white light, Oberon hesitated a moment. Then he made a formal salute with his halberd, and they went away together into the unknown world. This is very important to the understanding of Chesterton. With him, profound gravity and exuberant fooling were always intermingled, and some of his deepest thoughts are conveyed by a pun. He always claimed to be intensely serious while hating to be solemn, and it was a mixture apt to be misunderstood. If gravity and humor are the two lobes of the average man's brain, the average man does not bring them into play simultaneously to anything like the extent that Chesterton did. Oberon Quinn and Adam Wayne are the most living individuals in any of his novels, just because they are the two lobes of his brain individualized. All his stories abound in adventure, are admirable in their vivid descriptions of London or the countryside of France or England seen in fantastic visions. They are living in the portrayal of ideas by the road of argument. But the characters are chiefly energies through whose lips Gilbert argues with Gilbert until some conclusion shall be reached. In 1905 came the Club of Queer Trades, least good of the Fantasia. And even admirers have begun to wonder if too many fields are being tried. In 1906, Dickens and Heretics. It will remain a moot point whether the Browning or the Dickens is Chesterton's best work of literary criticism. The Dickens is the more popular, largely because Dickens is the more popular author. Most Dickens idolaters read anything about their idol, if only for the pleasure of the quotations. And no Dickens idolater could fail to realize that here was one even more wrapped in worship than himself. After the publication of Charles Dickens, Chesterton undertook a series of prefaces to the novels. In one of them, he took the trouble to answer one only of the criticisms the book had produced. The comment that he was reading into the work of Dickens, something that Dickens did not mean. Criticism does not exist to say about authors the things that they knew themselves. It exists to say the things about them which they did not know themselves. If a critic says that the Iliad has a pagan rather than a Christian piety, or that it is full of pictures made by one epithet, of course he does not mean that Homer could have said that. If Homer could have said that, the critic would leave Homer to say it. The function of criticism that has a legitimate function at all, can only be one function, that of dealing with the subconscious part of the author's mind, which only the critic can express, and not with the conscious part of the author's mind, which the author himself can express. Either criticism is no good at all, a very defensible position, or else criticism means saying about the author the very things that would have made him jump out of his boots. Introduction to Old Curiosity Shop, reprinted in Criticisms and Appreciations of the Works of Charles Dickens, 1933 edition, pages 51 to 52. He attended not all to the crop of comments on his inaccuracies. One reviewer pointed out that Chesterton had said that every postcard Dickens wrote was a work of art, but Dickens died on June 9, 1870, and the first British postcard was issued October 1st. 1870. A wonderful instance of Dickens' never varying propensity to keep ahead of his age. After all, what did such things matter? Bernard Shaw, however, felt that they did. He wrote a letter from which I think Gilbert got an important hint, utilized later in his introduction to David Copperfield. 6th of September, 1906. Dear GKC, as I am a super saturated Dickensite, I pounced on your book and read it, as Wegg read Gibbon and other authors right slapped through. In view of a second edition, let me hastily note for you one or two matters. Firstly and chiefly, a fantastic and colossal howler in the best manner of Mrs. Nickleby 
and Flora Finchie. There is an association in your mind well-founded between the quarrel over Dickens's determination to explain his matrimonial difficulty to the public and the firm of Bradbury and Evans. There is also an association equally well-founded between B and E and Punch. They were the publishers of Punch. But to gravely tell the 20th century that Dickens wanted to publish his explanation in Punch is gas and gators carried to an incredible pitch of absurdity. The facts are B and E were the publishers of household words. They objected to Dickens explaining in H.W. He insisted. They said that in that case, they must take H.W. out of his hands. Dickens, like a lion threatened with ostracism by a louse in his tail, published his explanation, which stands to this day and informed his readers that they were to ask in future not for household words, but for all the year round. Household words left Dickens less gas for a few weeks and died all the year round in exactly the same format flourished and entered largely into the diet of my youth there is a curious contrast between dickens's sentimental indiscretions concerning his marriage and his sorrows and his quarrels and his impenetrable reserve about himself as displayed in his published correspondence. He writes to his family about waiters, about hotels, about screeching tumblers of hot brandy and water, and about the seasick man in the next berth. But never one really intimate word, never a real confession of the soul. David Copperfield is a failure as an autobiography because when he comes to deal with the grown-up David, you find that he has not the slightest intention of telling you the truth, or indeed anything about himself. Even the child David is more remarkable for the reserves than for the revelations. He falls back on fiction at every turn. Plenum and Pip are the real autobiographies. I find that Dickens is at his greatest after the social awakening which produced hard times. Little Dorrit is an enormous work. The change is partly the disillusion produced by the unveiling of capitalist civilization, but partly also Dickens' discovery of the gulf between himself as a man of genius and the public. That he did not realize this early is shown by the fact that he found out his wife, before he married her, as much too small for the job, and yet plumbed the difference so inadequately that he married her thinking he could go through with it. When the situation became intolerable, he must have faced the fact that there was something more than incompatibilities between him and the average man and woman. Little Dorrit is written, like all the later books, frankly and somewhat sadly, to own en bras. In them, Dickens recognizes that quite everyday men are as grotesque as Bunsby. Sparkler, one of the most extravagant of all of his gargoyles, is an untouched photograph almost. Wegg and Riderhood are sinister and terrifying because they are simply real, which Squeers and Sykes are not. And please remark that while Squeers and Sykes have their speeches written with anxious verisimilitude, comparatively, Wegg says, man shrouds and grapple, Mr. Venus, or she dies. And Riderhood describes Lightwood's sherry, when retracting his confession, as I will not say a hocused wine, but a wine as far from elfy for the mind. Dickens doesn't care what he makes Wegg and Riderhood or Sparkle or Mrs. F's aunt say because he knows them and he has got them and knows what matters and what doesn't. Fledgeby, Lamel, Jerry Cruncher, Trab's boy, Wopsle, etc., etc., are human beings as seen by a master. Swiveller and Mantellini are human beings as seen by Trab's boy. Sometimes Trab's boy has the happier touch. When I'm told young John Chivery, whose epitaphs you ignore whilst quoting Mrs. Sapsies, would have gone barefoot through the prison against rules for Little Dorrit, had it been paved with red-hot plowshares, I'm not so affected by his chivalry as by Swiveller's exclamation when he gets the legacy. For she, the Marchioness, shall walk in silk attire and silver eye to spare. Edwin Drood is no good in spite of the stone-throwing boy, Buzzard, and Honey Thunder. Dickens was a dead man before he began it. Collins corrupted him with plots. And oh, the Philistinism, the utter detachment from the great human heritage of art and philosophy. Why not a sermon on that? GBS. Note in the introduction to David Copperfield what G.K. says as to the break between the two halves of the book. 
He calls an instance of weariness in Dickens, a solitary instance. Is not Shaw's exclamation at once fascinating and probable? Kate Perugini, the daughter of Dickens, wrote two letters of immense enthusiasm about the book, saying it was the best thing written about her father since Forster's biography. But she shatters the theory put forth by Chesterton that Dickens thrown into intimacy with a large family of girls fell in love with them all and happened unluckily to marry the wrong sister. At the time of the marriage, her mother, the eldest of the sisters, was only 18. Married between 14 and 15, very young and childish in appearance. Georgina, 8, and Helen, 3. Nothing could better illustrate the clash between enthusiasm and despair that fills a Chestertonian while reading any of his literary biographies. For so much is built on this theory, which the slightest investigation would have shown to be baseless. Heretics aroused animosity in many minds. Dealing with Browning and Dickens, a man may encounter literary prejudices or enthusiasms, but there is not the intensity of feeling that he finds when he gets into the field with his own contemporaries. Reviewers, who had been extending a friendly welcome to a beginner, found that beginner attacking landmarks in the world of letters, venturing to detest Ibsen and to ask William Archer whether he hung up his stocking on Ibsen's birthday, accusing Kipling of lack of patriotism, it is said one angrily unbecoming to spend most of his time criticizing his contemporaries. His sense of mental perspective is an extremely deficient one. The manufacture of paradoxes is really one of the simplest processes conceivable. Mr. Chesterton's sententious wisdom. In fact, it was like the scene in the Napoleon of Notting Hill when most people present were purple with anger, but an intellectual few were purple with laughter. And even now, most of the reviewers seem not to understand where G.K. stood or what was his philosophy. Bernard Shaw says one, whom as a disciple, he naturally exalts. This after a series of books in which G.K. had exposed, with perfect lucidity and a wealth of examples, a view of life differing from Shaw's in almost every particular. One reviewer clearly discerned the influence of Shaw in the Napoleon of Notting Hill, but without a trace of Shaw's wonderful humor and perspicacity, Bellick's approval was hearty. He wrote, I am delighted with what I have read in the Daily Mail. Hit them again, hurt them. Continue to binge and accept my blessing. Give them hell. It is the only book of yours I have read right through, which shows that I don't read anything, which is true enough. This letter is written in the style of Herbert Paul. Continue to bang them about. You did wrong not to come to the South Coast. Margate is a fraud. What looks like sea in front of it is really a bank with hardly any water over it. I stuck on it once in the year 1904, so I know all about it. Moreover, the harbour at Margate is not a real harbour. Ramsgate, round the corner, has a real harbour on the true sea. In both towns are citizens not averse to bribes. Do not fail to go out in a boat on the last of the ebb as far as the long nose. There you will see the astonishing phenomenon of the tide racing down the North Foreland three hours before it has turned in the estuary of the Thames, which you at Margate foolishly believed to be the sea. Item, no one in Margate can cook. Gilbert was not really concerned in this book to bang his contemporaries about so much as to study their mistakes and so discover what was wrong with modern thought. Shaw, George Moore, Ibsen, Wells, the mildness of the yellow press, Omar and the sacred vine, Rudyard Kipling, smart novelists and the smart set, Joseph McCabe and the divine frivolity. The collection was a heterogeneous one. And in the introduction, the author tells us he is not concerned with any of these men as a brilliant artist or a vivid personality, but as a heretic. That is to say, a man whose view of things has the hardihood to differ from mine. is a man whose philosophy is quite solid, quite coherent, and quite wrong. I revert to the doctrinal methods of the 13th century, inspired by the general hope of getting something done. In England, a nation, and even more in the study of Kipling, in this book there is one touch of inconsistency which we shall meet again in his later work. He hated imperialism, yet he glorified Napoleon. Himself ardently patriotic, he accused Kipling of lack of patriotism on the ground that a man could not at once love England and love the empire. 
Or there was a curious note in the anti-imperialism of the Chester Belloc that has not always been recognized. The ordinary anti-imperialist holds that England has no right to govern an empire and that her leadership is bad for the other dominions. But the Chester Belloc view was that the dominions were inferior and unworthy of the European England. The phrase suburbs of England quoted in a later chapter was typical. But Kipling was thrilled by those suburbs, and Chesterton, who had as a boy admired Kipling, attacks him in heretics for lack of patriotism. Puck of Pook's Hill was not yet written, but like Kipling's poem on Sussex, it expressed a patriotism much akin to Gilbert's own. Remember the man who returned from the South African belt to be the squire's gardener? Me that have done what I've done, me that have seen what I've seen. That man, with eyes open to a sense of his own tragedy, was speaking for Chesterton's people of England, who have not spoken yet. Yes, they have spoken through the mouth of English genius, as Langland's Piers Plowman, as Dickens' Sam Weller, but not least as Kipling's Tommy Aitkins. It was a pity Chesterton was deaf to this last voice. With a better understanding of Kipling, he might in turn have made Kipling understand what was needed to make England marry England once again, have given him the philosophy that should make his genius fruitful. But the huge distinction between Chesterton and most of his contemporaries lay not in the wish to get something done, but in the conviction that the right philosophy alone could produce fruitful action. A parable in the introduction shows the point at which his thinking had arrived. Suppose that a great commotion arises in the street about something. Let us say a lamppost, which many influential persons desire to pull down. A grey-clad monk, who is the spirit of the Middle Ages, is approached upon the matter and begins to say in the arid manner of the schoolman, let us first of all consider, my brethren, the value of light. If light be in itself good, at this point he is somewhat excusably knocked down. All the people make a rush for the lamppost, the lamppost is down in ten minutes, and they go about congratulating each other on their unmedieval practicality. But as things go on, they do not work out so easily. Some people have pulled the lamppost down because they wanted the electric light, some because they wanted old iron, some because they wanted darkness, because their deeds were evil. Some thought it's not enough for a lamppost, some too much. Some acted because they wanted to smash municipal machinery, some because they wanted to smash something. And there is a war in the night, no man knowing whom he strikes. So gradually and inevitably, today, tomorrow, or the next day, there comes back the conviction that Monk was right after all. It all depends on what is the philosophy of light. Only what we might have discussed under the gas lamp, we now must discuss in the dark. Heretics, pages 22 to 23. Every year during this time at Battersea, the press books reveal an increasing flood of engagements. Gilbert lectures for the new Reform Club on political watchwords, for the Midland Institute on modern journalism, for the men's meeting of the South London Central Mission on brass bands, and for the London Association of Correctors of the Press at the Trocadero, or the CSU, at Churchkirk, Accrington, and at the men's service at the Colchester Moot Hall. He debates at the St. German's Literary Society, maintaining that the most justifiable wars are the religious wars, opens the Anti-Puritan League at the Shaftesbury Club, speaks for the Richmond and Kew branch of the PNEU on the romantic element of morality, for the Ilkley PSA on Christianity and materialism, and so on without end. All these are on a few pages of his father's collection, interspersed with clippings, recording articles, and reviews innumerable, introductions to books, interviews, and controversies. There was almost no element of choice in these engagements. G.K. was intensely good nature and hated saying no. He was the lion of the moment, and they all wanted him to roar for them. In spite of the large heading, lest we forget, that met his eye daily in the drawing room, he did forget a great deal. In fact, friends say he forgot any engagement made when Francis was not present to write it down. Directly, it was made. She had to do memory and all the practical side of life for him. There might have been one slight chance of making Gilbert responsible in these matters. That chance was given to his parents and by them thrown away. How far it is even possible to groom and train a genius is doubtful. Anyhow, no attempt was made. Waited on hand and foot by his mother, 
never made to wash or brush himself as a child, personally conducted to the tailor as he grew older, given by his parents no money for which to feel responsible, not made to keep hours, how could Francis take a man of 27 and make him over again? But there is, of course, a most genuine difficulty in all this, which Gilbert once touched on when he denied the accusation of absence of mind. It was, he claimed, presence of mind, honest thoughts, that made him unaware of much else. And indeed, no man can be using his mind furiously in every direction at once. Anyone who has done even a little creative work, anyone even who has lived with people who do creative work, knows the sense of bewilderment with which the mind comes out of the world of remoter but greater reality and tries to adjust with the daily world in which meals are to be ordered, letters answered, and engagements kept. What must this pain of adjustment not have been to a mind almost continuously creative? For I have never known anyone work such long hours with a mind at such tension as Gilbert's. There was no particular reason why he should have written his article for the Daily News as the reporter writes his, at top speed at a late hour, but he usually did. The writing of it was left till the last minute, and if at home, he would need Francis to get it off for him before the deadline was reached. But he often wrote by preference in Fleet Street, at the Cheshire Cheese or some little pub where journalists gathered, and then he would hire a cab to take the article a hundred yards or so to the Daily News office. The cab in those days was the Hansom, with its two huge wheels over which one perilously ascended, while the driver sat above, only to be communicated with by opening a sort of trap door in the roof. Gilbert once said that the imaginative Englishman in Paris would spend his days in a cafe, the imaginative Frenchman in London would spend his driving in a hansom. In Napoleon, the thought of the cab moves him to write. Poet whose cunning carved this amorous cell where twain may dwell. Evie Lucas, his daughter tells us, used to say that if one were invited to drive with Gilbert in a hansom cab, it would have to be two cabs. But this is not strictly true. For in those days, I drove with Gilbert and Francis to in a hansom, he and I side by side, she on his knee. We must have given to the populace the impression, he says, any hansom would give on first view to an ancient Roman or a simple barbarian, that the driver riding on high and flourishing his whip was a conqueror carrying off his helpless victims. Like the buffers at the veneering election, he spent much of his time taking cabs and getting a boat, and not even getting a boat in them, but leaving them standing at the door for hours on end. Calling on one publisher, he placed in his hands a letter that gave excellent reasons why he could not keep the engagement. The memory, so admirable in literary quotations, was not merely unreliable for engagements, but even for such matters as street numbers and addresses. Edward MacDonald, who worked with him later on GK's Weekly, relates how some months after the paper had changed its address, he failed one day to turn up at a board meeting. Finally, he appeared with an explanation. On calling a taxi at Marlbone, he realized that he could not give the address, so he told the driver to take him to Fleet Street. There, as his memory still refused to help, he stopped the taxi outside a tea shop, left it there while he was inside, and ordering a cup of tea, began to turn out all his pockets in the hope of finding a letter or proof bearing the address. Then, as no clue could be found, he told the driver to take him to a bookstall that stocked the paper. At the first and the second he drew blanks, but at the third bought a copy of his own paper and thus discovered the address. I'm not sure at what date he began to hate writing anything by hand. My mother treasured two handwritten letters. I have none after a friendship of close on 30 years, but I remember on his first visit to my parents' home in Surrey, his calling Francis that he might dictate an article to her. His writing was pictorial and rather elaborate. He drew his signature rather than writing, says Edward MacDonald, who remembers him saying as he signed the check, with many a curve my banks I fret. I wonder if Tennyson fretted his. At one of our earliest meetings, I asked him to write in my autograph book. It was at least five years before the ballad of White Horse appeared, but the lines may be found almost unchanged in the ballad. Verses made up in a dream, which you won't believe. People, if you have any prayers, say prayers for me. 
and bury me underneath a stone in the stones of Battersea. Bury me underneath the stone with the sword that was my own, to wait till the holy horn is blown and all poor men are free. The dream went on, he said, for pages and pages, and I think Francis was anxious, for the mind must find rest and sleep. The little flat at Battersea was a vortex of requests and engagements, broken promises and promises fulfilled. Author's ink and printer's ink, speeches in prospect and speeches in memory, meetings and social occasions. A sincere admirer wrote during this period of his fears of too great a strain on his hero, and from 1904 to 1908, the only change was an increase of pressure. I see that Chesterton has just issued a volume on the art of G.F. Watts. His novel was published yesterday. Soon his monograph on Kingsley should be ready. I believe he has a book on some modern aspects of religious belief in the press. He is part editor of the illustrated booklets on great authors issued by the bookman. He is contributing prefaces and introductions to odd volumes in several series of reprints. He is a constant contributor to the Daily News and the Speaker. He is conducting a public controversy with Blatchford of the Clarion on atheism and free thinking. He is constantly lecturing and debating and dining out. It is almost impossible to open a paper that does not contain either an article or review or poem or drawing of his, and his name is better known now to compositors than Bernard Shaw. Now, both physically and mentally, Chesterton is a Hercules, and from what I hear of his methods of work, he is capable of a great output without much physical strain. Nevertheless, it is clear, I think, to anyone, that at his present rate of production, he must either wear or tear. No man born can keep so many irons in the fire and not himself come between the hammer and the anvil. It is a pitiable thing to have a good man spend himself so recklessly, and I repeat once more that if he and his friends have not the will or power to restrain him, then there should be a conspiracy of editors and publishers in his favor. Not often is a man like Chesterton born. He should have his full chance, and that can only come by study and meditation by slow, steady accumulation of knowledge and wisdom. Shan F. Bullock in the Chicago Evening Post, 9th of April, 1906. In a volume made up of introductions written at this time to individual novels of Dickens, we find a passage that might well be Gilbert's summary of his own life. Calls upon him at this time were insistent and overwhelming. This necessarily happens at a certain stage of a successful writer's career. He was just successful enough to invite others and not successful enough to reject them. There was almost too much work for his imagination, and yet not quite enough work for his housekeeping. And it is a quite curious tribute to the quite curious greatness of Dickens that in this period of youthful strain, we do not feel the strain, but feel only the youth. His own amazing wish to write equaled or outstripped even his reader's amazing wish to read. Working too hard did not cure him of his abstract love of work. Unreasonable publishers asked him to write 10 novels at once, but he wanted to write 20 novels at once. Thus too with Gilbert. The first eight years of his married life saw in swift succession the publication of 10 books, comprising literary and art criticism and biography, poetry, fiction, or rather fantasy, light essays, and religious philosophy. All these were so full at once the profound seriousness of youth and of the bubbling wine of its high spirits as to recall another thing Gilbert said, that Dickens was accused of superficiality by those who cannot grasp that there is foam upon deep seas. That was the matter in dispute about himself, and very furiously disputed it, was during these years. Was G.K. serious or merely posing? Was he a great man or a mountebank? Was he clear or obscure? Was he a genius or a charlatan? Audacious reconciliation, he pleaded, or rather asserted, for his tone could seldom be called a plea. It is a mark not of frivolity, but of extreme seriousness. A man who deals in harmonies, who only matches stars with angels or lambs with spring flowers, he indeed may be frivolous, for he is taking one mood at a time, and perhaps forgetting each mood as it passes. But a man who ventures to combine an angel and an octopus must have some serious view of the universe. The man who should write a dialogue between two early Christians might be a mere writer of dialogues, but a man who should write a dialogue between an early Christian and a missing link 
would have to be a philosopher. The more widely different uh, the types talked of, the more serious and universal must be the philosophy which talks of them. The mark of the light and thoughtless writer is the harmony of his subject matter. The mark of a thoughtful writer is its apparent diversity. The most flippant lyric poet might write a pretty poem about lambs, but it requires something bolder and graver than a poet. It requires an ecstatic prophet to talk about the lion lying down with the lamb. G.K. Chesterton, Criticisms and Appreciations of the World of Charles Dickens, 1933, pages 68-69. A man starting to write a thesis on Chesterton's sociology once complained bitterly that almost none of his books were indexed, so he had to submit to the disgusting necessity of reading them all through, for some striking view on sociology might well be embedded in a volume of art criticism or be in the very center of a fantastic romance. Chesterton's was a philosophy universal and unified, and it was at this time growing fast and finding exceedingly varied techniques of expression. But the whole of it was, in a sense, in each of them, in each book, almost in each poem. As he himself says of the universe of Charles Dickens, there was something in it. There is in all great creative writers, like the account in Genesis, of the light being created before the sun, moon, and stars, the idea before the machinery that made it manifest. Pickwick is, in Dickens' career, the mere mass of light before the creation of sun or moon. It is the splendid, shapeless substance of which all the stars are ultimately made. And again, he said what he had to say, and yet not all he had to say. Wild pictures, possible stories, tantalizing and attractive trains of thought, perspectives of adventure crowded so continually upon his mind that at the end there was a vast mass of them left over. Ideas that he literally had not the opportunity to develop. Tales that he literally had not the time to tell. Recording by Candace Tuttle. Gilbert Keith Chesterton by Macy Ward. Chapter 12. Clearing the Ground for Orthodoxy. G.K. Chesterton, A Criticism, published anonymously in 1908, was a challenge thrown to the world of letters, for it demanded the recognition of Chesterton as a force to be reckoned with in the modern world. As its title implied, the book was by no means a tribute of sheer admiration and agreement. Gilbert was rebuked for that love of a pun or an effective phrase that sometimes led him into indefensible positions. It was hotly asked of him that he should abandon his unjust attitude toward Ibsen. He was accused of calling himself a liberal and being in fact a Tory. But even in differing from him, the book showed him as of real importance, not least in the sketch given of his life, and of the influences that had contributed to the formation of his mind. It did, too, another thing. It clarified his philosophical position for the world at large. For some time now, many had been demanding such a clarification. When G.K. attacked the utopia of Wells and of Shaw, both Wells and Shaw had been urgent in their demands that he should play fair by setting forth his own utopia. When he attacked the fundamental philosophy of G.S. Street, Mr. Street retorted that it would be time for him to worry about his philosophy when G.K.'s had been unfolded. G.K.'s retort to this was orthodoxy. G.K. Chesterton, A Criticism, far the best book that has ever been written about Chesterton, showed at last a mind that had really grasped his philosophy and could even have outlined his utopia. Perhaps this was the less surprising, as it ultimately turned out to have been written by his brother Cecil. I do not know at what stage Cecil revealed his authorship, but I remember that at first Francis told me only that they suspected Cecil, because it was from the angle of his opinions that the book criticized many of Gilbert's. However, I was at that date only an acquaintance, and the truth may still have been a family secret. At any rate, Cecil it was, and it is small wonder if after all those years of arguing, he understood something of the man with whom he had been measuring forces. But he did better than that. 
for he explained him to others without ever having to resort to these arguments, which after all were more or less private property. He explained G.K.'s general philosophy from the Napoleon, his ideas of cosmic good from the Wild Knight and the Man Who Was Thursday, which had just been published that same year, 1908. In this fantastic story, the group of anarchists, distinguished by being called after the days of the week, turn out, through a series of incredible adventures, to be all save one detectives in disguise. The gigantic figure of Sunday, before whom they all tremble, turns from the chief of the anarchists, chief of the destructive forces, into... what? The subtitle, A Nightmare, is needed, for Sunday would seem to be some wild vision, seen in dreams, not merely of forces of good, of sanity, of creation, but even of God himself. When almost twenty years later, The Man Who Was Thursday was adapted for the stage, Chesterton said in an interview, In an ordinary detective tale, the investigator discovers that some amiable-looking fellow, who subscribes to all the charities and is fond of animals, has murdered his grandmother, or is a trigamist. I thought it would be fun to make the tearing away of menacing masks reveal benevolence. Associated with that merely fantastic notion was the one that there is actually a lot of good to be discovered in unlikely places, that we who are fighting each other may be all fighting on the right side. I think it is quite true that it is just as well we do not, while the fight is on, know all about each other. The soul must be solitary or there would be no place for courage. A rather amusing thing was said by Father Knox on this point. He said that he should have regarded the book as entirely pantheist, and as preaching that there was good in everything, if it had not been for the introduction of the one real anarchist and pessimist. But he was prepared to wager that if the book survives for a hundred years, which it won't, they will say that the real anarchist was put in afterwards by the priests. But though I was more foggy about ethical and theological matters than I am now, I was quite clear on that issue, that there was a final adversary, and that you might find a man resolutely turned away from goodness. People have asked me whom I mean by Sunday. Well, I think, on the whole, and allowing for the fact that he is a person in a tale, I think you can take him to stand for nature, as distinguished from God. Huge, boisterous, full of vitality, dancing with a hundred legs, bright with the glare of the sun, and at first sight, somewhat regardless of us and our desires. There is a phrase used at the end spoken by Sunday, Can ye drink from the cup that I drink of? which seems to mean that Sunday is God. That is the only serious note in the book. The face of Sunday changes. You tear off the mask of nature, and you find God. Monsignor Knox has called The Man Who Is Thursday an extraordinary book, written as if the publisher had commissioned him to write something, rather like The Pilgrim's Progress, in the style of Pickwick Papers, which explains, perhaps, why some reviewers call it irreverent. The very wildness of it conveys a sense of thoughts, seething and straining, in an effort to express the inexpressible. Later, in his more definitely philosophical books, G.K. could say calmly, much that here he splashes, on a ten-leagued canvas with brushes of comet's hair, with all the violent directness of a vision. Of that vision, his brother began the interpretation in his challenging book. Reactions were interesting, for even those who wanted most ardently to say that Cecil's book should not have been written found that it was necessary to say it loudly and to say it at great length. Their very violence showed their sense of Chesterton as a peril even when they abused anyone who felt him to be important. It was not the kind of contempt that is really bestowed on the contemptible. 
The Academy expended more than two columns saying, we propose to deal with the quack and leave his sycophants and lick spittles to themselves. One skips him in numerous corners of third and fourth rate journals, e.g. the Illustrated London News, The Bookman, Daily News, and one avoids his books because they are always and inevitably a bore. Lancelot Bathurst had also dared to write of G.K. in his daily life as a journalist, so the article goes on. Let us kneel with the Honorable Lancelot at his greasy, burgundy-stained shrine. What time the jingling handsome waits us with its rolling occupant, and his sword stick, and his revolver, and his pocket stacked with penny dreadfuls. The fact is, we have in Mr. Chesterton the true product of the debauched halfpenny press. If the halfpenny press ceased to notice him forthwith, it seems to us more than probable that he would cease at once to be of the highest importance in literary circles, and the bishops and members of Parliament who have honored him with their kind notice would be compelled to drop him. Most of the reviews were very different from this one, which is certainly great fun, although some few other reviewers suggested that Gilbert himself wrote the criticism. I have wondered whether the Academy notices of his own books, all much like this, were written by a personal enemy, or merely by one of the jolly people, as he often called them who were maddened by his views. For some years now, Gilbert had been gathering in his mind the material for orthodoxy. Some of the ideas we have seen faintly traced in the notebook and the colored lambs, but they all grew to maturity in the atmosphere of constant controversy. In a controversy with the Reverend R.J. Campbell, we see, for instance, his convictions about the reality of sin shaping under our eyes. Discussing modernism in the nation, he analyzes the differences between the true development of an idea and the mere changing from one idea to another. Modernism claiming to be a development was actually an abandonment of the Christian idea. For the Catholic, this is among the most interesting of his controversies. In the course of it, he refers to the earlier works of Newman and the literature of the Oxford movement to support his view of the Anglican position. I have already said that Chesterton read far more than was usually supposed, because he read so quickly and with so little parade of learning. And it has been too lightly assumed that the statement in orthodoxy that he avoided works of Christian apologetic meant that he had not read any of the great Christian writers of the past. True, he was not then, or at any time, reading books of apologetic. He must, however, have been reading something more life-giving, as we learn from a single hint. Asked to draw up a scheme of reading for 1908 in G.K.'s Weekly, he suggests Butler's Analogy, Coleridge's Confessions of an Inquiring Spirit, Newman's Apologia, St. Augustine's Confessions, and the Summa, of St. Thomas Aquinas. It was absurd, he said in this article, to suppose that the ancients did not see our modern problems. The truth was that the great ancients not only saw them, but saw through them. Butler had sketched the real line along which Christianity must ultimately be defended. These great writers all remained modern, while the new theology takes one back to the time of crinolines. I almost expect to see Mr. R.J. Campbell in peg-top trousers with very long side whiskers. In this controversy, although not yet a Catholic, he showed the gulf between the modernist theory of development and the Newman doctrine with a clarity greater than any Catholic writer of the time. A man who is always going back and picking to pieces his own first principles may be having an amusing time, but he is not developing as Newman understood development. Newman meant that if you wanted a tree to grow, you must plant it finally in some definite spot. It may be, I do not know and I do not care, 
that Catholic Christianity is just now passing through one of its numberless periods of undue repression and silence. But I do know this, that when the great powers break forth again, the new epics and the new arts, they will break out on the ancient and living tree. They cannot break out upon the little shrubs that you are always pulling up by the roots to see if they are growing. Against R.J. Campbell, he showed in a lecture on Christianity and social reform how belief in sin, as well as in goodness, was more favorable to social reform than was the rather woolly optimism that refused to recognize evil. The nigger driver will be delighted to hear that God is imminent in him, the sweater that he has not in any way become divided from the supreme perfection of the universe. If the new theology would not lead to social reform, the social utopia to which the philosophy of Wells and of Shaw was pointing seemed to Chesterton not a heaven on earth to be desired, but a kind of final hell to be avoided, since it banished all freedom and human responsibility. Arguing with them was again highly fruitful, and two subjects he chose for speeches are suggested. The terror of tendencies, and shall we abolish the inevitable? In the New Age, Shaw wrote about Belloc and Chesterton, and so did Wells, while Chesterton wrote about Wells and Shaw, till the Philistines grew angry, called it self-advertisement and log-rolling, and urged that a bill for the abolition of Shaw and Chesterton should be introduced into Parliament. But G.K. had no need for advertisement of himself, or his ideas just then. He had a platform. He had an eager audience. Every week, he wrote in the Illustrated London News, beginning in 1905, to do Our Notebook. This continued till his death in 1936. He was still writing every Saturday in the Daily News. Publishers were disputing for each of his books. Yet he rushed into every religious controversy that was going on, because thereby he could clarify and develop his ideas. The most important of all these was the controversy with Blatchford, editor of The Clarion, who had written a rationalist credo entitled God and My Neighbor. In 1903-4, he had the generosity and the wisdom to throw open The Clarion to the freest possible discussion of his views. The Christian attack was made by a group of which Chesterton was the outstanding figure, and was afterwards gathered into a paper volume called The Doubts of Democracy. One essay in this volume, written in 1903, is of primary importance in any study of the sources of orthodoxy, for it gives a brilliant outline of one of the main contentions of the book, and shows even better than orthodoxy itself what he meant by saying that he had first learnt Christianity from its opponents. It is clear that by now he believed in the divinity of Christ. The pamphlet itself has fallen into oblivion, and Chesterton's share of it was only three short essays. I think it well to quote a good deal from the first of these, because in it he has put in concentrated form and with different illustrations what he developed five years later. There is nothing more packed with thought in the whole of his writings than these essays. The first of all the difficulties that I have in controverting Mr. Blatchford is simply this, that I shall be very largely going over his own ground. My favorite textbook of theology is God and My Neighbor, but I cannot repeat it in detail. If I give each of my reasons for being a Christian, a vast number of them, would be Mr. Blatchford's reasons for not being one. For instance, Mr. Blatchford and his school point out that there are many myths parallel to the Christian story, that there were pagan Christs, and Red Indian incarnations, and Patagonian crucifixions, for all I know or care. But does not Mr. Blatchford see the other side of the fact? If the Christian God really made the human race, would not the human race tend to rumors and perversions of the Christian God? If the center of our life is a certain fact, 
Would not people far from the center have a muddled version of that fact? If we were so made that a son of God must deliver us, is it odd that Patagonians should dream of a son of God? The Blatchfordian position really amounts to this, that because a certain thing has impressed millions of different people as likely or necessary, therefore it cannot be true. And then this bashful being, veiling his own talents, convicts the wretched GKC of paradox. The story of a Christ is very common in legend and literature. So is the story of two lovers parted by fate. So is the story of two friends killing each other for a woman. But will it seriously be maintained that because these two stories are common as legends, therefore no two friends were ever separated by love or no two lovers by circumstances? It is tolerably plain, surely, that these two stories are common because the situation is an intensely probable and human one, because our nature is so built as to make them almost inevitable. Thus, in this first instance, when learned skeptics come to me and say, are you aware that the Kafirs have a sort of incarnation? I should reply, speaking as an unlearned person, I don't know. But speaking as a Christian, I should be very much astonished if they hadn't. Take a second instance. The secularist says that Christianity has been a gloomy and ascetic thing and points to the procession of austere or ferocious saints who have given up home and happiness and macerated health and sex. But it never seems to occur to him that the very oddity and completeness of these men's surrender make it look very much as if there were really something actual and solid in the thing for which they sold themselves. They gave up all pleasures for one pleasure of spiritual ecstasy. They may have been mad, but it looks as if there really were such a pleasure. They gave up all human experiences for the sake of one superhuman experience. They may have been wicked, but it looks as if there were such an experience. It is perfectly tenable that this experience is as dangerous and selfish a thing as drink. A man who goes ragged and homeless in order to see visions may be as repellent and immoral as a man who goes ragged and homeless in order to drink brandy. That is a quite reasonable position. But what is manifestly not a reasonable position, what would be, in fact, not far from being an insane position, would be to say that the raggedness of the man and the stupefied degradation of the man proved that there was no such thing as brandy. That is precisely what the secularist tries to say. He tries to prove that there is no such thing as supernatural experience by pointing at the people who have given up everything for it. He tries to prove that there is no such thing by proving that there are people who live on nothing else. Again, I may submissively ask, whose is the paradox? Take a third instance. The secularist says that Christianity produced tumult and cruelty. He seems to suppose that this proves it to be bad, but it might prove it to be very good. For men commit crimes not only for bad things, far more often for good things. For no bad things can be desired quite so passionately and persistently as good things can be desired. And only very exceptional men desire very bad and unnatural things. Most crime is committed because, owing to some peculiar complication, very beautiful or necessary things are in some danger. And when something is set before mankind that is not only enormously valuable, but also quite new, the sudden vision, the chance of winning it, the chance of losing it, drive them mad. It has the same effect in the moral world that the finding of gold has in the economic world. It upsets values and creates a kind of cruel rush. We need not go far for instances quite apart from the instances of religion. 
When the modern doctrines of brotherhood and liberality were preached in France in the 18th century, the time was ripe for them. The educated classes everywhere had been growing towards them. The world, to a very considerable extent, welcomed them. And yet all that preparation and openness were unable to prevent the burst of anger and agony which greets anything good. And if the slow and polite preaching of rational fraternity in a rational age ended in the massacres of September, what an a fortiori is here. What would be likely to be the effect of the sudden dropping into a dreadfully evil century of a dreadfully perfect truth? What would happen if a world baser than the world of Sade were confronted with a gospel purer than the gospel of Rousseau? The mere flinging of the polished pebble of republican idealism into the artificial lake of 18th century Europe produced a splash that seemed to splash the heavens and a storm that drowned 10,000 men. What would happen if a star from heaven really fell into the slimy and bloody pool of a hopeless and decaying humanity? Men swept a city with the guillotine, a continent with a saber, because liberty, equality, and fraternity were too precious to be lost. How if Christianity was yet more maddening because it was yet more precious? But why should we labor the point when one who knew human nature as it can really be learned from fishermen and women and natural people saw from his quiet village the track of this truth across history? And in saying that he came to bring not peace but a sword, set up eternally his colossal realism against the eternal sentimentality of the secularist. Thus then, in the third instance, when the learned skeptic says, Christianity produced wars and persecutions, we shall reply, naturally. And lastly, let me explain an example which leads me on directly to the general matter I wish to discuss for the remaining space of the articles at my command. The secularist constantly points out that the Hebrew and Christian religions began as local things, that their god was a tribal god, that they gave him material form, and attached him to particular places. This is an excellent example of one of the things that if I were conducting a detailed campaign, I should use as an argument for the validity of biblical experience. For if there really are some other and higher beings than ourselves, and if they, in some strange way, at some emotional crisis, really revealed themselves to rude poets or dreamers in very simple times, that these rude people should regard the revelation as local and connect it with the particular hill or river where it happened, seems to me exactly what any reasonable human being would expect it has a far more credible look than if they had talked cosmic philosophy from the beginning. If they had, I should have suspected priestcraft and forgeries and third century Gnosticism. If there be such a being as God and he can speak to a child, and if God spoke to a child in the garden, the child would of course say that God lived in the garden. I should not think it any less likely to be true for that. If the child said, God is everywhere, an impalpable essence, pervading and supporting all constituents of the cosmos alike. If, I say, the infant addressed me in the above terms, I should think he was much more likely to have been with the governess than with God. So if Moses had said, God was an infinite energy, I should be certain he had seen nothing extraordinary. As he said he was a burning bush, I think it very likely that he did see something extraordinary. For whatever be the divine secret, and whether or no it has, as people have believed, sometimes broken bounds and surged into our world, at least it lies on the side furthest away from pedants and their definitions, 
and nearest to the silver souls of quiet people, to the beauty of bushes, and the love of one's native place. Thus then, in our last instance, out of hundreds that might be taken, we conclude in the same way. When the learned skeptics say, the visions of the Old Testament were local and rustic and grotesque, we shall answer, of course, they were genuine. Thus, as I said at the beginning, I find myself, to start with, face to face with the difficulty that to mention the reasons that I have for believing in Christianity is, in very many cases, simply to repeat those arguments which Mr. Blatchford, in some strange way, seems to regard as arguments against it. His book is really rich and powerful. He has undoubtedly set up these four great guns of which I have spoken. I have nothing to say against the size and ammunition of the guns. I only say that by some strange accident of arrangement, he has set up those four pieces of artillery, pointing at himself. If I were not so humane, I should say, Gentlemen of the Secularist Guard, fire first. He goes on in the next essay to talk of the positive arguments for Christianity, of this religious philosophy which was and will be again the study of the highest intellects and the foundation of the strongest nations, but which our little civilization has for a while forgotten. Very briefly, he then deals with determinism and free will, the need for the supernatural, and the question of the fall. Dealing with the fall, he uses one of his most brilliant illustrations. We speak, he says, of a manly man, but not of a whaley whale. If you want to dissuade a man from drinking his tenth whiskey, you would slap him on the back and say, Be a man! No one who wished to dissuade a crocodile from eating his tenth explorer would slap it on the back and say, Be a crocodile! For we have no notion of a perfect crocodile, no allegory of a whale expelled from his whaley Eden. Continuing the swift sketch of some elements of Christian theology, Chesterton next deals with miracles. While the development in orthodoxy makes this section look very slight, there are passages that make one realize the mental wealth of a man who could afford to leave them behind and rush on. Blatchford had said that no English judge would accept the evidence for the resurrection, and G.K. answers that possibly Christians have not all got such an extravagant reverence for English judges as is felt by Mr. Blatchford himself. The experiences of the founder of Christianity have perhaps left us in a vague doubt of the infallibility of courts of law. In reference to the many rationalists whose refusal to accept any miracle is based on the fact that experience is against it, he says, There was a great Irish rationalist of this school who, when he was told that a witness had seen him commit a murder, said that he could bring a hundred witnesses who had not seen him commit it. The final essay on the eternal heroism of the slums has two main points. It begins with an acknowledgement of the crimes of Christians, only pointing out that while Mr. Blatchford outlaws the church for this reason, he is prepared to invoke the state whose crimes are far worse. But the most vigorous part of the essay is a furious attack on determinism. Blatchford apparently held that bad surroundings inevitably produce bad men. Chesterton had seen the heroism of the poor in the most evil surroundings and was furious at this association of vice with poverty, the vilest and the oldest and the dirtiest of all the stories that insolence has ever flung against the poor. Men can and do lead heroic lives in the worst of circumstances because there is in humanity a power of responsibility. There is free will. Blatchford, in the name of humanity, is attacking the greatest of human attributes. More numerous than can be counted 
in all the wars and persecutions of the world, men have looked out of their little grated windows and said, at least my thoughts are free. No, no, says the face of Mr. Blatchford, suddenly appearing at the window. Your thoughts are the inevitable result of heredity and environment. Your thoughts are as material as your dungeons. Your thoughts are as mechanical as the guillotine. So pants this strange comforter from cell to cell. I suppose Mr. Blatchford would say that in his utopia, nobody would be in prison. What do I care whether I am in prison or no, if I have to drag chains everywhere? A man in his utopia may have, for all I know, free food, free meadows, his own estate, his own palace. What does it matter? He may not have his own soul. An architect once discoursed to me on the need of humility in face of the material, the stone and marble of his building. Thus, Chesterton was humble before the reality he was seeking to interpret. Pride he wants to find as the falsification of fact by the introduction of self. To learn, a man must subtract himself from the study of any solid and objective thing. This humility he had in a high degree, and also that rarer humility, which saw his friends and opponents alike as intellectual equals. Almost anybody, Monsignor Knox once said, was an ordinary person compared with him. But this was an idea that certainly never occurred to him. The philosophy shaping into orthodoxy was stimulated by newspaper controversy, and also by the talk in which Gilbert always delighted. As I have noted, he loved to listen, and he was a little slow in getting off the mark with his own contribution. Many years later, an American interviewer described him, when he did get going, as answering questions in brief essays. Frank Swinnerton has admirably described the manner of speech so well remembered by his friends. His speech is prefaced and accompanied by a curious sort of humming, such as one may hear when glee singers give each other the note before starting to sing. He pronounces the word I without egotism, as if it were I and drawls not in the highly gentlemanly manner which Americans believe to be the English accent, and which many English call the Oxford accent, but in a manner peculiar to himself, either attractive or the reverse, according to one's taste. To me, attractive. Even more attractive to most of us was his fashion of making us feel that we had contributed something very worthwhile. He would take something one had said and develop it till it shone and glowed, not from its own worth, but from what he had made of it. Almost anything could thus become a starting point for a train of his best thought. And the style disliked by some in his writings was so completely the man himself that it was the same in conversation as in his books. He would approach a topic from every side throwing light on those contradictory elements that made a paradox. He himself had what he attributes to St. Thomas, that instantaneous presence of mind, which alone really deserves the name of wit. Asked once the traditional question what single book he would choose if cast on a desert island, he replied, Thomas's Guide to Practical Shipbuilding. In talk, as in his books, G.K. loved to play upon words, and sometimes, of course, this was merely a matter of words, and the puns were bad ones. Once, for instance, after translating the French phrase for playing truant as, he goes to the bushy school, or the school among the bushes, he adds, not lightly to be confounded with the art school at bushy. This is indefensible, but rare. Christopher Morley has noted how his play upon words often led to a genuine play upon thoughts. One of Chesterton's best pleasantries was his remark on the so-called emancipation of women. Twenty million young women rose to their feet with the cry, we will not be dictated to, 
and proceeded to become stenographers. He complained in a review of a novel, Every modern man is an atlas carrying the world, and we are introduced to a new cosmos with every new character. Each man has to be introduced, accompanied by his cosmos, like a jealous wife, or on the principle of love me, love my dogma. Each of Chesterton's readers can think of a hundred instances of this inspired fooling. Many have been given in this book, and many will yet be given. But the thing went far deeper than fooling. It has been compared by Mr. Belloc to the gospel parables as a method of teaching and of illumination. He made men see what they had not seen before. He made them know. He was an architect of certitude whenever he practiced the art in which he excelled. Belloc's analysis of this special element of Chesterton's style, alike written and spoken, is of first-rate importance to an understanding of the man whose mind at this date was still rapidly developing, while his method of expression had become what it remained to the end of his life. His unique, his capital genius for illustration by parallel, by example, is his peculiar mark. The word peculiar is here the operative word. No one whatsoever that I can recall in the whole course of English letters had his amazing, I would almost say superhuman, capacity for parallelism. Now parallelism is a gift or method of vast effect in the conveyance of truth. Parallelism consists in the illustration of some unperceived truth by its exact consonance with the reflection of a truth already known and perceived. Whenever Chesterton begins a sentence with, it is as though, in exploding a false bit of reasoning, you may expect a stroke of parallelism as vivid as a lightning flash. Always, in whatever manner he launched the parallelism, he produced the shock of illumination. He talked. Parallelism was so native to his mind, it was so naturally a fruit of his mental character, that he had difficulty in understanding why others did not use it with the same lavish facility as himself. I can speak here with experience, for in these conversations with him, or listening to his conversation with others, I was always astonished at an ability in illustration which I not only have never seen equaled, but cannot remember to have seen attempted. He never sought such things. They poured out from him as easily as though they were not the hard forged product of intense vision, but spontaneous remarks. To return to the Blatchford controversy, a final point of interest is a psychological one. G.K. admits his difficulty in using in his arguments the reverent solemnity of the agnostic. He realizes that he is thought flippant because he is amusing on a subject where he is more certain than of the existence of the moon. Christianity is itself so jolly a thing that it fills the possessor of it with a certain silly exuberance which sad and high-minded rationalists might reasonably mistake for mere buffoonery. But if this is his own psychology, he faces too the special difficulty of theirs. The main and towering barrier that he wished, but hardly hoped, to surmount. He was the first person, I think, to see that free thought was no longer a young movement, but old, and even fossilized. It had formed minds which were now too set to be altered. It had its own dogmas and its own most rigid orthodoxy. You are armed to the teeth, he told the readers of the Clarion, and buttoned up to the chin with the great agnostic orthodoxy, perhaps the most placid and perfect of all the orthodoxies of men. I approach you with the reverence and the courage due to a bench of bishops. The Clarion controversy was, as we have seen, in 1903 and 1904, when Chesterton was approaching 30. Others of those I have mentioned come later, but I don't think any, or even all of them, 
fully explain the depth and riches of orthodoxy. Chapter 13 of Gilbert Keith Chesterton Recording by Larry Wilson Gilbert Keith Chesterton by Maisie Ward Orthodoxy Philosophy is either eternal or it is not philosophy. A cosmic philosophy is not constructed to fit a man. A cosmic philosophy is constructed to fit a cosmos. A man can no more possess a private religion than he can possess a private sun and moon. Introduction to the Book of Job Because orthodoxy is supremely Chesterton's own history of his mind, more must be said of it than of his other published works. For this book is the life of a man, and a man is his mind. The notebook shows him thinking and feeling in his youth exactly on the lines that he recalled. But they were only lines, in fact an outline. The richness of life was needed, the richness of thought to turn the outline into the masterpiece. No man, not even Chesterton, could have written orthodoxy at the age of 20. It was sufficiently remarkable that he should have written it at 35. But only a man who had been thinking along those lines at 20, and much earlier, could have written it at all. For the book is, as he says, a sort of slovenly autobiography. It is not so much an argument for orthodoxy as the story of how one man discovered orthodoxy as the only answer to the riddle of the universe. In an interview given shortly after its publication, Gilbert told of a temptation that had once been his and which he had overcome, almost before he realized he had been tempted. The temptation was to become a prophet like all the men in heretics, by emphasizing one aspect of truth and ignoring the other. To do this would, he knew, bring him a great crowd of disciples. He had a vision, which constantly grew wider and deeper, of the many-sided unity of truth. But he saw that all the prophets of the age, from Walt Whitman and Schopenhauer to Wells and Shaw, had become so by taking one side of the truth and making it all of the truth. It is so much easier to see and magnify a part than laboriously to strive to embrace the whole. A sage feels too small for life, and a fool too large for it. Not that he condemned as fools the able men of his generation. For Wells he had a great esteem, for Shaw a greater. Whitman he had in his youth almost idolized. But increasingly he recognized even Whitman as representing an idea that was too narrow because it was only an aspect. There was not room in Whitman's philosophy for some of the facts he had already discovered, and he felt he had not yet completed his journey. He must not, for the sake of being a prophet and having a following sacrifice, I will not say a truth already found, but a truth that might still be lurking somewhere. He could not be the architect of his own intellectual universe any more than he had been the creator of sun, moon, and earth. God and humanity made it, he said, of the philosophy he discovered, and it made me. He had begun in boyhood, as we have seen, by realizing that the world as depicted in fairy tales was saner and more sensible than the world is seen by the intellectuals of his own day. These men had lost the sense of life's value. They spoke of the world as a vast place governed by iron laws of necessity. Chesterton felt in it the presence of will, while the mere thought of vastness was to him about as cheerful a conception as that of a jail that should with its cold empty passages cover half the county. These expanders of the universe had nothing to show us except more than the infinite corridors of space lit by ghastly suns and empty of all that was divine. Quote, These people professed that the universe was one coherent thing, but they were not fond of the universe. But I was frightfully fond of the universe, and I wanted to address it by diminutive. I often did so, and it never seemed to mind. Actually, and in truth, I did feel that these dim dogmas of vitality were better expressed by calling the world small than by calling it large. For about infinity there was a sort of carelessness which was the reverse of the fierce and pious care which I felt touching the pricelessness and the peril of life. They showed only a dreary waste. 
but I felt a sort of sacred thrift. For economy is far more romantic than extravagance. To them, stars are an unending income of halfpence. But I felt about the golden sun and the silver moon as a schoolboy feels if he has one sovereign and one shilling. These subconscious convictions are best hit off by the color and tone of certain tales. Thus I have said that stories of magic alone can express my sense that life is not only a pleasure, but a kind of eccentric privilege. I may express this other feeling of cosmic coziness by allusion to another book always read in boyhood, Robinson Crusoe, which I read about this time and which owes its eternal vivacity to the fact that it celebrates the poetry of limits, nay, even the wild romance of prudence. Crusoe is a man on a small rock with a few comforts just snatched from the sea. The best thing in the book is simply the list of things saved from the wreck. The greatest of poems is an inventory. I really felt, the fancy may seem foolish, as if all the order and number of things were the romantic remnant of Crusoe's ship. That there are two sexes and one son was like the fact that there are two guns and one axe. It was poignantly urgent that none should be lost, but somehow it was rather fun that none could be added. The trees and the planets seemed like things saved from the wreck, and when I saw the Matterhorn, I was glad that it had not been overlooked in the confusion. I felt economical about the stars, as if they were sapphires. They are called so Milton Eden. I hoarded the hills, for the universe is a single jewel, and while it is natural cant to talk of a jewel as peerless and priceless, of this jewel it is literally true. This cosmos is indeed without peer and without price, for there cannot be another one. Unquote. Orthodoxy, chapter 4, pages 112 to 15. A fragment of an essay on Hans Andersen that cannot be later than the age of 17 shows Gilbert trying to shape part of what he calls here the ethics of Elfland. But a large part was, as he says, subconscious. In this chapter, he sums up the results of musings about the universe begun so long ago. Small wonder that he had seemed to sleep over his lessons while he was seeing these visions and dreaming these dreams, which after every effort to tell them, he still knows remains half untold. Quote, the attempt to utter the unutterable things. These are my ultimate attitudes towards life, the soils for the seeds of doctrine. These in some dark way I thought before I could write, and felt before I could think, and we may proceed more easily afterwards. I will roughly recapitulate them now. I felt in my bones first that this world does not explain itself. It may be a miracle with a supernatural explanation. It may be a conjuring trick with a natural explanation. But the explanation of the conjuring trick, if it is to satisfy me, will have to be better than the natural explanations I have heard. The thing is magic, true or false. Second, I came to feel as if magic must have a meaning, and meaning must have someone to meet it. There was something personal in the world, as in a work of art. Whatever it meant, it meant violence. Third, I thought this purpose beautiful in its old design, in spite of its defects, such as dragons. Fourth, that the proper form of thanks to it is some form of humility and restraint. We should thank God for beer and burgundy by not drinking too much of them. We owed also an obedience to whatever made us. At last, and strangest, there had come into my mind a vague and vast impression that in some way all good was a remnant to be stored and held sacred out of some primordial ruin. Man had saved his good as Crusoe saved his goods. He had saved them from a wreck. All this I felt, and the age gave me no encouragement to feel it. And all the time I had not even thought of Christian theology. Unquote. Orthodoxy, chapter 4, pages 155 to 6. This theology came with the answers to all the tremendous questions asked by life. Here the convert has one great advantage over the Catholic brought up in the faith. Most of us hear the answers before we have asked the questions. Hence, intellectually, we lack what G.K. calls the soils for the seeds of doctrine. It is nearly impossible to understand an answer to a question you have not formulated. 
and without the sense of urgency that an insistent question brings, many people do not even try. All the years of his boyhood and early manhood, Chesterton was facing the fundamental questions and hammering out his answers. At first, he had no thought of Christianity as even a possible answer. Growing up in a world called Christian, he fancied it a philosophy that had been tried and found wanting. It was only as he realized that the answers he was finding for himself always fitted into, were always confirmed by, the Christian view of things, that he began to turn towards it. He sees a good deal of humor in the ways he strained his voice in a painfully juvenile attempt to utter his new truths, only to find that they were not his and were not new, but were part of an eternal philosophy. In the chapter called The Flag of the World, he tells of the moment when he discovered the confirmation and reinforcing of his own speculations by the Christian theology. The point at which this came concerned his feelings about the men of his youth, who labeled themselves optimist and pessimist. Both, he felt, were wrong. It must be possible at once to love and to hate the world, to love it more than enough to get on with it, to hate it enough to get it on. And the church solved this difficulty by her doctrine of creation and of original sin. Quote, God had written not so much a poem, but rather a play, a play he had planned as perfect, but which had necessarily been left to human actors and stage managers who had since made a great mess of it, Unquote. As to that mess, the Christian could be as pessimist as he liked. As to the original design, he must be optimist, for it was his work to restore it. St. George could still fight the dragon. If he were as big as the world, he could yet be killed in the name of the world. Quote, and then followed an experience impossible to describe. It was as if I had been blundering about since my birth with two huge and unmanageable machines of different shapes and without apparent connection. The world and the Christian tradition. I had found this hole in the world, the fact that one must somehow find a way of loving the world without trusting it. Somehow one must love the world without being worldly. I found this projecting feature of Christian theology like a sort of hard spike, the dogmatic insistence that God was personal and had made a world separate from himself. The spike of dogma fitted exactly into the hole in the world. It had evidently been meant to go there. And then the strange thing began to happen. When once these two parts of the two machines had come together, one after another, all the other parts fitted and fell in with an eerie exactitude. I could hear bolt after bolt over all the machinery, falling into its place with a kind of click of relief. Having got one part right, all the other parts were repeating that rectitude, as clock after clock strikes noon. Instinct after instinct was answered by doctrine after doctrine. Or, to vary the metaphor, I was like one who had advanced into a hostile country to take one high fortress, and when that fort had fallen, the whole country surrendered and turned solid behind me. The whole land was lit up, as it were, back to the first fields of my childhood. All those blind fancies of boyhood, which in the fourth chapter I had tried in vain to trace on the darkness, became suddenly transparent and sane. I was right when I felt that I would almost rather say that grass was the wrong color than say that it must by necessity have been that color. It might verily have been any other. My sense that happiness hung in the crazy thread of a condition did not mean something when all was said. It meant the whole doctrine of the fall, even those dim and shapeless monsters of notions which I have not been able to describe much less defend, step quietly into their places like colossal caryatides of the creed. The fancy that the cosmos was not vast and void, but small and cozy, had a fulfilled significance now, for anything that is a work of art must be small in sight of the artist. To God the stars might be only small and dear, like diamonds, and my haunting instinct that somehow good was not merely a tool to be used, but a relic to be guarded, like the goods from Crusoe's ship. Even that had been the wild whisper of something originally wise, for according to Christianity, we were indeed the survivors of a wreck, 
the crew of a golden ship that had gone down before the beginning of the world. Unquote. Orthodoxy, Chapter 5, pages 142-44. In the chapter called The Paradoxes of Christianity, the richness of his mind is most manifest, and in that chapter can best be seen what Mr. Belloc meant when he told me Chesterton's style reminded him of St. Augustine's. Talking over with an old schoolfellow of his list of books he had, as we have seen, drawn up for T.P.'s Weekly, I discovered deep doubt as to whether Gilbert would really have read these books, as most of us understand them, combined with the conviction that he would have got out of them at a glance more than most of us by prolonged study. I have certainly never known anyone his equal at what the schoolboy calls degutting a book. He did not seem to study an author, yet he certainly knew him. But it remained that his own mind, reflecting and experiencing, made of his own life his greatest storehouse. So that in all this book there was, as my father pointed out in the Dublin Review at the time, an intensely original new light cast on the eternal philosophy about which so much had already been written. The discovery specially needed, perhaps, for his own age was that Christianity represented a new balance that constituted a liberation. The ancient Greek or Roman had aimed at equilibrium by enforcing moderation and getting rid of extremes. Christianity made moderation out of the still crash of two impetuous emotions. It got over the difficulty of combining furious opposites by keeping them both and keeping them both furious. Quote, the more I considered Christianity, the more I felt that while it had established a rule and order, the chief aim of that order was to give room for good things to run wild. Unquote. Thus, inside Christianity, the pacifist could become a monk, and the warrior a crusader. St. Francis could praise good more loudly than Walt Whitman, and St. Jerome denounce evil more darkly than Schopenhauer. But both the motions must be kept in their place. I remember how George Wyndham laughed as he recited to us the paragraph where this idea reached its climax. Quote, And sometimes this pure gentleness and this pure fierceness met and justified their juncture. The paradox of all the prophets was fulfilled, and in the soul of St. Louis the line lay down with the lamb. But remember that this text is too lightly interpreted. It is constantly assumed, especially by our Tolstoyan tendencies, that when the lion lies down with the lamb, the lion becomes lamb-like. But that is brutal annexation and imperialism on the part of the lamb. That is simply the lamb absorbing the lion instead of the lion eating the lamb. The real problem is, can the lion lie down with the lamb and still retain its royal ferocity? That is the problem the church attempted. That is the miracle she achieved." Unquote. Orthodoxy, Chapter 6, pages 178-79. to 79. All this applied not only to the release of the emotions and development of all the elements that go to make up humanity, but even more to the truths of revelation. A heresy always means lopping off a part of the truth, and therefore ultimately a loss of liberty. Orthodoxy, in keeping the whole truth, safeguarded freedom and prevented any one of the great and devouring ideas she was teaching from swallowing any other truth. This was the justification of councils, of definitions, even of persecutions and wars of religion, that they had stood for the defense of reason as well as of faith. They had stood to prevent the suicide of thought, which must result if the exciting but difficult balance were lost that had replaced the classical moderation. Quote, the church could not afford to swerve a hair's breadth on some things if she was to continue her great and daring experiment of irregular equilibrium. Let one idea become less powerful, and some other idea would become too powerful. It was no flock of sheep the Christian shepherd was leading, but a herd of bulls and tigers, of terrible ideals and devouring doctrines, each one of them strong enough to turn to a false religion and lay waste to the world. Remember that the church went in specifically for dangerous ideas. She was a lion tamer. The idea of birth through a Holy Spirit, of the death of a divine being, of the forgiveness of sins, or the fulfillment of prophecy, are ideas which anyone can see need but a touch to turn them into something blasphemous or ferocious. 
The sentence phrased wrong about the nature of symbolism would have broken all the best statues in Europe. A slip in the definitions might stop all the dances, might wither all the Christmas trees, or break all the Easter eggs. Doctrines had to be defined within strict limits, even in order that man might enjoy general human liberties. The church had to be careful, if only that the world might be careless. This is the thrilling romance of orthodoxy. People have fallen into a foolish habit of speaking of orthodoxy as something heavy, humdrum, and safe. There never was anything so perilous or so exciting as orthodoxy. It was sanity, and to be sane is more dramatic than to be mad. It was the equilibrium of a man behind madly rushing horses, seeming to stoop this way and to sway that, yet in every attitude having the grace of statuary and the accuracy of arithmetic. The church in its early days went fierce and fast with any war horse, yet it is utterly unhistoric to say that she merely went mad along one idea, like a vulgar fanaticism. She swerved to the left and right so as exactly to avoid enormous obstacles. She left on one hand the huge bulk of Arianism, buttressed by all the worldly powers to make Christianity too worldly. The next instant she was swerving to avoid an Orientalism, which would have made it too unworldly. The Orthodox Church never took the tame course or accepted the conventions. The Orthodox Church was never respectable. It would have been easier to have accepted the earthly power of the Arians. It would have been easy in the Calvinistic 17th century to fall into the bottomless pit of predestination. It is easy to be a madman. It is easy to be a heretic. It is always easy to let the age have its head. The difficult thing is to keep one's own. It is always easy to be a moderate, as it is easy to be a snob, to have fallen into any of those open traps of error and exaggeration, which fashion after fashion and sect after sect set along the historic path of Christendom. That would indeed have been simple. It is always simple to fall. There are an infinity of angles at which one falls, only one at which one stands. To have fallen into any one of the fads from Gnosticism to Christian science would indeed have been obvious and tame, but to have avoided them all has been one whirling adventure, and in my vision the heavenly chariot flies thundering through the ages, the dull heresies sprawling and prostrate, the wild truth reeling but erect. Unquote. Orthodoxy, Chapter 6, pages 182 to 85. No quotation can adequately convey the wealth of thought in the book. Yet amazingly, the Times reviewer rebuked G.K. for substituting emotion for intellect, partly on strength of a sentence in the chapter called The Maniac. Quote, the madman is the man who has lost everything except his reason. Unquote. The reviews, when one reads them as a whole, exactly confirm what Wilford Ward said in the Dublin Review, that whereas he had regarded orthodoxy as a triumphant vindication of his own view that G.K. was a really profound thinker, he found to his amazement that those who had thought him superficial held it as proof of theirs. Obviously, with a man so much concerned with ultimates, the place accorded to him in letters will depend upon whether one agrees or disagrees with his conclusions. In a country that is not Catholic, this consideration must affect the standing of any Catholic thinker. Thus Newman was considered by Carlyle to have the brain of a moderate-sized rat. Yet by others, his is counted the greatest mind of the century. Similarly, Arnold Bennett could credit Chesterton with only a second-class intellectual apparatus because he was a dogmatist. To this, Chesterton replied in Fancies versus Facts, quote, In truth, there are only two kinds of people those who accept dogmas and know it, and those who accept dogmas and don't know it. My only advantage over the gifted novelist lies in my belonging to the former class." Unquote. If one grasps the Catholic view of dogma, the answer is satisfied. If not, the objector is left with his original objection, as against Chesterton, as against Newman. And Chesterton had the extra disadvantage of being a journalist famous for his jokes now moving in Newman's unquestioned field of philosophy and theology. It was in part the difficulty of convincing a man against his will. These critics, as Wilford Ward pointed out, 
read superficially and looked only at the fooling, the fantastic puns and comparisons, ignoring the underlying deep seriousness and lines of thought that made him, as it then seemed boldly, rank Chesterton with such writers as Butler, Coleridge, and Newman. Taking as his text the saying, Truth can understand error, but error cannot understand truth, Wilford Ward called his article, Mr. Chesterton Among the Prophets. He showed especially the curious confusion made in such comments as the one I have quoted from the Times, and made clearer what Chesterton was really saying by a comparison with the illative sense of Cardinal Newman. It is the usual difficulty of trying to express a partly new idea. Newman had coined an expression, but it did not express all he meant, still less all that Chesterton meant. Yet it was difficult to use the word reason in this particular discussion without giving to it two different meanings. For in two chapters, The Maniac and The Suicide of Thought, Chesterton was concerned to show that authority was needed for the defense of reason, in a larger sense, against its own power of self-destruction. Yet the maniac commits the suicide by excessive use of reason, in a narrower sense. Quote, he is not hampered by a sense of humor or by charity, or by the dumb certainties of experience. He is the more logical for losing certain sane affections. He is the clean and well-lit prison of one idea. He is sharpened to one painful point." Unquote. To Chesterton, it seemed that most of the modern religions and philosophies were like the argument by which a madman suffering from persecution mania proves that he is in a world of enemies. It is complete, it is unanswerable, yet it is false. The madman's mind, quote, moves in a perfect but narrow circle. The insane explanation is quite as complete as the sane one, only it is not so large. There is such a thing as a narrow universality. There is such a thing as a small and cramped eternity. You may see it in many modern religions, unquote. Philosophies such as materialism, idealism, monism, all have in their explanations of the universe this quality of the madman's argument, of covering everything and leaving everything out. The materialist, like the madman, is, quote, unconscious of the alien energies and the large indifference of the earth. He is not thinking of the real things of the earth, of fighting peoples or proud mothers, or first love or fear upon the sea. The earth is so very large and the cosmos is so very small, unquote. People sometimes say, life is larger than logic, when they want to dismiss logic. But that was not Chesterton's way. He wanted logic. He needed logic, as part of the abundance of the mind's life, as part of a much larger whole. What was the work? We are looking for it still, for a use of the mind that included all these things. Logic and imagination, mysticism and ecstasy and poetry and joy. A use of the mind that could embrace the universe and reach upwards to God without losing its balance. The mind must work in time, yet it can reach out into eternity. It is conditioned by space and can glimpse infinity. The modern world has imprisoned the mind. Far more than the body, it needed great open spaces. And Chesterton, breaking violently out of prison, looked around and saw how the church had given health to the mind by giving it space to move in and great ideas to move among. Chesterton, the poet, saw too that man is a poet and must therefore, quote, get his head into heaven, unquote. He needs mysticism, and among her great ideas, the church gives him mysteries. Gilbert Keith Chesterton by Maisie Ward, Chapter 14, Part 1. Bernard Shaw. This chapter was read by GBS. His remarks are printed in footnotes. A facsimile of the one page altered substantially by him is omitted in this plain text electronic edition. When anyone in the early years of the century made a list of the English writers most in the public eye, such a list always included the names of Bernard Shaw and G.K. Chesterton. But a good many people in writing down these names did so with unconcealed irritation and I think it is important at this stage to see why. These men were constantly arguing with each other, but the literary public felt all the same that they represented something in common, and the literary public was by no means sure that it liked that something. It could not 
quite resist bernard shaw's plays it loved chesterton whenever it could rebuke him affectionately for paradox and levity what that public succumbed to in these men was their art it was by no means so certain that it liked their meaning and so the literary public elected to say that shaw and chesterton were having a cheap success by standing on their heads and declaring that black was white the audience watched a shaw versus chesterton debate as a sham fight or a display of fireworks as indeed it always partly was for each of them would have died rather than really hurt the other but Shaw and Chesterton were operating on their minds all the time. They were allowed to sit in the stalls and applaud, but they were themselves being challenged, and that spoiled their comfort. Chesterton in his autobiography complains of the falsity of most of the pictures of England during the Victorian era, the languishing, fainting females who were in fact far stronger minded than their granddaughters today the tyrannical pious fathers the dull conventional lives it all rings false to anyone who grew up in an average victorian middle-class home and was happy enough there there was however one thing fundamentally wrong in such homes and it was on this fundamental sin that he agreed with shaw in waging a relentless war the middle classes of england were thoroughly and smugly satisfied with social conditions that were intolerable for the great mass of their fellow countrymen they had erected between the classes artificial barriers and now did not even look over the top of them i remember how when my mother started a settlement in south london the head worker told us she often saw women groping in the dirt under the fish barrows for the heads and tails of fishes to boil for their children the settlement began to give the children dinners of dumplings or rice pudding and treacle and many well-to-do friends would give my mother a pound or so to help this work but the suggestion that government should intervene was socialism the idea that here was a symptom of a widespread evil was scouted utterly people might have learnt much from their own servants of how the rest of humanity were living but while said chesterton they laughed at the idea of the medieval baron whose vassals ate below the salt their own vassals ate and lived below the floor at no time in the christian past had there been such a deep and wide cleverage in humanity the first thing that g k c and g b s wells too and bella were all agreed upon was that the upper and middle classes of england must be reminded if need were by a series of earthquakes that they were living in an unreal world they had forgotten the human race to which they belonged they a tiny section spoke of the mass of mankind as the poor or the lower orders almost as they might speak of the beasts of the forest as beings of a different race chesterton had a profound and noble respect for the poor shaw declared that they were useless dangerous and ought to be abolished but for both men the handful of quarrelsome cliques called the literary world was far too small because it was so tiny a section of the human race shaw and chesterton had in fact discovered the social problem today whether people intend to do anything about it or not it is impossible to avoid knowing something about it but at that date the idea was general that all was as well as could be expected in an imperfect world the trades unionists were telling a different story but they could not hope to reach intellectually the classes they were attacking here were men who could not be ignored and i cannot but think that it was sometimes the mere utterance of unwelcome truth in brilliant speech that aroused the cry of paradox i hear many people wrote chesterton complain that bernard shaw deliberately mystifies them i cannot imagine what they mean it seems to me that he deliberately insults them his language especially on moral questions is generally as straight and solid as that of a bargy and far less ornate and symbolic than that of a handsome cabman 
the prosperous english philistine complains that mr shaw is making a fool of him whereas mr shaw is not in the least making a fool of him mr shaw is with laborious lucidity calling him a fool g b s calls a landlord a thief and the landlord instead of denying or resenting it says ah that fellow hides his meaning so cleverly that one can never make out what he means it is all so fine spun and fantastical g b s calls a statesman a liar to his face and the statesman cries in a kind of ecstasy ah what quaint intricate and half tangled trains of thought ah what elusive and many-coloured mysteries of half meaning i think it is always quite plain what mr shaw means even when he is joking and it generally means that the people he is talking to ought to howl aloud for their sins but the average representative of them undoubtedly treats the shabby and meaning as tricky and complex when it is really direct and offensive he always accuses shaw of pulling his leg at the exact moment when shaw is pulling his nose footnote george bernard shaw particular pages eighty two to three in footnote chesterton was however in agreement with the ordinary citizen and in disagreement with shaw as to much of shaw's essential teaching and here we touch a matter so involved that even today it is hard to disentangle it completely i suppose it will always be possible for two observers to look at human beings acting to hear them talking and to arrive at two entirely different interpretations of what they mean this is certainly the case with any very recent period and perhaps especially with our own recent history we have within living memory ended a period and begun an exceedingly different period and we tend to judge the former by the light or the darkness of the latter the victorian age even in its extreme old age was still tacitly assuming and legally enforcing as axioms the christian moral system especially in regard to marriage and all sex questions and the sacred nature of property to read many disquisitions on that period today one would suppose that no one living really believed in these things that humbug explained the first and greed the second this is surely a false perspective the age was an enormously conventional one these fundamental ideas had become fossilized and meaningless for an increasing number of younger people but when bernard shaw called himself an atheist out of a kind of insane generosity towards brad laugh see his letter to g k later in this chapter or described all property as theft it was a real moral indignation that was roused in many minds real but exceedingly confused it is testified to the need of the ordinary man to live by a creed that he need not question shaw and chesterton were philosophers and philosophers love asking questions as well as answering them but the average man wants to live by his creed not question it and the elder victorians had still some kind of creed there were many who believed in god there were others who believed that the christian moral system must remain because it had commended itself to man's nature as the highest and best and was the true fruit of evolutionary progress there were certainly some who were angry because they thought chaos must follow any tampering with the existing social order but if you take the mass of those who tried to laugh bernard shaw aside and grew angry when they could not do so you find at the root of the anger an intense dislike of having any part of a system questioned which was to them unquestionable which they had erected into a creed they thought shaw's ideas dangerous and wanted to keep them from the young they did not want anyone to ask how a civilization had laid its principles open to this brilliant and effective siege they hated shaw's questions before they began to hate his answers and that is probably why so many linked chesterton with shaw he gave different answers but he was asking many of the same questions he questioned everything as shaw did 
only he pushed his questions further they were deeper and more searching shaw would not accept the old scriptural orthodoxy g k refused to accept the new agnostic orthodoxy neither man would accept the orthodoxy of the scientists both were prepared to attack what butler had called the science ridden art ridden culture ridden afternoon tea ridden cliffs of old england they attacked first by the mere process of asking questions and the world thus questioned grew uneasy and seemed to care curiously little for the fact that the two questioners were answering their own questions in an opposite fashion where shaw said give up pretending you believe in god for you don't chesterton said rediscover the reasons for believing or else our race is lost where shaw said abolish private property which has produced this ghastly poverty chesterton said abolish ghastly poverty by restoring property and the audience said these two men in strange paradoxes seem to us to be saying the same thing if indeed they are saying anything at all chesterton wrote later of a young man whose aunt had disinherited him for socialism because of a lecture he had delivered against that economic theory and i well remember how often after my own energetic attempts to explain why a distributist was not a socialist i was met with a weary well it's just the same it was just the same question it was an entirely different answer but the audience annoyed by the question never seemed to listen to the answer one man was saying sweep away the old beliefs of humanity and start fresh the other was saying rediscover your reasons for these profound beliefs make them once more effective for they are the very nature of man shaw and chesterton were themselves deeply concerned about the answers both sincere both dealing with realities they were prepared to accept each other's sincerity and to fight the matter out if need were endlessly being writers they conducted their discussions in writing being journalists they did so mainly in the newspapers to the delight or fury of other journalists a jealous few were enraged at what they called publicity hunting but most realized that it was not a private fight any one might join in and a good many did belloc was in the fight as early as chesterton and of course on the same side g b s who had invented the chester belloc declared that chesterton felt obliged to embrace the dogmas of catholicism lest belloc's soul should be damned h d wells agreed in the main with shaw both were fabians and both were ready with a fabian utopia for humanity which belloc and chesterton felt would be little better than a prison cecil chesterton coming in at an angle of his own wrote some effective articles he was a fabian actually an official fabian but his outlook already embraced many of the chester belloc human and genial ideas although he still ridiculed their utopia of the peasant state small ownership and all that came later to be called distributism like the clarion the new age itself a socialist paper saw the wisdom of giving a platform to both sides and in this paper appeared the best articles that the controversy produced meanwhile the private friendship between g b s and g k c was growing apace very early on shaw had begun to urge g k to write a play g k was perhaps beginning to feel that newspaper controversy did not give him space to say all he wanted about shaw or perhaps it was merely that monsieur lane had persuaded him to promise them a book on shaw for a series they were producing anyhow in a letter of nineteen o eight shaw again urges the play and gives interesting information for the book ayat st lawrence wellwyn hartsfordshire first march nineteen o eight my dear g k c what about that play it is no use trying to answer me in the new age the real answer to my article is the play i have tried fair means 
The New Age article was the inauguration of an assault below the belt. I shall deliberately destroy your credit as an essayist, as a journalist, as a critic, as a liberal, as everything that offers your laziness a refuge, until starvation and shame drive you to serious dramatic parturition. I shall repeat my public challenge to you, vaunt my superiority, insult your corpulence, torture belloc, if necessary, call on you and steal your wife's affections by my intellectual and athletic displays, until you contribute something to the British drama. You are played out as an essayist, your ardor is soddened, your intellectual substance crumbled by the attempt to keep up the work of your twenties and your thirties. Another five years of this, and you will be the apologist of every infamy that wears a liberal or Catholic mask. You, too, will speak of the portraits of Vicelli and the Assumption of Allegri, and declare that democracy refuses to lackey label these honest citizens as Titian and Correggio. Even that colossal fragment of your ruined honesty that still stupendously dismisses Beethoven as some rubbish about a piano will give way to remarks about a graceful second subject in the relative minor. Nothing can save you now except a rebirth as a dramatist. I have done my turn, and I now call on you to take yours and do a man's work. It is my solemn belief that it was my quintessence of Epsonism that rescued you and all your ungrateful generation from materialism and rationalism. Footnote. Cecil avowed this as far as he was concerned. GBS. End footnote. You were all tired young atheists turning to Kipling and Ruskinian Anglicanism whilst I... With the angel's wings beating in my ears from Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, O oh, blasphemous walker in deafness, gave you in 1880 and 1881 two novels in which you had your rationalist, secularist hero immediately followed by my Beethovenian hero. True, nobody read them, but was that my fault? They are read now, it seems, mostly in pirated reprints, in spite of their appalling puerility and classical perfection of style, you are right as to my being a born pendant, like all great artists, and are at least useful as documentary evidence that I was no more a materialist when I wrote Love Among the Artists at 24 than when I wrote Candida at 39. My appearances on the platform of the Hall of Science were three in number, once for a few minutes in a discussion, in opposition to Brad Laugh, who was defending property against socialism. Brad Laugh died after that, though I do not claim to have killed him. The Socialist League challenged him to debate with me at St. James's Hall, but we could not or would not agree as to the proposition to be debated, he insisting on my being bound by all the publications of the Democratic Federation to which I did not belong, and I refusing to be bound by anything on earth or in heaven except the proposition that socialism would benefit the English people, and so the debate never came off. Now in those days they were throwing Brad Laugh out of the House of Commons with bodily violence, and all one could do was to call oneself an atheist all over the place, which I accordingly did. At the first public meeting of the Shelley Society at University College, addressed by Stopford Brook, I made my then famous Among a Hundred People declaration. I am a socialist, an atheist, and a vegetarian, ergo a true Shelleyan. Whereupon two ladies who had been palpating with enthusiasm for Shelley, under the impression that he was a devout Anglican, resigned on the spot. My second hall of science appearance was after the last of the Brad Laugh Hindman debates at St. James's Hall, where the two champions never touched the ostensible subject of their difference, the eight hours day, at all but simply talked socialism or anti-socialism with a hearty dislike and contempt for one another. 
G. V. Foote was then in his prime as the successor of Brad Laff, and as neither the secularists nor the socialists were satisfied with the result of the debate, it was renewed for two nights at the Hall of Science between me and Foote. A verbatim report was published for sixpence and is now a treasure of collectors. Having the last word on the second night, I had to make a handsome wind-up, and the secularists were much pleased by my declaring that I was altogether on Foote's side in his struggle with the established religion of the country. When Brad Laugh died, the secularists wanted a new leader because B's enormous and magnetic personality left a void that nobody was big enough to fill. It was really like the death of Napoleon in that world. There was J. M. Robertson, Foote, and Charles Watts, but Brad Laff liked Foote as little as most autocrats liked their successors, and when he, before his death, surrendered the gavel, the hammer for thumping the table, to secure order at a meeting which was the presidential scepter of the National Secular Society, he did so with an ill will which he did not attempt to conceal. And so though Foote was the nearest size to Bradlaugh's shoes then available, he succeeded him at the disadvantage of inheriting the distrust of the old chief J. M. Robertson you know. He was not a mob orator. Watts was not sufficient. He had neither Foote's weight, being old, nor Robertson's scholarship. So whilst the survivors of Brad Laff were trying to keep up the Hall of Science and to establish a memorial library, etc., there they cast round for new blood. What more natural than that they should think of me as a man not afraid to call himself an atheist and able to hold his own on the platform? Accordingly, they invited me to address them, and one memorable night I held forth on progress in free thought. I was received with affectionate hope, and when the chairman announced that I was giving my share of the gate to the memorial library, I have never taken money for lecturing. The enthusiasm was quite touching. The anti-climax was super shabbian. I proceeded to smash materialism, rationalism, and all the philosophy of Tyndall, Helmholtz, Darwin, and the rest of the 1860 people into smithereens. I ridiculed and exposed every inference of science and justified every dogma of religion especially showing that the trinity and the immaculate conception were the merest common sense that finished me up as a possible leader of the nss robertson came on the platform white with honest scotch rationalist rage and denounced me with a fury of conviction that startled his own followers never did i grace that platform again I repeated the address once to a branch of the NSS on the south side of the Thames, Kensington, I think, and was interrupted by yells of rage from the veterans of the society. The Leicester secularists, a pious folk, rich and independent of the NSS, were kinder to me, but they were no more real atheists than the congregation of St. Paul's is made wholly of real Christians. Foot is still bewildered about me, imagining that I am a pervert, but anybody who reads my stuff from the beginning, a Shelleyan beginning, as far as it could be labeled at all, will find implicit, and sometimes explicit, the views which, in their more matured form, will appear in that remarkable forthcoming masterpiece, Shavianism, a religion. By the way, I have omitted one more appearance at the Hall of Science, at a four nights debate on socialism between Foote and Mrs. Besant. I took the chair on one of the nights. I take advantage of a snowy Sunday afternoon to scribble all this down for you, because you are in the same difficulty that beset me formerly namely the absolute blank in the history of the immediate past that confronts every man when he first takes to public life written history stops several decades back 
and the bridge of personal recollection on which older men stand does not exist for the recruit nothing is more natural than that you should reconstruct me as the last of the rationalists his real name is blatch ford and nothing could be more erroneous it would be much nearer the truth to call me in that world the first of the mystics if you can imagine the result of trying to write your spiritual history in complete ignorance of painting you will get a notion of trying to write mine in ignorance of music bradlaugh was a tremendous platform heavyweight but he had never in his life as far as i could make out seen anything heard anything or read anything in the artistic sense he was almost beyond belief incapable of intercourse and private conversation he could tell you his adventures provided you didn't interrupt him which you were mostly afraid to do as the man was a mesmeric terror but as to exchanging ideas or expressing the universal part of his soul you might as well have been reading the letters of charles dickens to his family those tragic monuments of dumbness of soul and noisiness of pen lord help you if you ever lose your gift of speech g k c don't forget that the race is only struggling out of its dumbness and that it is only in moments of inspiration that we get out a sentence all the rest is padding yours ever g bernard shaw gilbert keith chesterton by Maisie ward chapter fourteen part two in the book on shaw which appeared in august nineteen o nine g k did as he had done with his other literary studies gave inaccurately only as much biography as seemed absolutely necessary and mainly discussed ideas he saw shaw as an irish man yet lacking the roots of nationality since he belonged to a mainly alien governing class he saw him as a puritan yet without the religious basis of puritanism and thirdly he saw him as so swift a progressive as to be ahead of his own thought and ready to slay it in the name of progress all these elements in shaw made for strength but also created limitations shaw is like the venus of milo all that there is of him is admirable where he fails is in being unable to see and embrace the full complexity of life his only paradox is to pull out one thread or cord of truth longer and longer into waste and fantastic places he does not allow for that deeper sort of paradox by which two opposite cords of truth become entangled in an inextricable knot still less can he be made to realize that it is often this knot which ties safely together the whole bundle of human life here lies the limitation of that lucid and compelling mind he cannot quite understand life because he will not accept its contradictions humanity is built of these contradictions therefore shaw pities humanity more than he loves it it was his glory that he pitied animals like men it was his defect that he pitied men almost too much like animals foulon said of the democracy let them eat grass shaw said let them eat greens he had more benevolence but almost as much disdain as a vegetarian and a water drinker shaw himself lacked in chesterton's eyes something of complete humanity and in discussing social problems he was more economist than man shaw one might almost say dislikes murder not so much because it wastes the life of the corpse as because it wastes the time of the murderer this lack of the full human touch is felt even in the plays because shaw cannot be irrational where humanity always is irrational in candida it is completely and disastrously false to the whole nature of falling in love to make the young eugene complain of the cruelty which makes candida defile her fair hands with domestic duties 
no boy in love with a beautiful woman would ever feel disgusted when she peeled potatoes or trimmed lamps he would like her to be domestic he would simply feel that the potatoes had become poetical and the lamps gained an extra light this may be irrational but we are not talking of rationality but of the psychology of first love footnote no two love affairs are the same this sentence assumed that they are all the same to eugene the poet living in a world of imagination and abhorring reality candida was what dulcinea was to don quixote g b s and footnote it may be very unfair to women that the toil and triviality of potato peeling should be seen through a glamour of romance but the glamour is quite as certain a fact as the potatoes it may be a bad thing in sociology that men should deify domesticity in girls as something dainty and magical but all men do personally i do not think it a bad thing at all but that is another argument footnote george bernard shaw particular pages one twenty to one and footnote yet shaw's limitations are those of a great man and a genius in an age of narrow specialism he has stood up for the fact that philosophy is not the concern of those who pass through divinity and greats but of those who pass through birth and death in an age that has almost chosen death shaw follows the banner of life but austerely not joyously nowhere in dealing with shaw's philosophy does chesterton note his debt to butler shaw has himself mentioned it and no reader of butler could miss it especially in this matter of the life force it is the special paradox of our age chesterton notes that the life force should thus need assertion and can thus be followed without joy to every man and woman bird beast and flower life is a love call to be eagerly followed to bernard shaw it is merely a military bugle to be obeyed in short he fails to feel that the command of nature if one must use the anthropomorphic fable of nature instead of the philosophic term god can be enjoyed as well as obeyed he paints life at its darkest and then tells the babe on board to take the leap in the dark that is heroic and to my instinct at least schopenhauer looks like a pygmy beside his pupil but it is the heroism of a morbid and almost asphyxiated age it is awful to think that this world which so many poets have praised has even for a time been depicted as a man trap into which we may just have the manhood to jump think of all those ages through which men have talked of having the courage to die and then remember that we have actually fallen to talking of having the courage to live footnote george bernard shaw weekend library page one hundred ninety end footnote here comes the great parting of the two men's thought g k believed in god and in joy but he saw that shaw had much of value for this strange diseased world his primary value was not merely as some said that he woke it up the literary world might not be awake to the social evil but it was painfully awake to the ills real or imaginary inherent in human life we do not need waking up rather we suffer from insomnia with all its results of fear and exaggeration and frightful waking dreams the modern mind is not a donkey which wants kicking to make it go on the modern mind is more like a motor car on a lonely road which two amateur motorists have been just clever enough to take to pieces but are not quite clever enough to put together again footnote in the same place particular pages two hundred forty five to six and footnote shaw had not merely asked questions of the age that would have been worse than useless what he had done was at moments to rise above his own thoughts and give through his characters inspired answers g k instances candida 
with its revelation of the meaning of marriage when the woman stays with the strong man because he is so weak and needs her and shaw had brought back philosophy into drama that is he had recreated the atmosphere lost since shakespeare footnote hard on goethe and epson to say nothing of mozart's magic flute and beethoven's ninth symphony g b s end footnote in which men were thinking and might therefore find the answers that the age needed and here again we come back to the world which these men were shaking and to the respective philosophies with which they looked at it it was a world of conventions and these conventions had become empty of meaning throw them away said shaw and wells no said chesterton keep them and look for their meaning revolution does not mean destruction it means restoration the same sort of discussion buzzed around this book as around the controversies of which it might be called a prolongation shaw himself reviewed it in an article in the nation in which he called it the best work of literary art i have yet provoked everything about me which mr chesterton had to divine he has divined miraculously but everything that he could have ascertained easily by reading my own plain directions on the bottle as it were remains for him a muddled and painful problem from an interchange of private letters it would seem that the move to beaconsfield took place later in this year than i had supposed bernard shaw's letter is probably not written many days after an undated one to him from g k forty eight overstrand mansions battersea park southwest dear bernard shaw i trust our recent tournaments have not rendered it contrary to the laws of romantic chivalry which you reverence so much for me to introduce to you my friend mr pepler who is a very nice man indeed though a social idealist and who has i believe something of a practical sort to ask of you please excuse abruptness in this letter of introduction we are moving into the country and every piece of furniture i begin to write at is taken away and put into a van always yours sincerely g k chesterton ten adelphi terrace west central thirtieth october nineteen o nine chesterton shaw speaks attention i saw your man and consoled him spiritually but that is not the subject of this letter i still think that you could write a useful sort of play if you were started when i was in kerry last month i had occasionally a few moments to spare and it seemed to me quite unendurable that you should be wasting your time writing books about me i liked the book very much especially as it was so completely free from my own influence being evidently founded on a very hazy recollection of a five-year-old perusal of man and superman but a lot of it was fearful nonsense there was one good thing about the scientific superstition which you came a little too late for it taught a man to respect facts you have no conscience in this respect and your punishment is that you substitute such dull inferences as my narrow puritan home for delightful and fantastic realities which you might very easily have ascertained if you had taken greater advantage of what is really the only thing to be said in favor of battersea namely that it is within easy reach of adelphi terrace however i have no doubt that when wilkins micawber jr grew up and became eminent in australia references were made to his narrow puritan home so i do not complain if you had told the truth nobody would have believed it now to business when one breathes irish air one becomes a practical man in england i used to say what a pity it was you did not write a play in ireland i sat down and began writing a scenario for you but before i could finish it i had come back to london and now it is all up with the scenario in england i can do nothing but talk i therefore now send you the thing as far as i scribbled it and i leave you to invent what escapades you please for the hero and to devise some sensational means of getting him back to heaven again 
unless you prefer to end with the millennium in full swing footnote the scenario dealt with the return of st augustine to the england he remembered converting in footnote but experience has made me very doubtful of the efficacy of help as the means of getting work out of the right sort of man when i was young i struck out one invaluable rule for myself which was whenever you meet an important man contradict him if possible insult him but such a rule is one of the privileges of youth i no longer live by rules yet there is one way in which you may possibly be insultable it can be plausibly held that you are a venal ruffian pouring forth great quantities of immediately saleable stuff but altogether declining to lay up for yourself treasures in heaven it may be that you cannot afford to do otherwise therefore i am quite ready to make a deal with you a full-length play should contain about eighteen thousand words mine frequently contain two or three times that number i do not know what your price per thousand is i used to be considered grossly extortionate by massingham and others for insisting on three pounds eighteen thousand words at three pounds per thousand is fifty-four pounds i need make no extra allowance for the republication in book form because even if the play aborted as far as the theatre is concerned you could make a book of it all the same let us assume that your work is worth twice as much as mine this would make one hundred eight pounds i have had two shockingly bad years of it pecuniarily speaking and am therefore in that phase of extravagance which straitened means have always produced in me knock off eight per cent as a sort of agent's commission to me for starting you on the job and finding you a theme this leaves one hundred pounds i will pay you a hundred pounds down on your contracting to supply me within three months with a mechanically possible in other words stageable drama dealing with the experiences of st augustine after revisiting england the literary copyright to be yours except that you are not to prevent me making as many copies as i may require for stage use the stage right to be mine but you are to have the right to buy it back from me for two hundred fifty pounds whenever you like footnote i could not very well offer him a hundred pounds as a present g b s and footnote the play if performed to be announced as your work and not as a collaboration all rights which i may have in the scenario to go with the stage right and literary copyright as prescribed as far as you may make use of it what do you say there is a lot of spending in one hundred pounds one condition more if it should prove impossible to achieve a performance otherwise than through the stage society which does not pay anything a resort to that body is not to be deemed a breach of the spirit of our agreement do you think it would be possible to make belloc write a comedy if he could only be induced to believe in some sort of god instead of in that wretched little conspiracy against religion which the pious romans have locked up in the vatican one could get some drive into him as it is he is wasting prodigious gifts in the service of king leopold and the pope and other ghastly scarecrows if he must have a pope there is quite a possible one at adelphi terrace for the next few days i shall be at my country quarters ayat st lawrence well when hartsfordshire i have a motor-car which could carry me on sufficient provocation as far as beaconsfield but i do not know how much time you spend there and how much in fleet street are you only a week ender or has your wise wife taken you properly in hand and committed you to a pastoral life yours ever g bernard shaw p s remember that the play is to be practical in the common managerial sense only in respect of its being mechanically possible as a stage representation it is to be neither a likely to be successful play nor a literary lark it is to be written for the good of all souls 
Among the reviewers of the book, our old friend, the Academy, surprised me by hating Shaw so much more than Chesterton that the latter came off quite lightly. There was a good deal of the usual misunderstanding and lists were made of self-contradictions on the author's part. Still in the main, the press was sympathetic and even enthusiastic. But when Shaw reviewed Chesterton on Shaw, more than one paper waxed sarcastic on the point of royalties and remuneration gained by these means. The funniest of the more critical comments on the way these men wrote of one another was a suggestion made in the bystander that Shaw and Chesterton were really the same person. Shaw, it is said, tired of socialism, weary of wearing Jaegers, and broken down by teetotalism and vegetarianism, sought, some years ago, an escape from them. His adoption, however, of these attitudes had a decided commercial value, which he did not think it advisable to prejudice by wholesale surrender. Therefore he, in order to taste the forbidden joys of individualistic philosophy, meat, food, and strong drink, created Chesterton. This mammoth myth, he decided, should enjoy all the forms of fame which Shaw had to deny himself. Outwardly, he should be Shaw's antithesis. He should be beardless, large in girth, smiling of countenance, and he should be licensed to sell paradoxes only in essay and novel form, all stage and platform rights being reserved by Shaw to enable the imposition to be safely carried out. Shaw hit on the idea of residence close to the tunnel which connects Adelphi with the Strand. Emerging from his house plain, Jaeger clad, bearded and saturnine Shaw, he entered the tunnel in a cleft in which was a cellar. Here he donned the Chesterton properties, the immense padding of chest, and so on, the Chesterton sombrero hat and cloak and pince-nez, and there he left the Shaw beard and the Shaw clothes, the Shaw expression of countenance, and all the Shaw theories. He emerged into the Strand, G.K.C., in whose identity he visited all the cafes, ate all the meats, rode in all the cabs, and smiled on all the sinners. The day's work done, the Chesterton manuscripts delivered, the proofs read, the bargains driven, the giant figure returned to the tunnel, and once again was back in Adelphi, the Shaw he was when he left it, back to the Eggers, the beard, the socialism, the statistics, and the sardonic letters to the Times. Footnote from the Bystander, 1 September, 1909. End footnote. Bernard Shaw is a man of unusual generosity, but I think from his letters he must also be quite a good man of business. G.K. was so greatly the opposite that G.B.S. urged him again and again to do the most ordinary things to protect the literary rights of himself and others. Thus, in the only undated letter in the whole packet, he begs Gilbert to back up the author's society. My dear G.K.C., I am one of the unhappy slaves who, on the two big committees of your trade union, the Society of Authors, drudge at the heartbreaking work of defending our miserable profession against being devoured, body and soul, by the publishers. Themselves a pitiful gang of literature-struck impostors who are crumpled up by the booksellers, who, though small folk, are at least in contact with reality in the shape of the book buyer. It is a ghastly and infuriating business, because the authors will go to lunch with their publishers and sell them anything for twenty pounds over the cigarettes. But it has to be done, and I, with half a dozen others, have to do it. Now I missed the last committee meeting, electioneering. I am here doing two colossal meetings of minors every night for Keir Hardy. But the harassed secretary writes that it was decided to take proceedings in the case of a book of yours which you, oh Esau, Esau, sold to John. John is a, well, no matter. 
when you take your turn on the committee you will find him out and that though the german lawyer has had seven pounds and is going ahead seven pounds worth of law in germany takes you to the house of lords everything is hung up because you will not answer thring's letters footnote herbert thring was the barrister employed by the society of authors and footnote thring in desperation appeals to me concluding with characteristic simplicity that we must be friends because you have written a book about me as the conclusion is accidentally and improbably true i now urge you to give him whatever satisfaction he requires i have no notion what it is or what the case is about but at least answer his letters however infuriating they may be remember you pay thring only five hundred pounds for which you get integrity incorruptibility implacability and a disposition greatly to find quarrel in a straw on your behalf even with yourself and don't complain if you don't get twenty thousand pounds worth of tact into the bargain and your obligations to us wretched committee men are simply incalculable we get nothing but abuse and denigration authors weep with indignation when we put our foot on some blood-sucking widow cheating orphan starving scoundrel and ruthlessly force him to keep to his might of obligation under an agreement which would have revolted shylock unless the best men the good professionals help us we are lost we get nothing and spend our time like water for you all we ask you to do is to answer thring and let us get along with your work look here will you write to thring please write to thring i say have you written to thring yet g b s i doubt whether he had those chance sums he poured from time to time into francis's lap were usually not what they should have been an advance on a royalty orthodoxy he sold outright for one hundred pounds no man ever worked so hard to earn so little when later gilbert employed monsieur a p watt as his literary agents a letter to them undated of course and written on the old note-paper of his first battersea flat shows a mingling of gratitude to his agents with entire absence of resentment towards his publishers which might be called essence of chesterton the prices you have got me for books compared with what i used weekly to demand seem to me to come out of fairyland it seems to me that there is a genuine business problem which creates a permanent need for a literary agent it consists in this that our work even when it has become entirely a duty and a worry still remains in some vague way a pleasure and how can we put a fair price on what is at once a worry and a pleasure suppose someone comes to me and says i offer you sixpence for your history of the gnostic heresy why after all should i charge more than sixpence for a work it was so exuberant to write you on the other hand seeing it from the outside would say that it was worth so and so and you would get it shaw continued his attempts to stimulate the reluctant playwright two years after drafting the scenario he writes ten adelphi terrace was central fifth april nineteen twelve dear mrs chesterton i have promised to drive somebody to beaconsfield on sunday morning and i shall be in that district more or less for the rest of the day if you are spending easter at over roads and have no visitors who couldn't stand us we should like to call on you at any time that would be convenient the convenience of time depends on a design of my own which i wish to impart to you first i want to read a play to gilbert it began by way of being a music hall sketch so it is not three and one half hours long as usual i can get through it in an hour and a half i want to insult and taunt and stimulate gilbert with it it is the sort of thing he could write and ought to write a religious harlequinade footnote androcles and the lion evidently gbs in footnote in fact 
he could do it better if a sufficient number of pins were stuck into him my proposal is that i read the play to him on sunday or at the next convenient date and that you fall into transports of admiration of it declare that you can never love a man who cannot write things like that and definitely announce that if gilbert has not finished a worthy successor to it before the end of the third week next ensuing you will go out like the lady in a doll's house and live your own life whatever that dark threat may mean if you are at home i count on your ready complicity but the difficulty is that you may have visitors and if they are pious gilbert will be under a tacit obligation not to blaspheme or let me blaspheme whilst they are beneath his roof my play is about christian martyrs and perfectly awful in parts and if they are journalists it will be necessary to administer an oath of secrecy i don't object to the oath and nothing would please gilbert more than to make them drink blood from a skull the difficulty is they wouldn't keep it in short they must be the right sort of people of whom the more the merrier forgive this long rigmarole it is only to put you in possession of what may happen if you approve and your invitations in domestic circumstances are propitious yours sincerely g bernard shaw chesterton at last did write magic but that belongs to another chapter like the demand for a play the theme of finance recurs with great frequency in shaw's letters and after magic appeared he wrote to frances telling her that in sweden where the marriage laws are comparatively enlightened i believe you could obtain a divorce on the ground that your husband threw away an important part of the provision for your old age for twenty pieces of silver in the future the moment he has finished a play and the question of disposing of it arises lock him up and bring the agreement to me explanations would be thrown away on him recording by candace tuff Gilbert Keith Chesterton by Macy Ward Chapter 15 Part 1 From Battersea to Beaconsfield 1909 to 1911 In 1909, with orthodoxy well behind him and George Bernard Shaw just published, Gilbert and his wife left London for the small country town that was to be their home for the rest of their lives. It was an odd coincidence that they should leave overstrained mansions, Battersea, and come to Overroads, Beaconsfield, for they did not name their new home, but found it ready christened. It will be remembered that in one of the letters during the engagement, Gilbert had suggested a country home. The reason for the choice of Beaconsfield, he gives in the autobiography. After we were married, my wife and I lived for about a year in Kensington, the place of my childhood. But I think we both knew that it was not to be the real place of our abode. I remember that we strolled out one day for a sort of second honeymoon and went upon a journey into the void, a voyage deliberately objectless. I saw a passing omnibus labeled Hanwell, and feeling this to be an appropriate omen, we boarded it and left it somewhere at a stray station which I entered and asked the man in the ticket office where the next train went to. He uttered the pedantic reply, Where do you want to go to? And I uttered the profound and philosophic rejoinder, Wherever the next train goes to. It seemed that it went to Slough, which may seem to be singular taste even in a train. However, we went to Slough, and from there set out walking with even less notion of where we were going. And in that fashion, we passed through the large and quiet crossroads of a sort of village and stayed at an inn called the White Hart. We asked the name of the place and were told that it was called Beaconsfield. I mean, of course, that it was called Beaconsfield and not Beaconsfield. And we said to each other, this is the sort of place where someday we will make our home. They both wanted a home. They both deeply desired a family. The wish is normal to both man and woman, normal in a happy marriage, and theirs was unusually happy. 
it was almost abnormally keen in both Francis and Gilbert. Few men have so greatly loved children. As a schoolboy, his letters are full of it. Making friends with Scottish children on the sands, with French children by the medium of pictures. Later, he was writing In Defense of Baby Worship and welcoming with enthusiasm the arrival of his friend's children into the world. In the notebook, he had written, Sunlight in a child's hair. It is like the kiss of Christ upon all children. I blessed the child and hoped the blessing would go with him and never leave him and turn first into a toy and then into a game and then into a new friend and as he grew up into friends and then into a woman. Grass and Children Grass and Children there seems no end to them, but if there were but one blade of grass, men would see that it is fairer than lilies. And if we saw the first child, we should worship it as the god come on earth. Rounds. I find that most round things are nice, particularly eternity and baby. Francis cared no less deeply, both for eternity and for babies, and for many years went on hoping for the family that would complete their lives. At last it was decided to have an operation to enable her to have children. Her doctor writes, I well remember an incident which occurred during her convalescence from that operation. I received a telephone call from the matron of the nursing home in which Mrs. Chesterton was staying, suggesting that I should come round and remonstrate with Mr. Chesterton. On my arrival, I found him sitting on the stairs, where he had been for two hours, greatly incommoding passers up and down, and deaf to all requests to move on. It appeared that he had written a sonnet to his wife on her recovery from the operation, and was bringing it to give her. He was not, however, satisfied with the last line, but was determined to perfect it before entering her room to take tea with her. By the time they left London, she must, I think, have given up the hope she had so long cherished. Still, if there could not be children, there might be perhaps something of a home. In the conditions of their life, there was danger that any house of bricks and mortar should be rather a headquarters than a home, and it was lucky that he was able to feel she took home with her wherever they went. Your face that is a wandering home a flying home for me. The years before them were to be filled with the vast activities that not only took Gilbert to London and all over England incessantly, but were to take him increasingly over Europe and America. Beaconsfield gave a degree of quiet that made it possible, when they were able to be at home, not to be swamped by engagements and to lead a life of their own. Gilbert could go to London when he liked, but he need not always be on tap, so to say, for all the world. Frances could have a garden and indulge her hungry appetite for all that was fruitful. G.K. later, under the title The Homelessness of Jones, showed his love for a house rather than a flat, and they gave even to their first little house, Overroads, the stamp of a real home. For a man and his wife to leave London for the country, might seem to be their own affair. Not so, however, with the Chestertons. After a lapse of over 30 years, I find the matter still a subject of furious controversy, and indeed passion. Francis, says one school of opinion, committed a crime against the public good by removing Gilbert from Fleet Street. No, says the other school. She had to move him, or he would have died of working too hard and drinking too much. The suggestion, which I believe to be a fact, that Gilbert himself wanted to move, is seldom entertained. There is in all this the legitimate feeling of distress among any group at losing its chief figure, its pride and joy. I lost Gilbert, Lucian Oldershaw once said, first when I introduced him to Bella, next when he married Francis, and finally when he joined the Catholic Church. I rejoiced, though perhaps with a maternal sadness, 
at all these fulfillments. Cecil wanted his brother always on hand. Balak was already in the country, a far more remote country, but even he, coming up to London, mourned to my mother, she has taken my Chesterton from me. Talking it over, however, after the lapse of years, he agreed that in all probability the move was a wise one. What may be called the smaller fry of Fleet Street are less reasonable. One cannot avoid the feeling that in all this masculine life, so sure of its manhood, there lingered something of the shawarma of the junior debating club, furiously desiring each to be first with Gilbert. And in his love of Fleet Street, he so identified himself with them all that they felt he was one of them and did not recognize the horizons wider than theirs that were opening before him. My husband and I are experts in changing residences, and we listened with the amusement of experts to the talk of theorists. For it was so constantly assumed that on one side of a choice is disaster, on the other, perfection. Actually, perfection does not belong to this earthly state. If you go to Rome, as Gilbert himself once said, you sacrifice a rich, suggestive life at Wimbledon. Newman, writing of a far greater and more irrevocable choice, called his story loss and gain, but he had no doubt that the gain outweighed the loss. There were in Gilbert's adult life three other big decisions, decisions of the scale that altered its course. The first was his marriage. The second was his reception into the church. The third was his continued dedication to the paper that his brother and Bellic had founded. In deciding to marry Francis, he was acting against his mother's wishes, to which he was extremely sensitive. His decision to become a Catholic had to be made alone. He had the sympathy of his wife, but not her companionship. In the decision to edit the paper, he had not even her full sympathy. She always felt his creative work to be so much more important and to be imperiled by the overwork the paper brought. Gilbert was a man slow in action, but it would be exceedingly difficult to find instances of his doing anything that he did not want to do. The theorists about marriage are like the theorists about moving house. If they do not know that decisions made by one party alone are rare indeed, and stick out like spikes in the life of a normal and happy couple. Of the vast majority of decisions, it is hard to say who makes them. They make themselves. After endless talk, on the tops of omnibuses going to Hanwell or elsewhere, out walking, breakfasting, especially breakfasting in bed, they make themselves, above all in the matter of a moon, in fine weather, during a holiday, on a hot London Sunday, when a flat is stuffy, when the telephone rings all day, when a book is on the stocks. Other writers have left London that they might create at leisure and choose their own times for social intercourse. Why does no one say their wives dragged them away? Simply, I think, that being less kind and considerate than Gilbert, they do not mind telling their friends that they are not always wanted. This Gilbert could not do. If people said how they would miss him, how they hated his going, he would murmur vague and friendly sounds, from which they deduced all they wanted to deduce. Was it more weakness or strength, that tenderness of heart that could never faintly suggest to his friends that they would miss him more than he would miss them? I never wanted but one thing in my life, he had written to Annie Furman, and that one thing he was taking with him. Anyhow, the move accomplished, he enjoyed defending it in every detail, and did so especially in his daily news articles. The rush to the country was not uncommon in the literary world of the moment, and his journalist friends had urged the point that Beaconsfield was not true country, was suburban, was being overbuilt. His friends, G.K. replied, were suffering from a weak-minded swing from one extreme to the other. Men who had praised London as the only place to live in were now vying with one another to live furthest from a station, 
to have no chimneys visible on the most distant horizon, to depend on tradesmen who only called once a week from cities so distant that fresh-baked loaves grew stale before delivery. Rival ruralists would quarrel about which had the most completely inconvenient postal service, and there were many jealous heartburnings if one friend found out any uncomfortable situation which the other friend had thoughtlessly overlooked. Gilbert, on the contrary, noted soon after his arrival that Beaconsfield was beginning to be built over, and he noted it with satisfaction. Within a stone's throw of my house, they are building another house. I am glad they are building it, and I am glad it is within a stone's throw. He did not want a desert. He did not want a large landed estate. He wanted what he had got, a house and a garden. He adventurously explored that garden, finding a kitchen garden that had somehow got attached to the premises, and wondering why he liked it, speaking to the gardener, an enterprise of no little valor, and asking him the name of a strange dark red rose, at once theatrical and sulky, which turned out to be called Victor Hugo, watching, with regret, a lot of little black pigs being turned out of my garden. Watching the neighboring house grow up from its foundation, he noted in an article called The Wings of Stone what was the reality of a staircase. We pad them with carpets and rail them with banisters, yet every staircase is truly only an awful and naked ladder running up into the infinite to a deadly height. A correspondent pointed out in a letter to the Daily News that here he had touched a reality keenly felt by primitive peoples. When Sitawayo, king of Zululand, visited London, he would go upstairs only on hands and knees, and that with manifest terror. The paddings of civilization may be useful, yet Gilbert held more valuable a realization of the realities of things. Vision is not fancy, but the sight of truth. In the notebook, he had written, There are three things that make me think, things beyond all poetry, a yellow space or rift in evening sky, a chimney or pinnacle high in the air, and a path over a hill. Chesterton had always the power of conveying in words a painter's vision of some unforgettable scene, with the poet's words, for what the artist not only sees, but imagines. Such flashes became more frequent as he looked through the doorway of his little house. Go through the ball and the cross with this in mind, and you will see what I mean. The crimson seas of the sunset seemed to him like a bursting out of some sacred blood, as if the heart of the world had broken. There is nothing more beautiful than thus to look, as it were, through the archway of a house, as if the open air were an interior chamber, and the sun a secret lamp of the place. Best of all, to illustrate this special quality, is a longer passage from the poets and the lunatics. For the most part, he was contented to see the green semicircles of lawn repeat themselves like a pattern of green moons. For he was not one to whom repetition was merely monotony. Only in looking over a particular gate at a particular lawn, he became pleasantly conscious, or half-conscious, of a new note of color in the greenness, a much bluer green, which seemed to change to vivid blue, as the object at which he was gazing moved sharply, turning a small head on a long neck. It was a peacock. But he had thought of a thousand things before he thought of the obvious thing. The burning blue of the plumage on the neck had reminded him of blue fire, and blue fire had reminded him of some dark fantasy about blue devils, before he had fully realized even that it was a peacock he was staring at. And the tail, that trailing tapestry of eyes, had led his wandering wits away to those dark but divine monsters of the apocalypse, whose eyes were multiplied like their wings, before he had remembered that a peacock, even in a more practical sense, was an odd thing to see in so ordinary a setting. Yet always to Chesterton, the beauty of nature was enhanced by the work of men. 
and if in London men had swarmed too closely, it was not to get away from them, but to appreciate them more individually that he chose the country. Yes, his literary friends would say, in the real country that is true. The farmer, the laborer, even the village barber and the village tradesman are worth knowing, but not suburban neighbors. Against such discrimination, the whole democracy of Chesterton stood in revolt. All men were valuable. All men were interesting. The doctor as much as the barber. The clergyman as much as the farmer. All men were children of God and citizens of the world. If he had a choice in the matter, it was discrimination against the literary world itself, with all the fads that tended to smother its essential humanity. Nothing would have induced him to discriminate against the suburban. In the last year of his life, he wrote in the autobiography, I have lived in Beaconsfield from the time when it was almost a village, to the time when, as the enemy profanely says, it is a suburb. For the author of the Napoleon of Notting Hill, this would hardly be a conclusive argument against any place. We should, he once said, regard the important suburbs as ancient cities embedded in a sort of boiling lava spouted up by that volcano, the speculative builder. That lava itself he found interesting. But beneath or beside it, a little town like Beaconsfield had its share in the great sweep of English history. Something of the seven sunken Englands could be found in the old town which custom marked off pretty sharply from the new town. Burke had lived in Beaconsfield and was buried there, and Gilbert once suggested to Mr. Garvin that they should appear at a local festival, respectively as Fox, a part for which I have no claim except in circumference, and Burke. I admire Burke in many things, while disagreeing with him in nearly everything. But Mr. Garvin strikes me as being rather like Burke, at the barber's, he was often seen sitting at the end of a line, patiently awaiting his turn, for he could never shave himself, and it was only years later that Dorothy Collins conceived and put into execution the bold project of bringing the barber to the house. Probably an article would be shaping while he waited, and the barber's conversation might put the finishing touches to it. There were in fact two barbers, one of the old town, one of the new. I once planned, he says, a massive and exhaustive sociological work in several volumes, which was to be called The Two Barbers of Beaconsfield, and based entirely upon the talk of the two excellent citizens to whom I went to get shaved. For those two shops do indeed belong to two different civilizations. Despite his love for London, Gilbert had always felt that life in a country town held one point of special superiority. In it, you discovered the community. In London, you chose your friends, which meant that you narrowed your life to people of one kind. He had noted in the family itself a valuable widening. The supreme adventure is being born. There we do walk suddenly into a splendid and startling trap. There we do see something of which we have not dreamed before. Our father and mother do lie in wait for us and leap out on us like brigands from a bush. Our uncle is a surprise. Our aunt is in the beautiful common expression, a bolt from the blue. When we step into the family by the act of being born, we do step into a world which is incalculable, into a world which has its own strange laws, into a world which could do without us, into a world that we have not made. Here in Beaconsfield, the Chestertons grew into the community. The clergyman, the doctor, the innkeeper, the barber, the gardener. And like the relatives who spring upon you at birth, these worthy citizens seemed to Gilbert potentials of vast excitement and varied interest. Discussing an event of much later date, a meeting to decide whether a crucifix might be erected as a local war memorial, he thus describes the immense forces he found in that small place. Those who debated the matter were a little group of the inhabitants of a little country town. 
the rector, and the doctor, and the bank manager, and the respectable tradesmen of the place, with a few hangers-on, like myself, of the more disreputable professions, of journalism, or the arts. But the powers that were present there in the spirit came out of all the ages and all the battlefields of history. Mahomet was there, and the iconoclast, who came riding out of the east to ruin the statues of Italy, and Calvin and Rousseau, and the Russian anarchs, and all the older England that is buried under Puritanism, and Henry III, ordering the little images for Westminster, and Henry V, after Agincourt, on his knees before the shrines of Paris. If one could really write that little story of that little place, it would be the greatest of historical monographs.
Thank you.